Section 1 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 1. Extracts from the Waco Weekly Tribune issue of Saturday, April 2nd, 1898. A chapter written in the lifeblood of W.C. Brand and Thomas E. Davis. The street duel to the death in Waco streets. There are two more widows and eight more orphans. The full recital of the double tragedy, the deaths, the burials, and subsequent events, will this end it? In God's name, let us hope it will. Died at 1.55 o'clock a.m. April 2nd, W.C. Brand. Died at 2.30 o'clock p.m. T.E. Davis. Friday afternoon, November 19th, 1897, marked a street duel and tragedy in which two men were killed, one lost an arm, and an innocent bystander was injured. Friday afternoon, April 1st, 1898, within an hour of the time of the first tragedy, and within half a block of the locality of the other, W.C. Brand and Tom E. Davis engaged in a street duel in which each of them was mortally wounded and three others received slight wounds. Four fatalities within five months of each other are bloody records in the history of the city of Waco, all of which can be traced to the same source, all of which were born of the same cause. The publication last year in the Iconoclast and the incidents following the publication are well known. They have been published far and wide, the kidnapping of Brand, the assault upon him by the Scarboroughs, the Gerald Harris affair, and the hurried departure of Brand on one occasion. During all these incidents, Tom E. Davis was an outspoken citizen of Waco. He denounced the author of the Iconoclast articles and said he should be run out of town, and had continued throughout it all to condemn the apostle. This caused bad blood between them, and although Davis had remained in the city all the time, and Bren had been on the street constantly, there had been no outbreak or conflict. Each knew the feeling of the other in the matter. Such are incidents preceding the shooting and leading up to it. To trace the movements of the two men during Friday afternoon appears easy at first, but as the investigator proceeds in his search for information, he meets conflicting statements. Tom Davis left his office on South 4th Street, number 111, about five o'clock or a few minutes later. Brand, accompanied by W. H. Ward, his business manager, is alleged to have been standing at the corner of 4th and Franklin Streets as Davis passed to the post office corner en route to the transfer stables. In his anti-mortem statement, Davis says that he heard Brand remark, there is the son of a bitch who caused my trouble. Davis didn't stop or resent the insult, but passed on. Soon after, he called on James I. Moore at his office in the Pacific Hotel building, and together they were discussing the city campaign. According to Mr. Moore's statement, he was standing with his back to the south, facing the door, and was looking toward Austin Avenue. Davis was facing him, his back to the avenue, and in a position which prevented him from seeing anyone approaching from Austin Avenue. Brand and his companion approached coming south, and as they passed, Mr. Moore says, Brand halted, looked at him squarely in the face, and passed on. Davis did not see the editor and his manager, as he chanced to turn just as they came up, and as it happened he kept his back to the apostle and his companion. From Mr. Moore's office, Davis passed into the Pacific Hotel Bar, and thence to his office. Bran and Ward soon after returned to the Pacific. There they met Joe Earp of Wado, from the western part of the county, and the three walked together to George Lanary's saloon. Bran and Ward passed into the saloon, Earp remaining on the outside. 
they passed out within a short time and passed down fourth street to the cotton belt ticket office thence on to the newsstand of jake french and while there the shooting occurred as to the shooting there are conflicting statements as in every tragedy eyewitnesses differ and citizens of equal reputation for veracity and conservatism tell different stories they are all honest in what they say they all believe they saw what they relate but the conflict in statements is yet there messrs w w duggar joe erb m c insley and s s hall agree as to the first shot they say it was fired by t e davis at w c brand when brand's back was turned others say ward participated in the shooting while numbers say that ward did not here a conflict occurs at any rate the first shot was fired by davis and it was immediately returned by bran ward got between the two and in the firing he was shot in the right hand davis fell at the first shot from bran's pistol and writhed in agony he soon recovered his presence of mind and raising himself upon his elbow returned the fire bran standing off shooting into the prostate form while davis with unsteady aim was returning the fire every bullet from the apostle's pistol found lodgment in the form of the duelist engaged with him all was excitement it was an hour six p m when south fourth street was crowded and the rapid report of the pistols caused a stampede of pedestrians each of which feared contact with a stray bullet in it all there was one who displayed his devotion to duty his bravery and coolness police officer sam s hall mr hall was standing near the insurance office of george willig not forty feet away he turned at the first report and seeing the duel in progress bravely made his way toward the men brand was shooting from the north and it was toward the north the officer started davis was facing north at each fire of the gun, Officer Hall would screen himself in a doorway, dart out, and rush to the next, gradually nearing them. Officer Dave Dury was across the street, and he started also. But Officer Hall reached them first, but too late. Each man had finished shooting. Davis had fallen back upon the pavement, and his pistol rolled from his hand. Bran was standing, pistol in hand, its six chambers empty, looking upon the lengthened form of his antagonist he had not spoken wounded in three places blood was soiling his linen and his clothes he was yet upon his feet and officer hall not knowing how serious were his wounds started with him to the city hall being joined almost immediately by officer dury davis was wounded in many places bullets had ploughed their way through the flesh and bone and unable himself to move blood flowing freely from various wounds his friends lifted him tenderly and gave him comfort as best they could surgeons responding quickly to the call ward had been in the midst of the fray but received but one wound in the hand he was between the two men at one time and then sought safety against the wall when the smoke cleared away he went to the old corner drug store to have his hand dressed here he was arrested later by Deputy Sheriff James Lockwood. During the shooting, Eugene Kempner, a musician of Kansas City, was struck in the sole of the right foot by a stray bullet, and a streetcar motorman, Kennedy by name, was struck in the left leg by a bullet. Neither of these injuries are serious. While in the newsstand, Mr. Davis became conscious of approaching dissolution and desired to make an anti-mortem statement. Assistant County Attorney Sluter was present, and County Clerk Joni Jones, and to them he gave the following version of the affair. Davis' Statement I left my office and started to Manchester's livery stable. At the corner of Franklin and Fourth Street, past Bran and Ward. Bran remarked, There goes the damned son of a bitch that has caused all my trouble. Passed on and went to Manchester's stable on some business then came back to Waite's saloon and stopped for a drink. I then started for my office, but near Haver's store on Baker's Alley I met them again. They began to curse, 
and abuse me again. Went on to the office, they followed me, and I went to the urinal in the rear, and came back to the front of the office. At the door, Bren said, There comes the dirty cur and son of a bitch. He will take anything. Bren then pulled his gun, and I shot at him. My gun hung in the scabbard. The reason he shot me was because I was loyal to my town and always expressed myself. He murdered me. They both shot me after I fell. They shot in my back, blinded me, and I could not see. I make this statement, for I know I am dying. He has been trying to kill me for three months. End of section one. Section two. The Complete Works of Bren, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12, by William Cowper Bran. Section 2. Other Statements. Extracts from the Waco Weekly Tribune, issue of Saturday, April 2, 1898. Eyewitnesses give somewhat conflicting accounts. Joe Earp, a young fellow from the western part of the county, who was in town that day, said, I met Mr. Bran in front of the Pacific Hotel, and having heard of him and read after him, I was curious to know him. It was our first meeting. In fact, the first time I had ever seen him. We talked together, Mr. Ward with us, to Laneri Saloon. They went inside, and I left them. In a few minutes they came out and crossed the street, going to the Cotton Belt ticket office. They moved together towards Austin Avenue, but half turned, conversing one with the other. They reached the newsstand and stopped. I saw a man, whom I have been told was Tom E. Davis, come out of a door and shoot. Bran's back was turned to the man, and while I did not see the bullets strike him, I supposed he was shooting at Bran. Ward turned as soon as the shot was fired and reached for the pistol. Bran turned instantly, gun in hand, and commenced shooting. Ward got in between the two and then jumped away against the wall. Davis fell at Bran's first fire and rolled over a time or two, and raising himself on his elbow, returned Bran's fire. They emptied their pistols. When Davis fell, Bran stepped back a short distance and then advanced towards Davis, shooting at him, but he never approached nearer than six feet. Ward never fired a shot. I saw the whole affair, and never did he fire or produce a pistol. When the shooting was over, a man came out of the office and took Davis's pistol from the walk. J. C. Patterson was seen. He stated, I was with R. H. Brown of Calvert. We walked into the street from the Pacific Hotel sidewalk and were walking north when we heard a shot. Three shots were fired quickly, and I saw Davis fall. I remarked, they have killed Tom Davis. I saw two men shooting, or Bran had two pistols. Davis raised on his elbow and returned the fire. I did not see the first shot. Sherman Vaughn said, I was passing along 4th Street and reached a spot just in front of George Laneri's saloon. I heard a shot, and looking towards the place from whence the sound came, I saw Tom Davis reeling backward toward the wall in front of his place of business. He either fell against the sign in front of his office or the wall, I could not tell which. Mr. Bran was standing some eight or ten feet from him, with a pistol in his hand, and smoke was between them. Then followed a rapid succession of shots. I could not see Mr. Davis shoot for the smoke, but could see Mr. Brand plainly. Mr. Davis fell to the sidewalk and then almost rose to his feet and fell again. He then rolled along the sidewalk towards the alley and must have turned over half a dozen times. 
Then another man, whom I do not know, joined in, and he and Bran fired shot after shot at Mr. Davis as he rolled along the sidewalk. The police then came up and took Bran away. I did not see what became of the other man. Mr. James I. Moore said, I had met Tom Davis in front of my office in the Pacific Hotel building, and we discussed the proposed meeting at the City Hall. He and I walked out on the sidewalk just in front of my office. I stood at the south side of the door facing north, and Mr. Davis stood directly in front of me on the sidewalk by the wall. We were about two feet apart. While talking, W. C. Bran came down the sidewalk from the direction of Austin Street. He advanced within two feet of Mr. Davis and myself and stopped, looked me squarely in the face and then at Mr. Davis. I did not speak to Bran and don't think Davis saw him until after he passed on. Bran passed on in the direction of the post office. Almost immediately after Bran left, Davis left me and walked up 4th Street towards his office, and I saw him cross the street to his office. I then advanced to the edge of the sidewalk and stood there alone about four or five minutes, when I heard a shot in the direction of Davis's office. I looked that way, and three shots seemed to be fired almost simultaneously. Davis fell to the sidewalk and writhed as if in terrible agony. Bran seemed to be closest to Davis, a very large man being close in Bran's rear. This man, I learned afterwards, was W. H. Ward. While Davis was rolling on the sidewalk, both of these men were very rapidly firing upon Davis. They seemed to poke their pistols almost against Davis's body as they fired. After the first four or five shots, the smoke became too dense to see all that occurred. The first sight seemed to chill my blood, and I became too horrified to move. H. C. Chase, 509 North Ninth Street I was standing at the alley near George Lanieri's saloon and heard somebody say, Look out! I glanced across the street and saw Tom Davis on the sidewalk. He had a gun in his hand and fired at once. Bran and Ward were a few feet distant. Bran had turned slightly, but his back was still towards Davis when the latter fired. Ward jumped back and grabbed at Davis's gun as the latter fired the second time. Bran fired as soon as he turned around, and at his second shot Davis fell backwards. Ward, it seemed to me, had gotten to one side of Davis and was reaching for Davis's gun. As the latter fell back, Ward backed up to the building. He did not have a gun and did not shoot. M. C. Inslee, Shipping Clerk for Bran I was standing in the doorway of Sam French's cigar store as Bran and Ward reached it. They had just passed the doorway, going toward Austin Street, when Davis appeared with a gun in his hand. He fired at once. I could not see Bran at this time. Davis fired the first shot, and immediately I heard another shot, I suppose from Bran, and almost simultaneously a second shot from Davis. As the latter fired the first shot, Ward jumped and grabbed the muzzle of Davis's gun. He let go as the shot was fired. He did not have a gun. I backed away from the door. The shooting was thick and fast. Davis fell back at the door of French's as Bran fired the last shot, and his gun dropped from his grasp. John Williams, who appeared quickly, grabbed it, and screening himself with the door facing of the cigar store, tried twice to shoot it, and then somebody grabbed him. W. W. Duggar, employed in the feed store of J. P. Nichols on North 2nd Street, said, I was talking with policeman Sam Hall at the alley next to the Cotton Belt ticket office when the first shot was fired. We were close to the scene. I glanced instantly in that direction and saw Tom Davis with a smoking pistol in his hand. At the same time, I saw Bran turn around and face Davis, from whom he appeared to be distant about fifteen feet, I should judge. He fired and fired again almost at the same time. 
in the meantime the man with bran whom i learned afterward was ward had rushed up and caught davis and it seemed as if he struggled with him a moment when bran fired a second shot davis fell ward had turned him loose at this time davis rolled over and over on the sidewalk and fired i think two shots while he was down while he was rolling over bran kept shooting at him as fast as he could work the trigger mr ward did not fire a shot i saw the whole affair and know that he did not and he did not exhibit a weapon of any kind he slipped back close to the building when he let go of davis and when the shooting was over walked up the street i saw a man come out of williams place and make an effort to get davis's pistol i can't say whether or not he got it i don't know where he went policemen had reached the scene and arrested bran policeman sam hall said i was standing in front of george willock's office at the alley and fourth street on the same side of the street and say forty or forty-five feet away from the place where the shooting took place i was talking to mr duggar and was standing out on the sidewalk some four or five minutes before the shooting occurred i looked across the street and saw bran and ward standing in front of the haberdasher store of l kraus and at that time davis passed them and went on a couple of doors and stepped inside of the storeroom at that point i then looked away not having any idea at all of any trouble but just to happen to see them the next thing i noticed was the men were close together in front of french's newsstand with davis between me and bran and ward the first of the trouble i saw davis had his pistol in his hand and instantly fired bran whirled and commenced firing at davis i immediately started to them but had to work my way in and out of one door to the other and work my way along the wall of the building as bran was shooting directly toward me all the time i hallooed several times at them to stop shooting and just before i reached them davis fell on the sidewalk and bran was still shooting davis attempted to rise and ward caught davis by the shoulders and pulled him back down on the sidewalk davis turned with his face towards bran and kept trying to fire but his pistol snapped i jumped over davis and caught bran and took the pistol out of his hands Brand's pistol is a Colt forty one, latest improved, and was loaded all around, and all chambers were freshly fired. When I caught Bran, Ward was standing up by the wall holding his hand that was shot. I saw Ward fire no shots, and I saw no pistol in his hand. I then started with Bran to the city hall, and as I crossed the street towards the Citizens National Bank, Police Officer Dury came up and assisted me in taking Bran on to the city hall. End of Section 2、section、The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12, by William Cowper Bran. Section 3 Bran's Death. Extracts from the Waco Weekly Tribune. Issue of Saturday, April 2nd, 1898. Brand's death. It came as peacefully as sleep to a babe. After being taken to the city hall, Mr. Brand was removed to his home, where Drs. Foscue, Hale, Graves, and C. E. Smith attended him. Soon after arriving there, he appeared to have reacted from the shock, and there was every indication of an improvement. At eleven o'clock, there was a change. Hemorrhage of the lungs occurring frequently. In addition to the immediate family circle, a number of devoted friends, and no man ever had more devoted friends than Bran, were at the home, anxious to render the offices of friendship. At midnight, the physician said there was no chance, and the family gathered about the bedside. During the long minutes which followed, 
a loving wife and two children sat by that bedside and watched the unconscious man his life hung by a thread and while surgeon science was being used to strengthen the strand that held the life death's knife was on it they watched by his side and as they watched they saw him seek sweet repose the anguish of the wife and those children was terrible but they awaited the visitation to that happy home kind friends being near to speak sweet words of comfort at one fifty five a m he died his features showed no pain and when life left his body the face appeared as that of one in a sweet peaceful sleep the remains of w c bran were prepared early saturday morning and lay in state all day at the residence on north fifth street hundreds of ladies visited the home and viewed the face of the apostle it was natural as life itself he lay upon a catafalque in the parlors at home and the visitors passed around the lifeless form looked upon the face and passed out surviving mr bran are his wife and two children grace aged eleven years and willie a son aged six years bran himself was forty-four years old mr bran came to texas about twelve years ago and has been engaged in the newspaper business ever since he was connected in an editorial capacity with the Galveston News, Houston Post, San Antonio Express, and Waco Daily News. In 1890, during the Hogg Clark campaign, he established the iconoclast in Austin, Texas, and made a fight for Hogg, making his first appearance in the character which has made him famous. The paper suspended publication, and Mr. Bran accepted a position on the San Antonio Express, which he held until the latter part of 1894. He came to Waco in 1895 and began editorial writing on the Waco Daily News. He decided to re-establish the iconoclast, and it has been a great success, reaching a phenomenal circulation, having readers all over this country. The tragedy of Friday can be traced to the attack which was made on Baylor University in the iconoclast. It was in Brand's peculiar style and attracted considerable attention throughout the country. Mr. Brand is a native of southern Illinois. End of section 3《The Complete Works of Bran, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Complete Works of Bran, the Iconoclast, Volume 12, by William Cowper Bran. Section 4. Extracts from the Waco Weekly Tribune, issue of Saturday, April 2nd, 1898. Davis Follows Bran, The Death Struggle, and Kindred Incidents. While breaking hearts watched by Mr. Bran's bedside, there was a loving wife, a dutiful son, and kind friends sitting by the bedside of Tom E. Davis. For the first six hours, Dr. J. C. J. King, Dr. Curtis, and Dr. Olive endeavored to bring their patient about. He was perfectly conscious, but was yet suffering from the shock. At midnight, he was no better, and a change for the worse was soon noted. The patient would awake from the effect of opiates, talk with those about him, and then relapse again into slumber. He knew his son and wife, friends who called, and friends who spoke to him, but there was rapid pulse and a labored breathing that indicated the approach of death. Throughout the small hours of the newborn day, the wife sat by that couch, and with her sat kind friends. Everything known to science was done to save the life that fleeting breath told was fast ebbing away. There was not a continued loss of blood, but, with a perforated frame, the creature of nature could not exist, and it was evident he was fast nearing the end. 
The dawn of early morning found the faithful watchers yet at the bedside, and the rising sun peeped into the room and shed a glow about the sick room, appearing to light the way for the soul which was soon to wing its flight to realms beyond. The circle about the couch enlarged, children of the wounded man gathering about their weeping mother, his sister, and other relatives coming to watch and wait. During the early hours of the morning, and until the forenoon was advanced, friends paced the lobby of the Pacific, hoping every moment for a report that the patient was better. Each minute passed as an hour, and the hours seemed as long drawn-out days. Each report from the sick room was no change. At noon it became evident that but a short time remained. A. C. Riddle sat upon one side of the couch, and Richard Selman at the other, the first rubbing the injured portion of the wounded right arm, while the other moistened the parched lips with constant applications of cold water. By Mr. Riddle sat the weeping wife, soon to be a widow, and about the apartment were gathered the children. The last hour of the citizen was one which will never be forgotten by those who watched his last moments. Labored was the breathing, and every breath was a gasp and a groan. His children stood by the couch and saw the pain-racked form, and his wife held his hand and prayed to the God of all people to spare him to her for a longer time. Prayers were of no avail, and tears did not soothe the pain. He was in agony, and accompanied with that agony was a desire to say something. He relapsed into slumber at times, and would at intervals awake. His eyes would roll about the gathered friends and relatives, and an unintelligible sound would escape. There seemed to be no control of the tongue except at times he would utter the words, Wife and Molly. The silence in the sick room was disturbed by the gasp of the dying man and the weeping of his family. The hour of two o'clock came, and the breath was shorter and harder. Little Nellie, two years of age, was brought to the bedside, and looking at her father in childish innocence, smiled and cried, "'Mama, is that my papa? Did papa hear those words? It is to be hoped he did.' They rung out loud within the quiet room. The walls caught them and echoed the music of the child's voice, and probably that music joined the music of the great beyond, where the soul was soon to be. If the ear of the dying man, who gave every indication of consciousness, caught the words of his baby, his death was made happy, even with the pain that racked his wounded form. He saw the anguish of the wife and children, it was to comfort them with a last word that he sought to speak the last word that he could not utter. At two-twenty it was seen that death was upon him, and the rapid gasp for breath plunged the entire family into violent weeping. Mrs. Davis had controlled herself as best she could. The long hours were spent in a labored effort to hold back the anguish of her bleeding heart, but when she saw her husband in the last moments of death she could control herself no longer death came at two thirty o'clock the dissolution of tom e davis was known upon the streets within a few minutes and the regret of the people was freely expressed tom e davis was forty-two years of age he was born in waco and was the son of judge james f davis a pioneer settler of waco tribune readers who have lived here twenty years or more will remember judge davis from eighteen seventy six to eighteen seventy eight he was one of the two justices of the peace in waco he has followed the life of a railroad man for many years but finally gave it up to locate in his native city he has been engaged in the real estate business recently. He was well thought of in this city, had many friends, was a man of genial, jovial nature, and was a good citizen. His death is mourned by a large number. Surviving him is his wife and six children, James F., Flossie, Maddie, Lillian, Marjorie, and Nellie, the eldest being sixteen and the youngest two years old. 
In addition to those mentioned, who were at the deathbed, was his sister, Mrs. Margaret Allen. Saturday afternoon, Drs. J. C. J. King, Frank Ross, A. M. Curtis, and N. A. Olive made an examination of the wounds of T. E. Davis. Justice W. H. Davis had viewed the body, and the examination was made at the request of Sheriff John W. Baker. They could trace four bullets as having struck Mr. Davis. While there were a number of wounds, the surgeons found that the same bullet made more than one or two holes. Two were found to have struck in the left shoulder about the same place. One of these came out at the back, and the other passed around the chest wall and lodged near the spine near the waist. One went externally in the chest and came out of the armpit, and another made a flesh wound in the arm. End of section 4《Section 5 of the Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. Section 5. W. H. Ward, Business Manager for Bran's Lecture Tour, and an intimate friend of the apostle was arrested friday night as stated above baker and ross and charles r sparks were retained as his attorneys and he was arraigned before justice w h davis at once on a charge of assault with intent to murder mr sparks appeared in court and waived all formalities and the question of the amount of the bond was discussed mr sparks suggested four thousand dollars and this was agreed upon and fixed by the justice Mr. Waller S. Baker was out of the city at the time, and after presenting a certified check for the amount of the bond, Mr. Sparks decided to await Mr. Baker's return before acting in the matter. When Mr. Baker arrived at 10.30 o'clock, there was some talk on the streets of a mob, and it was decided that Ward would be safer in jail awaiting developments. When Mr. Davis died, Deputy Constable Cliff Torrance went before Justice Davis and made complaint charging murder. Mr. Ward had come downtown Friday to meet his brother, whom he was expecting to arrive from Tyler. He joined Mr. Bran on the street, and while they were together, the tragedy occurred. Mr. Ward was at Mr. Bran's burial Sunday afternoon accompanied by Mr. Baker. His wounded hand was bandaged and in a sling, at the jail he had been called on by many friends, and telegrams from various points for offering aid and sympathy came to him. Ward was greatly moved by the death of Bran. He did not talk much of the tragedy, but to a Tribune reporter, who went to the jail Sunday to see him, Ward said, I do not at this time care to discuss the details. I wish, however, to deny the statement that I participated in the shooting or had a pistol. I did not expect a difficulty, and the first shot startled me as a thunderclap in a clear sky. I turned to Davis with pistol drawn and grasped the muzzle of the weapon and was shot in the hand. I regret the death of my friend, but cannot discuss the details of the tragedy. Messrs. Waller S. Baker and Charles R. Sparks state that after the shooting they went to Mr. Brand's residence, and in the presence of outside witnesses found Ward's pistol. It was loaded all round and showed no indication of having been discharged. Mr. Ward had been associated with Brand for some time. They were co-workers on the Waco News, and when the Apostle began lecturing, Ward became his manager. They had been firm friends, and when Ward was in the city, he made his home with Mr. Brand, and the two were always together. Ward is well liked by those who know him, and he has a number of friends throughout the country. He is a man of fine physique, and is a dignified, courteous gentleman. While there was for a short time talk of a mob Friday night, Sheriff Baker believed that cool judgment would prevail, and that nothing would be attempted. He was prepared, however, to protect his prisoner, had trouble been precipitated, 
and a number of citizens volunteered their assistance had danger threatened end of section five recording by john brandon section six of the complete works of brand the iconoclast volume twelve this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in october two thousand nineteen the complete works of brand the iconoclast volume twelve section six the obsequies bran and davis laid to rest sunday beneath two mounds each banked with flowers one in oakwood the other in first street cemetery were laid the victims of friday's tragedy sunday afternoon never were two funerals in this city more largely attended and never was the dead followed to the last resting place by sorrowing friends with the reverence that was shown yesterday at each home the davis residence in the fifth ward and the bran residence on north fifth street friends began to gather shortly after noon and they crowded through the two homes on the lawn of one and about the yard of the other each man had his friends and each had hosts of them and they desired to show by their attendance at this last service their devotion to those friends who were now gone to the great beyond each procession was a long one the davis cortege moved from the home on dallas street to elm thence west on elm to the suspension bridge when the hearse which was preceded by vehicles covering three blocks containing knights of the maccabees turned into elm street vehicles were yet falling in line at the home the procession extending more than a dozen blocks in length all classes and conditions of men were in the line from the lowest to the highest citizens of waco joining in the respect to the citizen whose tragic death was known he was well liked and being liked they sorrowfully joined in this tribute to his memory there were services at the home conducted by rev austin crouch of east waco baptist church dr nelms was to participate but a sudden illness prevented him being present the service commenced by the singing by the choir of some sweet day those composing the choir were Messrs. w t hillman w e brittain w r covington j s henderson mrs macdonald and mrs josie davis nanny huff and shirley faulkner all of the east waco baptist church after the reading of the twenty-third psalm by rev austin crouch followed by the singing of nearer my god to thee by the choir mr crouch began a short talk which went deep into the hearts of his hearers and was a beautiful tribute to the noble characteristics of the deceased he began by quoting the poem the hour of death by mrs hemmins to illustrate the thought that men cannot reckon upon the hour of the coming of death he drew attention to the fact that it was said of moses that he died when his eye was not dim nor his natural strength abated he said it had been thus with the deceased he having been taken from life in the prime of manhood aged forty-two he referred to him as a loving husband and devoted father and possessing the love of a host of friends as the vast concourse assembled about his bier testified mr crouch then referred to the words full of tenderness and pathos to the wife and six children whom the husband and father had left when taken from life and in this connection quoted from tennyson's in memoriam these lines quote, i hold it true whate'er befalls i feel it when i sorrow most tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all End quote touching upon the characteristics of the deceased mr crouch eulogized his devotion to his family his loyalty to his friends and his willingness always to sacrifice anything to them he said of him that he was a good citizen who for the last several years had devoted much of time and talents to upholding all the virtues of good citizenship adding that it was not often that one met a man nowadays who could be called a good citizen 
mr crouch closed a talk that was well chosen and effectively delivered by warning his hearers that they were but mortal and to be prepared for the hour of death with his final words he commended the loving ones of the deceased to the mercy and care of almighty god the song the unclouded day closed the services at the house when the procession reached the cemetery impressive services according to the ritual of the order were conducted by commander ben richards of artesian tent knights of the maccabees a final prayer was offered by rev crouch and the body of tom davis was lowered to rest the floral tributes were beautiful friends brought cut flowers and evergreens and two large designs especially were noticed one was a large wreath of red and white flowers twined with crape the red white and black being the colors of the maccabees this was sent by artesian tent number six of which the deceased was a member the other was a large anchor fully four feet in length composed of yellow roses and white carnations it was a huge piece beautifully made and testified the friendship of him who sent it mr connor the pallbearers were judge w h jenkins j e boynton t b williams j n harris a c riddle j k rose j h gouldy w h deaton robert wright s f kirksey major a sims and james i moore the funeral of w c brand did not move promptly on the hour it had been fixed for three p m but there was some delay during the moments just preceding the funeral services mrs brand went upon the lawn herself accompanied by a friend and she directed the cutting of certain buds and roses which had been favorites of her departed husband and when the services were held in the parlor she placed this collection of cut flowers upon the head of the casket the entire place was crowded with sympathetic friends and by her side were mr brand's sister and her husband who came to waco to attend the funeral being summoned from their fort worth home a brass quartet composed of l n griffin first cornet j c arret second cornet h c collier trombone fred pigeon baritone horn rendered sweet sacred music one selection being nearer my god to thee mrs tecklow weslow kempner sung mr brand's favorite selection the bridge the service was conducted by rev frank page of the episcopal church the procession was a very long one it extended all along fifth street from the house and when austin avenue was reached a large number dropped out of the line as was done in the ross coke and harris funerals and proceeded to oakwood by other streets a brass band preceded the procession playing martial music the street was lined with pedestrians and vehicles some of whom stood for thirty minutes waiting for the cortege the delay was occasioned however at the home soon after the services were concluded mrs brand requested that the casket be opened again and her request was complied with for a few minutes she was alone with her dead and in that few minutes she gazed for the last time upon her companion her loved one and her husband when the procession reached the cemetery it was found that a large number had preceded the cortege to the grave many vehicles and persons on foot being in waiting a large number went on the cars three cars leaving the home the services at the grave consisted of an address by mr j d shaw friend of the deceased he said quote, my friends and friends of w c bran i come this evening at the request of mr bran's family to lay tribute upon his grave i speak as a friend living for a friend dead no ordinary man has fallen in the person of w c bran nature fashioned him to be a power among his fellow men by industry by hard study by careful observation by diligent research by interminable effort he rose from comparative obscurity to teach and impress the civilized world in the person of w c bran we have an illustration of what may be expected in a country like ours he was a natural product of our american democracy he was a star that rose by dint of his own effort his own determination surrounded by circumstances that invited merit from the common people from the whole people 
w c brand was a cosmopolitan character he could never be confined within the limits of a party or a creed so great was his grasp so far reaching his thought that he lived in the world and not in a mere party he was found always with that party or with that sect that represented what he thought to be right and true a peculiarity of this man was his dual personality few people fully understood him in this respect as a bold genius as an intellectual giant as a man armed and equipped with intellectual fire and as a man with a noble ambition to stand by the right he was a sworn foe of hypocrisy and fraud and when he took into his brave hands the pen he made fraud and hypocrisy quake and tremble burning words came from his tongue scorching and branding every fraud men looked upon him then as a hard man as a heartless man because he told them the truth but the other side of this man's individuality i for one have had the opportunity to see he could not only sow intellectually he was not only able to entertain the civilized world with burning words with thoughts that were winged and that went like lightning but he was a man of heart and of honor and a man of the warmest and most generous love he could go towards the skies intellectually but in his heart he lived close to nature he loved nature he loved the very trees under whose shade he rested he loved the little birds that sang in the trees the grass upon which he walked the flowers that bedecked the forest and he loved his fellow man he had a warm generous heart and affection that went out to the poor and those who were needy w c bran was never known to attack a man who was a man it was the strong and the defiant that he branded and not the weak and the needy or the deserving for these he was the friend i knew this man not only as the editor of the iconoclast not only as the utterer of grand and entertaining sentences but i knew him as a man whose palm was stretched out to the man who was in need few men have been more generous with their charity than my neighbor and my friend whom we lay away to-day no man within my knowledge ever presented the world with a purer a nobler a loftier home character than w c bran oh how he loved his wife and his dear little children not only the children that were living but the child that was dead how ardently he strove to support maintain and bless them and what a friend they have lost no man ever approached w c bran for a penny that he did not respond and from his beautiful home no beggar was ever turned away i am afraid many people who only knew mr bran as a genius as a man of eloquence and power with the pen knew little of him as a man of heart and affection but i as his friend as a friend of his wife and his fatherless children i thank the people of waco to-day that they have testified of their affection for this man we shall never see his like again here perhaps he was a rising star how soon that star has set but my dear friends he has left a memory he has made his impression upon the world and we will never forget him let me then say for i must be brief i am reminded by the stormy elements about us that i must not detain you longer let me say in conclusion that bran is not dead his burning words still live and his thoughts will yet remain to affect the world and we will never forget him and i say to his wife and children though to-day you feel crushed by this great sorrow i know by experience that our dead do not pass away from our minds they grow more beautiful the longer we live we remember them with greater pleasure more tenderly they will always be just like they had been they never change the little girl that you laid away in houston is to-day in your mind just what she was then and the dear husband that you lay away now will always be just what he is to-day no changes can come he is fixed in the memory now my friends in behalf of mrs bran and her children let me thank you for this presence for this demonstration of your appreciation of this man who has so suddenly so unexpectedly fallen in our midst 
let us cherish his memory remember his virtue and imitate his daring courage in defiance of that which he thought was evil and wrong he was not without his faults none of us are he was always ready and willing to admit that no man was more willing to answer for his work than w c bran therefore i ask for him that judgment to-day we shall all crave of one another when we shall have passed away we will now lay his body in the grave we will cover it with mother earth and upon it place these flowers as a testimonial of our love and affection for him End quote at the grave the bouquet which mrs bran had laid on the casket before leaving home was returned to her and just before the casket was lowered into the grave she stepped forward and lovingly placed the floral piece upon the casket and it was closed in the grave there was a large number of floral offerings flowers were there in profusion but as at the other funeral two pieces were especially noticeable one was a huge broken wheel full three feet in diameter all in white composed of lilies of the valley hyacinths and roses it was the gift of the employees of the iconoclast and william marion reedy of st louis the night printing company sent a large anchor about three feet long which was composed of pink carnations and white roses the following were the pallbearers j w shaw g b gerald d r wallace l eith waller s baker dr j w hale h b mistrot john d mayfield and james m drake end of section six the obsequies section seven of the complete works of bran the iconoclast volume twelve this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Complete Works of Brand, The Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 7, The Latest Tragedy. Editorial appearing in the Waco Weekly Tribune, issue April 9, 1898, and written by Honorable A. R. McCollum, Editor and state senator of the texas legislature what use to write or read or talk of the tragic deaths of bran and davis unless those who survive are to draw from the tragedy lessons which rightly applied will bring peace and good to society and especially to this community if not this then far better silence in the news columns of the paper we have told the story of the battle to the death fought on the public streets of the death scenes and burial and all over this land where newspapers are printed the story has been told and millions have read there will be no adequate estimate of the effect the reading will have upon the minds of the millions it is certain that the most patent result will be to discredit this community in the esteem of the people whose good opinion our people would like to have and to react in ways that will affect the material welfare of this city and very likely of the county too beyond all question the deplorable events of last year opening with october have operated to the detriment of waco and beyond all question the latest chapter of blood and violence will intensify the distrust unless it is evidenced that this is to be the end and that hereafter peace and order are to prevail and the sacredness of human life be more assured this is why we say it is little use to write or discuss the passing of brandon davis beyond rendering the tributes of love and affection unless our people are to learn from the deaths the lessons of forbearance and tolerance and subordination of passion and prejudice to the nobler and better ends and aims of life Asperity and bitterness must be buried in the graves with the dead. Bran and Davis have gone to a judgment higher than that of men, and both, we venture, to hope and believe, have found how true it is that God is mercy as well as justice. For our part, 
we would rather let them rest in peace and not essay an analysis of their attributes and actions we will say this of bran that though he could write with a pen of vitriol in his private life he could be and was as gentle as a woman and his aspirations were those of generosity and kindness of faithfulness to friends his home life with wife and children was a poem that never ended till he died his genius was superhuman as mr shaw truly said in his remarks at the grave it is not likely that we shall ever see his like again in this community davis was cast in a different mould mentally a man of quite another type he was sturdy and practical and took the world precisely as he found it it was indeed a strange fate that brought these two men face to face in deadly conflict and made of davis the instrument to put an end to brand's earthly career both men loved and were beloved widows and orphans mourn them let the dead rest in peace for good can be said of each it is the manifest duty of this community to forbear from discussion of what might have been or who sowed the wind that brought the whirlwind at the best years of patience unselfish earnest work will be needed to restore our city to the place it might hold in the esteem of men the fool will say it makes no difference what others think it is a fool's consolation and a fool's argument but the cold truth is that not alone the prestige and good repute of our fair city have been marred but material progress and posterity have been affected population capital skill brawn industry morality hold aloof not wholly of course yet to a degree that is material and unfortunate it is possible to remedy this but not until we prove to the world that toleration and peace are to rule here and that human life is not to be held as the cheapest thing society has to lose end of section seven recording by john brandon section eight of the complete works of brand the iconoclast volume twelve this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Bonita Springs, Florida. The Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 8, Bran and Baylor. The following account of the mobbing of Bran in the fall preceding his death, see Bran's article, ropes revolvers and religion in volume ten is taken from the waco tribune for october ninth eighteen ninety seven it is reproduced here to enable the reader to better interpret the circumstances of brand's death as to the brand baylor episode the old adage two wrongs will not make a right is certainly applicable to it Brand's article on Baylor University was wholly indefensible, essentially ill-timed, and could not possibly have wrought any good, either to Baylor or the cause of morality in general. It merited the protest and indignation it evoked, and we question if Brand, when he wrote it, really appreciated its full import, for had he reflected he would have known that he placed his friends at a disadvantage in that men who hold the views respecting virtuous womanhood that most southern men and himself included do could not defend the article and bran is a man who we have always found to be true to his friend not one to place a friend in an embarrassing or unpleasant position he illustrated how a wonderfully brilliant man may astonish the world and himself too by perpetrating a grave blunder or mistake we cannot understand how he came to print the article and as for the course of the baylor students who laid forcible hands upon bran 
and by mob power compelled him to sign humiliating admissions and apologies, their course was about as grave a blunder as was Brand's. It is not palliation to argue how indignant they were, and how natural their indignation. Perhaps those in authority at Baylor, who are said to have known beforehand the purpose of the student mob, and quietly winked at it, if they did not openly commend it, are more to blame than the boys who did the work, for the older heads were naturally expected to display the wisdom of mature years. It is the truth that the authorities who condoned and the students who perpetrated the lawlessness are equally beyond the pale of defense. It was thus that two wrongs, and not even one right, were done. All the parties to the wrong will have to take the consequence. Brand has impaired the prestige of the iconoclast. Students and university authorities have brought unnecessary reproach on Baylor, and given it undesirable notoriety. Baylor is part and parcel of Waco. All of us, regardless of creed, helped to rear it. Its good name and welfare are matters of concern to all. Brand if he knew of disgraceful facts or episodes connected with Baylor, should have given names, dates, and specific details. And some student, professor, patron, or friend of Baylor, someone with a daughter, sister, or female relative there, thus vested with the God-given right of resenting slurs on the virtue of girl students, should have been found willing to deal with Brand personally and somewhere else then on the university grounds with Bran helpless and bulldozed. Any man, thus acting with defense of his womankind as his plea, may, if his pretensions are valid, always risk public opinion and jury verdicts in this county. We hope this matter will end where it is. Nobody wants to see Bran driven away from Waco, nor do we believe such a thing can be done men will be found in ample numbers to maintain his right to dwell here he is a brilliant man who can be distinctly useful as a writer on his part he owes something to the community which is willing to maintain his every right to the friends who are still his friends even if he makes a mistake and that is to remember that baylor university is part and parcel of waco and that the reputable element of society here does not share his views concerning the disrepute alleged to attach to Baylor. Most of us wish Bran well. Most of us wish Baylor well. It has been said that this is a matter of religious differences and prejudices. It is not so, save where individuals want and see fit to make it so. It has been said personal liberty and bigotry are involved in this matter we fail to comprehend how or wherein. God knows there is not a spot on the globe where there is more diversity of opinion, more freedom of expression and action as to religion than in this town. Once more, we hope this matter is ended and for good. Since the above was put in type, the assault made by Judge Scarborough, R. H. Hamilton, and George Scarborough on Mr. Brand has occurred. Judge Scarborough has a daughter, George Scarborough a sister, who has recently been a student and is now a member of the faculty at Baylor. It will thus be understood how Brand's article could aggrieve the father and brother. If either one had taken a shotgun and killed Brand on sight, public opinion would have held such a course far more commendable than the policy adopted. If either one had challenged him, given him a show for his life, and in the duel killed him, public sentiment would have condoned such a step, and no jury in this country would award any penalty for the slain. But the overpowering attack by three men was itself a mob attack. Three may constitute a mob as well as ten or twenty. Of course there will be some to defend the trio of assaulters, but the consensus of public opinion will be against it, and by the greater part of our people it will be regarded as essentially unfair. It has not served, so far as we can see, any good purpose, but to the contrary has intensified the bitter feeling existing here. 
Brand's friends never endorsed his article on Baylor, but this assault justified their indignation. As for Judge Scarborough, we must regret his act and express surprise that he got his consent to such a course. As for Hamilton, his participation is altogether indefensible. End of section 8. Bran and Baylor. Section 9 of the Complete Works of Bran, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12, by William Cowper Bran. Section 9. The following is the account of the shooting of Bran from the Waco Times-Herald. See the editorial for the attitude of this paper. The anti-mortem statement of Davis and the statements of Moore, Hall, and Sherman Vaughan are identical in both papers and are therefore not repeated. The Times-Herald gave no statements from Earp, Peterson, Chase, Inslee, nor Duggar. Note other statements not given in the Tribune. Terrific Deadly Conflict A fearful street fight in which W. C. Bran and Tom E. Davis were riddled with pistol shots and William H. Ward shot through the hand. Bran, editor of Iconoclast, dead. The life of Tom E. Davis, the well-known real estate man of Waco, hangs by a slender thread with almost every chance against him. Bran Baylor Affair the Cause a motorman and musician wounded by flying missiles, ward in jail on a charge of assault to murder, the city thrown into a whirlwind of excitement over the fearful affair, and happy homes made sad. At this writing, nine o'clock, W. C. Bran, editor of Bran's Iconoclast, and Tom E. Davis, a prominent real estate man of this city, lie dangerously wounded with a likelihood of their dying at any moment william h ward an employee of w c bran is shot through the right hand cy kennedy a motorman on the street car line is shot in the right knee and kepler a traveling musician is shot in the right foot the three men last named are only slightly wounded W. C. Bran is shot through the left groin in the right foot and through the middle of the back about the lower part of the shoulder blade, ranged upward and outward, coming out at the front side near the point where the arm joins the body. Tom E. Davis is shot twice in the right arm, the balls going through the arm leaving four holes, one in the upper left arm near the shoulder on the outer part of the arm. This ball ranged to the back and came out just a little ways in the left shoulder. Another shot took effect in the right breast near the nipple, ranged outward and backward, coming out of the back near the side. Another shot took effect in the back near the right side, about the waistband, ranged outward and downward, and lodged just over the spine, just under the skin. Another shot took effect just under the right arm, ranged backward, coming out about six inches in the back. This made a total of six shots that took effect in Davis's body. From best information obtained, the cause of the trouble dates back to the old Bran Baylor affair. It was during this trouble that Mr. Davis was an outspoken advocate for Baylor, and had made the same statement that scores of other people in Waco are accredited with having made that Bran is a scoundrel and ought to be run out of town. Mr. Davis was fearless and outspoken, and Mr. Bran learned of the stand he took. 
Yesterday it seems that Mr. Bran, in company with Mr. W. H. Ward, an employee of his, made it convenient to come in contact with Mr. Davis, and one of them, supposed to be Mr. Bran, cursed Mr. Davis as he passed them. Mr. Davis had been out on the street, where he had just been passed by the men a couple of times, and returned to his office on Fourth Street, between Franklin and Austin Streets. He had been in his office only a minute or so, when Messrs. Bran and Ward passed, with Bran on the inside. As the two men passed, Mr. Davis says that one of them remarked in a loud voice, "'There is the damned cowardly son of a—' blank. He will take anything. To which Mr. Davis replied, Are you scoundrels talking about me? The shooting followed immediately. When the shooting ended, Davis was taken into French's newsstand, and several physicians were called in. Opiates were administered, and it looked as if Davis would die at any moment. He talked some to his friends, frequently saying, They have got me. I am bound to go. County Clerk Joni Jones was present, and all being fearful that Davis might die at any moment, Mr. Jones took his anti-mortem statement, which is given below. Mr. Bran was taken to the City Hall by officers Sam Hall and Dury, where he was laid upon a couch, and other physicians attended him until 7.20 o'clock, when he was taken home, being accompanied by physicians and friends. Ward, Kennedy, and Kepler all repaired to the drug stores and had their wounds dressed. Something near an hour after the shooting, Mrs. Davis and her children came from their home in East Waco to the side of the wounded husband and father. At dark, Davis was removed to the Pacific Hotel, where Dr. J. C. J. King attended him in his official capacity. Mrs. Davis was with her husband, and numerous friends were present to administer every want. Mr. Ward employed an attorney. Justice W. H. Davis was called up by telephone, and about nine o'clock he opened court in his courtroom. Mr. Ward, through his attorney, waived all formalities, preliminaries, and examination, and was granted bond in the sum of $4,000, which he failed to give, and went to jail. From the moment the first shot was fired, citizens rushed to the scene from every part of the city, and in a moment after the firing had ceased, there were fully one thousand persons on Fourth Street surging around French's newsstand, while there were two-thirds that number at the City Hall, where Mr. Bran was being attended to, and up until after midnight the streets were filled with hundreds and hundreds of citizens grouped here and there, in all of the hotels and on the street corners discussing the one absorbing question the shooting at midnight both mr davis and mr bran were alive with the former resting much easier e p norwood mr e p norwood said just prior to the shooting i had walked up fourth street passing mr bran and ward standing in front of krauss's store near Banker's Alley, when I met Herman Strauss, who insisted that I go back across the alley to Lanary's saloon. As we went back, I saw Bran and Ward still standing where they were, and at that moment Tom Davis had just come up the sidewalk in front of Lanary's, and, leaving Banker's Alley without crossing it, he went immediately to his office. In a moment, I saw Bran and Ward go directly to Davis's office. I thought nothing unusual of this, not knowing that any difficulty was liable to occur, and went into Lanary's to take a drink. In a moment or so, I heard two or three shots fired, and I immediately ran to the door. When I got where I could see the men, I saw Davis on the ground, and Bran and Ward standing up, firing at him. I am positive that Ward fired one shot, if not two shots. He ceased, and Bran continued firing, until an officer rushed right into the shooting and caught Bran. John Sleeper Mr. John Sleeper was an eyewitness and made the following statement. I was standing in the 4th Street entrance to my store, and was looking south on 4th Street, 
and saw Mr. Bran and Mr. Ward coming up the sidewalk from the alley in front of the Cotton Belt ticket office, and then turned and looked north towards Austin Street. And while looking in that direction, I heard three pistol shots almost simultaneously, and turned and looked in the direction from which the pistol shots came, and saw Mr. Tom Davis reeling and falling to the sidewalk, and Mr. Bran firing upon him. Mr. Davis fell to the ground almost in a heap, and rolled over as many as four times. Mr. Ward handed Mr. Bran a pistol, and Bran stepped forward towards Davis, and began firing on him as he was rolling upon the sidewalk. Bran and Ward then turned and walked away on 4th Street towards Austin Street, to a point directly opposite my door, where I was standing, when two police officers came across 4th Street from the direction of the Citizens National Bank, and as they came up to Bran he remarked, "'Gentlemen, I am shot,' but Ward said nothing. I noticed blood flowing from Ward's right hand, as if he was wounded in it. I did not see Mr. Davis or Mr. Ward either shoot at any time. Ab Vaughn Mr. Ab Vaughn, a well-known man about town, says that while crossing 4th Street from the Cotton Belt ticket office, towards the pacific hotel he passed bran and ward in the street on the east side of the street railway track and that he overheard one of them say to the other i wouldn't do it though which one spoke he was unable to say he paid no attention to the remark at the time and stepped into the pacific saloon the next instant he heard the reports of a pistol followed in rapid succession by a number of other shots W. O. Brown. Mr. W. O. Brown made the following statement. A few minutes before six o'clock, I was at the Pacific Hotel Bar in company with W. C. Bran. We conversed together for fifteen or twenty minutes, during the course of which Baylor University was discussed, as well as the trouble attendant upon his philippics against it. Before parting, Mr. Bran remarked in rather a sneering way, I expect to get killed, but when I am, Baylor will have become a thing of the past, or words to that effect. We separated, and I walked down 4th Street to Austin, where I met my wife and a lady friend in our phaeton, and after a moment's conversation with her, entered a buggy with Mr. C. M. Clisby, and started to the opera house. Just as we turned the corner, I heard a pistol shot, perhaps two, and turning my head saw Tom Davis fall to the sidewalk. I jumped from the buggy and ran towards my wife's phaeton, fearing her horse would take fright, but finding my fears groundless, hastened to the scene of the shooting, and there found Tom Davis lying on the sidewalk, and assisted in carrying him into French's newsstand. I heard several shots fired after I saw Davis fall, but who fired them I am unable to say. Judge J. W. Davis Judge John W. Davis said, I was standing on 4th Street, just below the Pacific Hotel entrance, talking to a number of gentlemen, among them John W. Marshall. I heard a pistol shot up 4th Street, and turned and saw in front of W. F. Williams and Company's office what appeared to be several men in a scuffle. The larger man was falling toward the street. Shots were fired into him as he was falling, and continued after he was lying on the sidewalk and was rolling over. The shots were fired in such rapid succession that it seemed impossible for them to have come from one pistol. I did not recognize the participants at first, but thought that the man falling was Tom Davis. After eight or ten shots had been fired, I recognized W. C. Bran with a policeman. I could not tell what was the relative position of the party. They all seemed to be in a clump. J. W. Williams John W. Williams says, just a few moments before the shooting, Tom Davis came into our office, that of Williams and Company, and said hello to Tom Sparks, who was talking to me. He then turned and went out. 
In a moment I heard a click as though a pistol was being cocked, and at that time recognized the voice of Davis saying something like, Don't talk to me. At the same time, I saw the tail of Davis's coat go back as if he was trying to draw his pistol. Rapid shooting followed as if from several pistols. When I reached the door, I saw Ward either shoot or push Davis down, his hand being almost or quite against Davis and Davis between me and him. At the same time as the push or shot from Ward, I saw Bran fire and the firing was continued by Bran, Davis at this time struggling on the ground or sidewalk, and called out to me that he was murdered. I got his pistol. Bran continued to fire, and snapped his pistol several times after Davis was down. The shots were fired very rapidly, and as I was looking at and watching Bran so intently I cannot say whether Ward was shooting or not, as I was not looking at him. W. S. Gillespie. Mr. W. S. Gillespie said, I was sitting in my office a few minutes prior to the shooting, and noticed Mr. Bran and Mr. Ward, his business manager, standing across the street on the corner of Banker's Alley, in very earnest conversation, looking across the street as if watching someone or something, and finally came across to the corner in front of my office and after they passed going north towards austin street i heard the rapid firing of guns and ran out and found t e davis lying on the sidewalk and i went up to him and asked him if he was very badly hurt and he remarked they have assassinated me they have murdered me and friends came up to my assistance and he was conveyed to french's cigar store b h kirk Mr. B. H. Kirk said, At the time of the shooting, I was on the sidewalk in front of Mr. Mackey's office. I noticed W. C. Bran and W. H. Ward together, crossing 4th Street from the direction of Krause's store, and walking towards Tom Davis's office. A moment or two after I heard two shots fired very near together, and looking, saw Tom Davis on the sidewalk in front of his office in the act of falling. As he lay on the sidewalk, two more shots were fired into him. After these last two shots, Davis rolled over and fired at Bran, and I thought hit him in the breast. After that, several more shots were fired into Davis. Bran and Ward were about three feet from Davis during the firing, standing near the outside of the sidewalk and perhaps a little nearer to Austin Street. I cannot say I saw W. H. Ward fire, but my impression is that all three were shooting. R. H. Kingsbury R. H. Kingsbury said, I was standing close to the telephone post between Pacific Hotel Bar and Moses Newsstand when I heard one or two shots fired almost together. I exclaimed, Tom Davis is killed for I saw him on the sidewalk in front of his office struggling and rolling. As Davis lay on the sidewalk, dead as I thought, there were two men shooting at him. These men, I learn, were W. C. Bran and his bodyguard, W. H. Ward. While so shooting at Davis, Bran was in front of Ward, and both were firing. I do not know if Davis fired before he was down. Later Later, at 1 a.m., a Times Herald reporter visited the home of Mr. Bran and found him dying. At 10.30 o'clock, he had a hemorrhage of the lungs, which filled one of them up, and the lung was still bleeding at 1 a.m., and his vitality was fast ebbing away. Dr. M. L. Graves said that the sufferer could not possibly live longer than two hours and was liable to die at any moment. At 1 a.m., Mr. Tom Davis had not rallied from the effects of his wounds, and but little hope was entertained for his recovery. Mr. Davis has wonderful vitality, and his great strength may yet pull him through, though there is but the faintest hope that it will. Dr. King is still at his bedside, doing all that is possible for him to do. Later, at one fifty-five o'clock this morning, W. C. Bran, the noted editor of Bran's Iconoclast, breathed his last.
Just before the end came, his family and intimate friends were gathered about him. His lungs were filled from the internal hemorrhage, and he passed peacefully away. 3 a.m. At this hour, Mr. Tom E. Davis is rapidly sinking, and it is thought that the end is near at hand. It may be possible for the wounded man to live as long as two hours, but all hope has fled, and the end is watched for, which may come at any minute. His physicians say he is dying. End of section 9《Section 10 of the Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 10. Editorial The Late Tragedy. The details of the awful tragedy of Friday evening are yet fresh in the minds of the people of Waco, and it is bootless to recount them. Two of the principals there, too, have passed to the beyond, and a third is in the hands of the outraged law, and with him let the law deal. In life, Captain Davis was our friend. His assailant was our enemy. In death, they take on the proportions of common humanity. Upon the bier of one we will lay the myrtle of never-dying remembrance. Over the coffin of the other let the mantle of forgetfulness rest. The Times Herald makes no war upon the dead. It is not with the dead we deal today, but the living, the citizenship, the municipality, the people of Waco who must suffer, who must endure, and who must survive the blow that has fallen upon us not because two brave men are dead but because of the stain of blood guiltiness that has again besmirched our fair escutcheon this tragedy has harmed waco almost beyond the power of men to help because it has again been blazoned to the world that here human life is cheapened that men's passions rule rather than the written law and that our Christian civilization is but the thinnest veneer atop of the savage. Yet out of this may come a blessing to Waco. If it shall teach men to rule their passions and their speech, if it shall show us the way to lean upon the arm of the law rather than upon the might of our own strength, if it shall make us more tolerant of the opinions of our neighbor, if it shall incline us to encourage the public weal rather than private animosities the shadow of tragedy may yet pass and the sunlight of humanity prevail the times has no heart for moralizing it will add no pang to the grief of those who mourn it asks of the people of waco that upon the two new mounds made in oakland today the seeds of forgetfulness may spring into verdure, covering feud and hiding passion, and that the dead past will bury its dead, leaving to the present hope and to the future fruition. End of section 10. Recording by John Brandon. Section 11 of the complete works of bran the iconoclast volume twelve this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by rita boutros the complete works of bran the iconoclast volume twelve by william cowper bran section eleven here follow the contents of the May 1898 iconoclast published by Brand's friends after his death. The Passing of William Cowper Brand by G. P. Gerald Poetic legend says that on a moonlight night, two thousand years ago, along the shores of the Gulf of Patras, 
a mighty voice was heard, crying, Great Pan is dead! And from the mountains and the valleys, the woods and grottoes, where stood the altars of those who worshipped at the shrine of Pan, was re-echoed back the cry, Great Pan is dead! On the 2nd of April, when the winged lightning bore over a continent, and to foreign lands beyond the sea, the news that W. C. Bran of the iconoclast was dead, in every land where his writings are known, from men and women who worship at the shrine of genius, went up the wailing cry, Bran of the iconoclast is dead. O oh, death, thou grim and imperious master of us all, how dreadful to the living are your silent darts, that are ever striking with impartial hand the old man in his dotage, the strong man in his prime, the brave man in his courage, and the craven in his fear. W. C. Bran was forty-three years of age, and had just arrived at that period when he was beginning to realize the hopes and aspirations of years when he was stricken down amid the rejoicings of many and the sorrows of many thousands more. He was born in Coles County, Illinois, and at the age of two and a half years, by the death of his mother, was placed with a sister some two years older than himself in the care of Mr. Hawkins and his wife, who lived on a farm in that county. He remained with them ten years, and then, longing to be something more than a farm hand, he packed his small belongings in a little box, and at night, when all was still, he took the box under his arm and went out into the lonely darkness of the moonless night, without money, friends, or education, to commence the struggle which ended in his untimely death at Waco. Mr. Bran always spoke in the most kindly terms of Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins, and when he purchased his home in this city, he offered to share it with them, but having grown old and being comfortably situated, they did not desire to change. The first place he secured was that of a bellboy in a hotel, and from that passed on to other situations, realizing all the time what every proud-spirited boy would do under the circumstances, the bitterness that friendlessness, ignorance, and poverty bring to the struggle of life. Among other things, he learned the trade of painter and grainer, also that of printer, all the time storing his mind with what scraps of education that his life of poverty and toil permitted. After he gathered sufficient education, he became a newspaper writer, and in 1877, at Rochelle, Illinois, was married to Miss Carrie Martin, who, with two children, Grace and William Carlyle, Little Billy, as we call him, survive him. After the death of Mrs. Brand's mother, he took to his home one of her sisters, now Mrs. Marple of Fort Worth, and although often driven to the most desperate straits to make a living, he proved to her to be both a brother and a father. He continued his newspaper career in Illinois and Missouri, until some thirteen years ago when he came to Texas, and gradually became known by his connection with various papers of the state. For a short time he had an interest in a paper called The Iconoclast, published in Austin, but he soon found himself back at his old trade, that of driving his pen for others. At last, worn out by long years of unremitting and generally poorly requited toil, wearied with waiting for opportunity to write as he wished, but could not do as an employee of others, he determined to again strike out for himself, as he had done in his early boyhood, and in 1894 came to this city and established the iconoclast, which was a success from its first issue, and continued to grow in circulation as he grew in reputation as a writer, until the copy that witnessed his death reached an issue of nearly ninety thousand. The world, for several generations, has been discussing whether Shakespeare wrote the plays that bear his name. 
thousands believing that it was impossible for a man who had no more education than Shakespeare had in his youth to have exhibited the varied knowledge and learning that characterize his works. Therefore these attribute them to Sir Francis Bacon, one of the most brilliant and best educated men of his time. All the evidence goes to show that at the age of eighteen, when Shakespeare married, that he had acquired with a little Latin and less Greek the ordinary education accorded to the sons of the well-to-do middle-class Englishmen of his time, of which his father was one. At eighteen, Mr. Bran had barely secured the rudiments of an English education, and had he lived to the age of Shakespeare, there is no telling to what heights intellectually he would have risen. From a slight knowledge of his hopes and aspirations, I can say that while he dearly loved the iconoclast as a vehicle by which he could convey to the world his thoughts, he had aspirations that went far beyond it, and proposed that during the next ten nor twelve years, after his mind had been fully stored for the work, to leave as a legacy to the world in a continuous work his conception of the wrongs done to humanity, the evils that spring from them, and the remedies to be applied." and all who have read him closely and noticed how month by month he grew greater and brighter will surely join in saying that the loss of such a work from such a man at the meridian of his intellectual life is only second if not equal to the loss of the unwritten volumes of buckle's history of civilization alas that such a man with such a great future before him should have died standing on the very threshold of his work in the private relations of life mr bran was as extraordinary as in his public career he presented that combination that is so rare that even novelists do not attempt to paint it the combination of the lover and the husband and as a father a friend a lover of humanity with a broad mantle of charity for all, he had few equals. While he wrote in prose, he was a poet, and of him can be truly said, The thoughts that stir the poet's heart are not the thoughts that others feel. From the world's creed they are all apart, and oftener work his woe than weal. They are born of high imaginings, kindled to life by passion's fire, and o'er earth's dross his fancy flings the golden dreams that wrap his lyre. As a writer, Mr. Bran had his faults, but they were the heritage of this God-given son of genius, and with them he climbed the heights and died among the greatest, both of the living and the dead. And had he lived ten years longer, in all probability the intellectual world would have held him as the grandest writer that this earth has ever known, since the days when old Homer painted the matchless beauty of the bride of Menelaus, and told of the godlike courage of the Greek and Trojan as they fought for her, from the Scamander to the sea. While the ignorant, the bigoted, and intolerant are rejoicing in his death, and garnishing his grave with the slime of their slander they may be assured that his name and writings will live until the english language dies and when w c bran is dead and forgotten so will be stern smollet fielding swift pope steele addison goldsmith shakespeare ben and sam johnson byron shelley keats Carlyle, George Eliot, and all that mighty host that have made the English language what it is. The language that the little tribe of the Angles brought from the forest of Germany to Britain swallowed the Britain and survived the Norman conquest, and then absorbed both the conqueror and his language and in the dead centuries of over a thousand years in every generation has produced some mighty intellect to speed it on in building up the bulwarks of human rights and human liberty until they have grown so high that despots turn from it with loathing and slaves cannot speak it 
the language of the Magna Carta, and the Declaration of American Independence, the two instruments that have spread the breadth of liberty before a hungry world. And as a writer of this language, with all its mighty past and greater future, W. C. Bran had few equals and no superiors. I have been asked, both before and since his death, what were his religious opinions, and while every man's religious opinions are his own, and no one has the right to question them, I will say he was a deist something after the manner of Thomas Paine, and for the benefit of some of our professors and preachers, who do not know the difference between an atheist and a deist, I will say that a deist is one who believes in one God, and rejects all forms of so-called revealed religion. Mr. Bran loved nature, and when he looked upon it, he saw nature's God, that with eternal fingers has written his message on earth and sky, so that savage and civilized, Christian and infidel alike could read, that has by immutable and unvarying laws regulated the bloom of the flowers, the course of the winds, and the fall of the leaf, as well as the revolutions of the countless millions of worlds that are ever speeding through the unmeasurable realms of space. He believed that this mighty power, that men call God, could perpetuate man in the hereafter as easily as he had placed him here. And while he, like many others, knew that all his hopes and faith did not furnish one atom of real proof as to what lies beyond the gates of death, still he hoped for the brighter and better life, and when that beautiful smile overspread his face when he died, those who beheld it felt that he had realized his hopes, and in the shadowy realm that bounds the Stygian river had met his little girl Inez, whose untimely death at the age of barely twelve years had worked such havoc in his heart. Mr. Bran loved nature, not only when the gorgeous god of day threw over earth and sky the flashing strands of his golden hair, but in the night-time, when all else was wrapped in the arms of sleep, the twin sister of death, and the belated passer-by of his home, often saw the gleam of his cigar as he sat or walked upon the lawn in the small hours of the night and at such time i know there came through his soul the thoughts if not the words of that death-devoted greek who to the question from the woman that he loved o oh, ion shall we meet again answered i have asked that dreadful question of the hills that look eternal of the clear streams that flow on for ever of the bright stars amid whose fields of azure my raised spirit has walked in glory all, all are dumb. But when I gaze upon thy face, I feel that there is something in the love that mantles through its beauty that cannot wholly perish. We shall meet again, Clemanthe. But it was not the name of Clemanthe that passed his lips. It was ever, Inez, darling Inez, we shall meet again. I here reproduce in his own words an extract appropriate to this subject, it is from the iconoclast of march eighteen ninety six and an article headed beecher on the bible i know nothing of the future i spend no time speculating upon it i am overwhelmed by the past and at death grips with the present at the grave god draws the line between the two eternities never has living man lifted the sombre veil of death and looked beyond there is a deity. I have felt his presence. I have heard his voice. I have been cradled in his imperial robe. All that is, or was, or can ever be, is but the visible garment of God. I seek to know nothing of his plans and purposes. I ask no written covenant with God, for he is my Father. I will trust him without requiring priests or prophets to endorse his note. As I write, my little son awake, alarmed by some unusual noise, and come groping through the darkness to my door. 
He sees the light shining through the transom, returns to his trundle bed, and lies down to peaceful dreams. He knows that beyond that gleam his father keeps watch and ward, and he asks no more. Through a thousand celestial transoms streams the light of God. Why should I fear the sleep of death, the unknown terrors of that starless night, the waves of the river Styx? Why should I seek assurance from the lips of men that the wisdom, love, and power of my heavenly Father will not fail? Like the lowly Judean carpenter who gave his life in a protest against the wrongs which wealth and power had done to his fellow man, he was hated by the Pharisees and hypocrites, but he never cast a stone at the poor and unfortunate, but was ever ready to support the weak battling in the cause of right against the cohorts of the wrong. He was not only a poet, but was a prophet and a priest, not the prophet and priest of orthodoxy that has handed down to us through the ages, written in the blood of slaughtered millions, that dark story of fork-tailed demons and flaming hells, that has given us a God that loves us better than an earthly father can, yet permits us in the sight of his great white throne to writhe and suffer through the endless ages of eternity in the flames of hell but he was a priest and prophet of a greater and grander faith that in the evolution of the unborn centuries yet to come will strip from the godhead all of the horrid concepts born of the puny hate of man for his fellow man. Mr. Bran was a man of the highest moral courage. No one doubted this but some doubted whether he had that kind of physical courage that is necessary to contend with mobs and assassins. But when the hour came, when, without the slightest warning or anticipation of danger, the death wound tore through his back with a coolness that few, even of the bravest of men, would have possessed under the circumstances, with a courage that could have led the Irish exiles in that desperate and deathless charge on the bloody heights of Fontenoy, he turned and fired every bullet of his pistol into the body of his assassin. I will briefly sketch here some of the main facts that led to his death, not only justice to the dead, but to his living friends, who only knew him as a writer, and have been compelled to read in the newspapers the loathsome and lying slanders sent out against him from this city. The origin is to be found in the visit to this city of ex-priest Slattery, who, for gross immorality, had been kicked out of the fold of the Catholic Church he was accompanied by a woman fully as bad as he, and these two saints set up to lecture, and the substance of their lecture was briefly this, that convents and female schools under the charge of the sisters were but bawdy houses to satisfy the lust of the Catholic priesthood. Mr. Bran, who heard in the opera house in this city these vile slanders flung amid thunders of applause, mostly from a gang of blackguards from and around Baylor University, outraged by the wrong done the pure and stainless women whose vows bar them from the slightest hope of reward on earth, yet devote their lives in and out of the convent walls to soothing the sorrows and relieving the sufferings of humanity, attempted to reply in their defense, and for this he was hooted and nearly mobbed by this precious lot of curs, and had to be escorted from the opera house by the police. After the Antonio Texiera scandal came out, and he saw the poor girl reduced to ruin, standing barely on the verge of womanhood, desolate and friendless in a foreign land, with his whole sympathetic nature aroused in her behalf, he certainly struck some hard blows at Baylor. In his repeated thrusts he made one at the professors which is believed by many to have cut far deeper than anything ever said about the Brazilian girl and that was his proposition to open a night school for their benefit 
In last October iconoclast, in a paragraph, he expressed the hope that Baylor would not continue to manufacture ministers and Magdalens. For this he was twice mobbed, and it is claimed eventually murdered. Since Mr. Brand's assassination, I have seen it charged in some papers, notably one bearing the word Christian at its head, that he was killed because he had slandered his slayer's daughter, and then follows a lot of hypocritical rot about regretting bloodshed, but that there was an unwritten law that required the death of a man who would slander the female relatives of another. A greater falsehood was never published in even a pious Christian weekly. He never mentioned the name of any woman connected with Baylor except the Brazilian girl, and her case was in the courts. And while his friends deeply regretted his unfortunate expression, it neither justified his mobbing or his murder and in the judgment of all fair-minded men, under the circumstances could have been more readily construed to mean Antonio Texiera than any other woman on earth, for within Baylor's sacred precincts she had been reduced to that condition to which, when a woman arrives, men call her a Magdalene. If this was the motive that prompted his slayer, I ask why he did not appeal to the unwritten law sooner. He who appeals to it must do so at the first information has been conveyed to him that the wrong has been done, and he cannot wait for months and then use it as a defense. And I do not hesitate to say that hundreds beside myself in this city do not believe that this prompted his assassin except to be used as an excuse. Mr. Bran loved Waco, as he never loved any other place, for he knew that within its borders could be found as many brave, liberal-hearted men, pure and noble women as could be found in any other spot on earth with the same population. He loved it, for he said that here was the first place he ever found a real home and here was the place he had for the first time been recompensed for his toil by receiving over a bare subsistence now did waco love mr bran or did it hold him the foul slanderer of her purest and best as some claimed him to be let us see every effort was made to throw cold water on any turnout to his funeral it was told around the city that no women would attend and that no flowers would be sent but what was the result from his home to the cemetery the sidewalks were crowded save at baylor university the place that is responsible for his death and hundreds of men and women who had no carriages walked from his home over two miles to the cemetery and when the long funeral cortege passed within the gates around his grave was a sea of human faces unequalled in numbers ever before gathered around any other grave in waco yet waco had lately lain to rest within that cemetery a man whom she dearly loved and on whom texas had been proud to confer her high places a man who in bygone years had so gallantly led her sons on so many bloody fields as to the flowers no greater profusion was ever seen on any other grave in waco or perhaps in texas a tribute that the pure and stainless women of waco paid to the martyred dead at his funeral was noticed a greater number, both from the city and county, of the sun-kissed sons of toil than had ever been gathered here around any other grave. Why were they there in such numbers? Why did they bow their manly heads or the coffin of the dead? I will answer for them. It was because they knew that the dead man loved the land that they, their sires and their grandsires, loved that he was seeking to uproot the evils, both socially and politically, that are so rapidly overrunning it, that all the gold of earth, or the plaudits of those who feel themselves the grand and great, could not win him from his task of defending a people's rights against those who were seeking to strike them down. And if he had made an error in a paragraph subject to a double construction, 
that above all else on earth in his heart he sought, but the ruin of the bad, the righting of the wrong and ill. He was followed to his grave by hundreds of men who but a few years ago had given of their money liberally to build up the new baylor, many of whose wives, daughters, and sisters had been educated there. Is it reasonable to suppose that these men who clung to him in life with hooks of steel and followed him to his grave with tears are such cravens that, alike in life and death, they would stand by the man who had foully slandered their wives, daughters, and sisters' fame? Out upon such a supposition, it can only find lodgment in a breast that holds that the Yahoo of Swift is a true picture of the human race, and that the lowest of the type is living here. If Mr. Bran was the slanderer of women, why did so many of them, from the hundreds that crowded the lawn around his home, lead their children up to his coffin, and those that were not able to look into it, they would raise up in their arms that they might look into the dead face of the prince of the imperial realm of language? Mr. Bran was no slanderer of women. No man on earth had a greater veneration for the good and pure, or more sympathy for the fallen, and he would have died before he would have wronged intentionally either class. In this case he had struck in behalf of a poor and unfortunate girl who had been grievously wronged at Baylor, and it used to be held and is yet held in some communities that the man who strikes in the defense of a defenseless woman exhibits the highest trait of chivalry, even if he had made a mistake in striking. But here in Waco, with its Christian schools and churches, and its so-called Christian civilization, it was rewarded first by mobs and then by murder. He was a man who was incapable of malice, he bore none for injuries that most men would have rewarded the cowardly perpetrators by shooting them down like they have their prototype, the sneaking wolf. This arose from the innate tenderness of the man who shrunk from the taking of life, even of an animal, unless it was necessary. I have used no words of sympathy for his wife, for time and not words can soothe sorrow such as hers, but for the benefit of those at a distance who were her husband's friends i will say that she has the sympathy of all the men and women of this city irrespective of church or creed who are not the endorsers and abettors of mobs and assassins and i am glad to say that this collection of hyena-hearted human vultures though far too many are in the minority now to the dead friend of humanity, the eternal foe to wrong and hypocrisy, I bid adieu forever here, and for aught I know for hereafter. The greedy grave, whose hungry mouth is never filled, has claimed him, and in the arms of old earth, the last mother of us all, we have laid him to sleep, as peacefully as in infancy he slept upon his mother's breast, indifferent alike in death as in life to the human ghouls who pursued him. Never again will his splendid intellect drive a pen. In thoughts that breathe and words that burn, against the serried ranks of injustice and of wrong, others will follow in his footsteps and battle as faithfully as he for the cause of right. But alas, none are clad like him in the Milan male of intellectuality against which the cloth-yard shafts of foes could rattle but could never pierce now that for him the restless dream of life has closed i know that every admirer of his genius no matter of what faith or of no faith at all will join me in the wish that for him death did not bring oblivion's dreamless sleep where lethean waves forever wash the pallid brow of death but elysian fields in which he met in joy the loved ones that had gone before and will await in peace the loved ones that are left behind o oh, jerusalem jerusalem thou that killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee end of section eleven
Section 12 of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in October 2019. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 12 rest rest in peace by w h ward there comes i think in the life of every man a time when feeble words come faintly up for utterance when the human soul refuses to ease tells its agony in empty phrases when neither tongue can tell nor pen portray the gloom which overshadows the spirit engulfed in woe this suffering may be selfish or be merged in a general sorrow as i write the simple sentence bran is dead a pall settles over my spirit and groping blindly in the dark i feel there remains on earth scarce a single ray of light i knew this man and to know him was to love him knew his faults and his virtues loved him in spite of the one and for the other his faults were human his virtues were godlike for years we tried together life's unequal pathway at times i felt that i stayed his falling steps and my own feet have strayed oft and again has his firm hand led me back into the light he was to me a delightful study for which i found never failing recompense i have watched his majestic mind expand as the florist watches the budding beauty of a flower ever growing in its unfolding loveliness I have lived with him in his home, surrounded by those whom he loved, seeing him joy with their gladness, while his heart contracted with every pain that approached his loved ones, have stood with him on the banks of some mighty river, and watched the evening sun throw its chain of fire across the bosom of the waters, while his poetic spirit reveled in the beauties of the sunset sky. Under the shadow of lookout, I have gazed with him upon those beetling crags where the fate of a nation was in part decided, while he thanked God fervently that the heart of the nation yet beat steady and strong. Have strolled with him in the forests when vernal nature spread its glorious carpet for the foot of man. Have felt his great heart expand to receive every subtle impression of beauty and tenderness from nature's matchless canvas have seen this man against whom the anathema of infidelity and atheism have gone forth humbly bow to worship god in his handiwork for him as for us all there were times when the earth was darkened with doubt but there were moments i know when his aspiring soul mounted the clouds and caught some reflex of the great white light that breaks on the throne of god it has been charged that he had neither faith nor religion in justice to the memory of the dead i deny that charge he had a faith as noble as it was unfaltering that truth was eternal and the love of justice could never utterly fade from the hearts of men his religion was simple still though confined by neither church nor creed twas the fatherhood of god and the brotherhood of man as he loved truth and justice even so did he despise falsehood declaring that he hated all who loveth or maketh a lie he loved his fellows as few men have done the great desire of his heart and no small part of his life work was devoted to the alleviation of human suffering in his nature he was frank and open as the day generous to a fault i do not believe that he gave his affection fondly or foolishly if those whom he loved failed to reach his high standard it was not his fault his was a great heart and he gave its tenderness with a princely hand feeling himself rich in giving glorying in his own munificence no man could have been the recipient of this rich bounty without feeling himself ennobled by the gift he had the faculty of attracting to him all whom he considered worthy of his affection he possessed in a rare degree that which for want of a better name we term personal magnetism 
intellectually he was a meteor that shot athwart the literary firmament leaving a train of fire behind to mark his course within a period of four years in an inland texas town he built up a magazine which was read by a large percentage of the english-speaking people he had at the time of his death a larger clientele of readers than any living writer for years he did all of the work of the iconoclast himself but of late he had gathered about him a corps of contributors in whose genius he himself reveled a bunch of pansy blossoms he fondly termed them whose beauty and fragrance would he declared delight the literary world the hand that held these blossoms is now folded across a pulseless breast but the silken skein of his affection will yet serve to bind the flowers together the bright particular star of the iconoclastic galaxy is dimmed but the blended light of the others may still serve to illumine the dark places of life and in so doing help to achieve that betterment of man for which their chief toiled so earnestly battled so bravely and hoped so ardently the poor and oppressed have lost a friend and a protector true womanhood has lost one of its ablest defenders liberty its bravest champion his country a hero ever ready to fight for a redress of her wrongs he was a humanitarian in the broadest and best sense of the word in his heart there lived ever a hope that the time might yet come in this fair land of ours where there would be neither a millionaire nor a mendicant a master nor a slave in life he was dear to me his memory is dearer still nay tis sacred i would not play boswell to any johnson but this was my friend tender loving and loyal to me and now that he is dead i come to lay this tribute in the dust at his feet he has been judged oftenest and most unjustly as men usually are by those who knew him least beneath the iron corselet which confronted the eyes of the world there beat in this man's breast a heart tender as a child's and as loving as a woman's that throbbed in agony for every ill to which humanity is heir i remember in the early morning once he came into my room and silently beckoned me to his study there in the vines at the window scarce three feet from his desk sat one of our southern orioles a feathered songster trilling forth the gladness of his heart in song Bran watched the bird and drank in the music of his song. I saw his face light up with exquisite tenderness, and I knew that he accepted this matin song of the bird as a message from his maker. I trust I may be pardoned for relating this simple incident, but it served to show me the man as few things could have done. I know tis true that... Quote, as snowflakes fall to the earth unperceived and are gathered together in a pile so do the seemingly unimportant events of life succeed one another no single flake creates a sensible change on the pile and no single act constitutes however much it may exhibit a man's character End quote. but it is from simple things that the sum of life is made up from those acts which are most spontaneous and usually least observed that human nature may best be determined and most justly estimated this man made no preachment of his virtues believing that the years are seldom unjust he was the navarre of modern journalism and his white plume ever showed in the thickest of the fight it was his strong hand that taught the doubtful battle where to rage "'Twas his to enchain friendship and inspire followers. "'Had he battled for a creed as he fought for a faith, "'his bones would have been canonized. "'Had he struggled for a party as he stood for the state, "'no political preferment would have been held beyond his reach. "'Had he lived in another age among other people, "'his body would have been inurned in the Valhalla of the brave.' as it is all that is mortal of him occupies only so much of texas soil as may serve as quote, paste and cover of his bones little does he reck of this and his friends should not repine for the same prairie breezes that waft incense of flowers over the graves of travis bowie and crockett sing a sad requiem over the final resting-place of bran 
the aspiring soul has found its fixed abode among the stars his titanic intellect which here on earth ever struggled for the light now bathes in the effulgence of the sun his heart ever unquiet because of the woes of his kind now knows that peace which passeth the understanding of man the hand of the all-father has for ever soothed the heart hunger and unrest of life from his troubled breast that hand which swept at will every chord of the harp of life has fallen nerveless but its music will yet linger in the hearts of men until love of truth and beauty shall utterly fade from the earth a long good night to thee brave heart thy better part has found the better place to that which is mortal and remains with us we say rest rest in peace end of section twelve section thirteen of the complete works of brand the iconoclast volume twelve this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in October 2019. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 13. This section is comprised of three articles. A Memorial to W.C. Bran a poem entitled speaking of bran and an essay entitled death of w c bran we begin with a memorial to w c bran it has been suggested that the friends and admirers of mr bran join in a contribution to mark the spot where he sleeps it is proposed if this meets the approval of friends that it be a granite vase some four or five feet high surmounted either by a life-size statue in bronze or marble of the dead holding in his hand a copy of the iconoclast as if offering it to the passer-by and the word iconoclast upon it in letters sufficiently large to be read at a distance of twenty feet it is said by those who claim to know that such a memorial can be erected at a cost of some three to four thousand dollars many of his friends would not approve and neither would he if he could express himself of anything that would require any large expenditure of money while so many thousands of worthy men and women are struggling in vain to secure the bare necessities of life these holding that costly monuments can do the dead no good and are in bad taste in the living there can be no doubt that thousands in the years to come will seek his grave to lay their offerings upon the shrine of genius and while his will be marked i wish to say in this connection to those asking in what condition mrs bran is left financially that while she will have sufficient to keep the wolf from hers and her children's door if properly managed that she will not have over a tithe of what it has been published that she would submitting these few words for the consideration of his friends i can say if a response sufficiently favorable come then the proper steps will be taken to carry it out if not nothing more will be said at least not from me and as his friend i would not approve of keeping standing in the iconoclast a list of subscribers to the fund if the suggestion is carried out it will be time enough to publish it when the work is finished and the statue unveiled g b gerald the man who takes up brand's work will only succeed not replace him he was a star of the first magnitude and such bodies are not created in an hour not always in an age he who attempts an imitation however clever his work would stand before the world self-confessed a failure from the first booth and his favorite character inspired us joe jefferson could only prompt us to laughter yet is not jefferson without genius in his way there is no reason however why he who follows may not be as loyal to the faith as courageous in the fight as bran was known and acknowledged to be the chief is dead but did not die until he had blazoned the way for those who dare follow where he so bravely led in life bran often said he wanted no mourning worn for him save that which enshrouded the hearts of his family and friends that the mere trappings of woe were but its limbs and outward flourishes which too often failed to reach the heart 
and now a poem speaking of bran by william marion reedy published in the st louis mirror died fighting april second eighteen ninety eight rare now is all his thundering he has fallen on stillness in the spring and even echo answers not in that dim land where all things are forgot his surging sentences his cadenced chimes of speech that through the seven climes wooed the many to rapt listening soothed by the wind of the dead men's feet he lies in slumber senseless sweet his fame his wife's and children's tears the issue that made up his manly years his hates and loves the burgeoning earth receives and list a little noiseless noise among the leaves of southern springtime pity does entreat a fighter's faults were his but strong the blows he struck at throned wrong beauty he loved as ever loved the brave the april air breathes beauty o'er his grave truth he pursued lo he has found her now she kisses the kiss of peace upon his brow his ears are filled with silence's sweet song fighting he died marched into the night his banner blazing with his bravery's light shot from behind the story goes to glorify him and to damn his foes the foes he fought were cowardice and fraud they have prevailed again but o oh lord god thou wilt raise up still others for thy fight rejoicing loud is in the house of sham bigots to themselves make deep salam shoddydom rubs its ringed hands in glee the ogre's scandal scourged at each pink tea peck sniffs pray that he has gone to swell the galaxy of bravery and the brains in hell great joy and small souls all not worth a damn but where men think feel as men can bon voyage through the dark good man they call and take up his pen lance and brandish it again against ignorance in power fortified with the myriad lies and every great heart fine soul cries as pledge of fealty here's to you bran what though he hear no rumour of our hail what though we follow searching for that grail a bettered world with less of woe and pain and better gods than privilege and gain out in the darkness by assassins sped tis better far to join defeated dead than share success with him whose soul's for sale thirdly we have an essay by george l hutchin published in the bloomington eye death of w c bran what a sable pall was flung over the spirits of countless thousands who heard last week that editor w c bran of the iconoclast was no more the heavens seem hung in black and the clouds are wrung of their stars wrote a saint paul friend who idolized the apostolic seer the world is dark with excess of grief for the immortal soul of an illimitable genius has been sent to its maker and scattered with the stardust of the Idorinian william c bran was an apostle like christ like lincoln and others whom we deify he was misunderstood and reviled and a cowardly bullet pierced him in the back a martyrdom of which he had a premonition the head and front of his offending was strict adherence to the truth though the heavens fall he knew no fear but was never an aggressor the lamented bran was an educator and an emancipator of human liberty and human thought the hypocrite stood in awe of his judgment when he indicted him to be arraigned before the great bar of public opinion he dipped his pen in acid that seared the eyeballs and wrote their sentence diluted with wormwood and gall it is not small wonder that the judas iscariots and the lemurs trembled at his power bran's tragic exit from this vale of tears is inspiration now for jackals to attack his name luke the dull dull as they are not afraid to kick the dead lion while their ears wave to the seventh heaven of delight in earth life they feared his name but like ghouls they now go down into the grave to besmirch his memory and this too from those who profess to follow the teachings of the meek and lowly nazarene strange as it may seem to the hypocrite bran was a religious man his creed was the religion of humanity his biographers if they do him justice will write his name with the blood of the lamb high up on the flying scroll 
brown's friends and they are legion should not repine if he is not canonized as his bones are hearsed in death for quote, whenever was a god found agreeable to everybody the regular way is to lynch as the Baylorites did to hang to kill to crucify and excoriate and trample them under their stupid hooves cloven or webbed as the case may be for a century or two and then take to braying over them when you discover their divine origin still in a very long-eared manner End quote. so speaks the sarcastic man in his wild way very mournful truths Bran was as the life-tree, Yggdrasil, wide-waving and many-toned, with fimbriated tendrils down deep in the death kingdoms, among the oldest dead dust of men, and with boughs reaching always beyond the stars, and ever changeless as the immutable empyrean of eternal hope. They could better spare the whole state of Texas than William C. Bran, while the galled jades winced beneath the scorpion whips of his satire and would have preferred fireballs they felt the potency of his dynamics and scurried to the soldier works of the masters for a glint of mental pablum they had never known before the editor of the sunday eye is in receipt of many letters from admirers of the late lamented genius they are rich in anathema and maranatha of brand's heartless and cruel detractors with one accord they have expressed the wish that i excoriate the revilers who desecrated by bludgeon words the sacrosanct acre of god in which reposes the mortal tenement of the sacred scribe i do not believe as mr charles campbell of anchor does that they should be gibbeted high as hammond nor do i think as mr c e stewart of miniere does that they should be lashed naked through the world and lambasted till death ends the heart-throbs i believe that they should be permitted to live until they have read the great genius and learned to understand and exalt him it would make them better for it religion would not suffer by it though baylor sank a thousand leagues beneath the seven-hued regions of tartacus the iconoclast minced no words when it dealt body blows they landed in the brisket and affected the solar plexus in a very apprehensive way lincoln was gentle and generous ingersoll was brilliant and broad but bran was all this and greater his untimely death was a distinctive loss to the march of civilization and a gain to the shams of hypocrisy which takes now a new grip on the english language to batter down the shackles bran had welded about them with public opinion bran was a reformer who meant reform he wore his heart upon his sleeve but would be cruel to be just he endured mental anguish great as was suffered in the garden of gethsemane as the sweetest perfume exhales from a crushed blooming rose so the sweeter and nobler sentiments welled up from the perennial spring of his fountains of love when most bruised and racked with pain i have no fear of his acceptance on the right hand up there where men are judged by their deeds and not by semblance of better things that a canting world may simulate he is in valhalla with the other battling heroes where the alabaster boxes of eternal love are showered upon the halo of their brighter radiance bran wrote to catch the wide world's attention that he might teach them gentler things than feculent shocks he was essentially an ascetic devoted to uplifting in his own sure way all the classes came trippingly to his and all the dogmas all the pearliest of sociology and political economy were as an open book to him when he soared to the sun he never dropped into the sea from icarian wings his iconoclasm was the decadence of the social cesspool and the expurgation of money power which he believed was the ne plus ultra of anarchy and the genius of diabolical perfidy he preached as he felt tender and terrible loving and vehement a strange commingling of titanic vulgate and cooing peace bran was eccentric but all genius must have a certain leeway without being dubbed a quixotic he was a man whose loftiest ideality was purity in womanhood he adored children and was in many respects childlike he was as quote, the long light that shakes across the lake 
where the cataract leaps in its glory. End quote. Friend Bran, through blinding mist of sympathetic tears, I say adieu. This ends section 13. Chapter 14 of the Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones. The Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Chapter 14. A Pen Picture of Bran. It is hard for me to realize that Bran is dead. It seems only yesterday night that he sat opposite me at table and talked of his plans and projects and spoke so hopefully, so boyishly, of the future that he was never to realize. For a long time I had a curiosity to see Bran of the iconoclast, his pyrotechnic vocabulary, his strange admixture of erudition and slang, his almost womanly sympathy, and the more than Apache ferocity with which he pursued his enemies, the tender and poetic metaphor that gemmed his iron prose, and the singular blending of optimism and pessimism that characterized most of his work, suggested an anomaly that appealed to the imagination, and I was anxious to see what Bran looked like. I had an opportunity when he came here to lecture. I knew his business manager, Mr. Ward, who figured in the dreadful duel in which he lost his life and who was at that time arranging his lecture dates. Ward is a big Texan, over six feet high, and I suppose he weighs all of two hundred pounds. He is a lawyer who drifted into journalism years ago, and under a somewhat rough-and-ready exterior there is not much trouble in finding the gentleman and the scholar. Well, Ward introduced me to Bran, and after a while the three of us foregathered in a private room of a downtown cafe and stayed there for several hours that I remember with unmixed delight. Looking back at the episode, I have difficulty in framing my impressions of the famous Texan editor. I think the principal thing that struck me was his lack of pose and affection. All through his talk, and he was in high spirits and talked a great deal, there were sparks of delightful naivete. Quote, I want to pull out of the iconoclast as much as I can, he said, and since we have made enough money to do so, I have bought a great many outside contributions. My idea, he continued, is this. As long as I wrote most everything in the publication myself, it was strictly a one-man paper, and if anything should have happened to me, it would have been worth nothing to my wife and family. What I am trying to do now is to organize a core of contributors who can keep it up if I should be taken away. Close quote. Had he any suspicion of the prophecy that lurked in these words? Perhaps he had, for when I suggested to him the advisability of leaving Waco, with its petty local dissensions and the personal dangers incident to them, he shook his head. I got together eleven thousand dollars not long ago, he said, and put it into a house. It is the first money worth talking about that I ever had, and I feel that the investment ties me, more or less, to Waco. But aside from that, he went on to say, I am a little afraid that the iconoclast would lose its characteristic flavor if I moved it to one of the big eastern cities. You will remember that that experiment was tried with the Arkansas Traveler, which was moved from Little Rock to Chicago and promptly fell flat. The same thing happened to the Texas siftings when it was taken from Austin to New York. I am inclined to believe that a publication acquires a savor of the soil in which it springs, and it is a mighty risky business to try to transplant it. Close quote. 
He told me of Colonel Gerald, who had killed the Harris brothers only a few weeks before. Quote, Gerald is a wonderful old man, he said. He is over sixty, but he is as straight as a pine. He has a light mustache and chin beard, and eyes the color of the blue you see in old China. He doesn't know what fear he is. He thinks it is some kind of a disease like smallpox or appendicitis, and only know that he has never had it. Close quote. Between talk we ate oysters and drank a little beer. Brand impressed me as being a very temperate man. The conversation drifted frequently to his plans for the future. I've been roasted a good deal for the go-as-you-please style of the iconoclast, he said, and between ourselves I wish I could have refined its style a trifle. But if I had done so we would never have gone over the one hundred thousand mark as we did last week. However, I'm tired of it, he said slowly, most infernally tired. I am anxious next year to devote myself to a higher class of work. I have a novel about half done, and also a play, and I am very hopeful that they may both succeed. It was long after midnight when we parted. He said that he expected to be back one of these days. Poor Bran! It sickens one's soul to think of the value of such a life as his as against that of his slayer. Good God! His little finger was worth all the Texas pothouse politicians and Baylor University Pharisees that could be lined up between us and Orion. Signed O. H. S. In the Looking Glass End of Chapter 14、Section、fifteen of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume Twelve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. The Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast, Volume 12. Section 15. Death of W. C. Bran. What a sable pall was flung over the spirits of countless thousands who heard last week. That editor W. C. Bran of the Iconoclast was no more. The heavens seem hung in black, and the clouds are wrung of their stars, wrote a St. Paul friend who idolized the apostolic seer. The world is dark with excess of grief, for the immortal soul of an illimitable genius has been sent to its maker and scattered with the star dust of the Idaranian. William C. Bran was an apostle. Like Christ, Like Lincoln and others whom we deify, he was misunderstood and reviled, and a cowardly bullet pierced him in the back, a martyrdom of which he had a premonition. The head and front of his offending was strict adherence to the truth, though the heavens fall. He knew no fear, but was never the aggressor. The lamented Bran was an educator, and an emancipator of human liberty and human thought. The hypocrite stood in awe of his judgment. When he indicted him to be arraigned before the great bar of public opinion, he dipped his pen in acid that seared the eyeballs, and wrote their sentence diluted with wormwood and gall. It is not small wonder that the Judas Iscariots and the lemurs trembled at his power. Brand's tragic exit from this vale of tears is inspiration now for jackals to attack his name. Like the dull, dull ass, they are not afraid to kick the dead lion, while their ears wave to the seventh heaven of delight. In earth life, they feared his name, but like ghouls, they now go down into the grave to besmirch his memory. And this, too, from those who profess to follow the teachings of the meek and lowly Nazarene. Strange as it may seem to the hypocrite, Bran was a religious man. His creed was the religion of humanity. His biographers, if they do him justice, will write his name with the blood of the lamb high up on the flying scroll. Brand's friends, and they are legion, should not repine if he is not canonized as his bones are hearsed in death, for whenever was a god found agreeable to everybody. 
the regular way is to lynch, as the Baylorites did, to hang, to kill, to crucify and excoriate, and trample them under their stupid hoofs, cloven or webbed, as the case may be, for a century or two, and then take to braying over them when you discover their divine origin, still in a very long-eared manner. So speaks the sarcastic man, in his wild way, very mournful truths. Bran was as the life-tree, Yggdrasil, wide-waving and many-toned, with fimbriated tendrils down deep in the death kingdoms, among the oldest dead dust of men, and with boughs reaching always beyond the stars, and ever changeless as the immutable empyrean of eternal hope. They could better spare the whole state of Texas than William C. Bran while the galled jades winced beneath the scorpion whips of his satire, and would have preferred fireballs, they felt the potency of his dynamics, and scurried to the soldier works of the masters for a glint of mental pabulum they had never known before. The editor of the Sunday Eye is in receipt of many letters from admirers of the late lamented genius. They are rich in anathema, and maranatha of Brand's heartless and cruel detractors. With one accord they have expressed the wish that I excoriate the revilers who desecrated by bludgeon words the sacrosanct acre of God, in which reposes the mortal tenement of the sacred scribe. I do not believe, as Mr. Charles Campbell of Anchor does, that they should be gibbeted high as Haman. Nor do I think, as Mr. C. E. Stewart of Minier does, that they should be lashed naked through the world and lambasted till death ends the heart throbs. I believe that they should be permitted to live until they have read the great genius and learned to understand and exalt him. It would make them better for it. Religion would not suffer by it, though Baylor sank a thousand leagues beneath the seven-hued regions of Tartarus. The iconoclast minced no words. When it dealt body blows, they landed in the brisket and affected the solar plexus in a very apprehensive way. Lincoln was gentle and generous. Ingersoll was brilliant and broad, but Bran was all this and greater. His untimely death was a distinctive loss to the march of civilization, and a gain to the shams of hypocrisy which takes now a new grip on the English language to batter down the shackles Bran had welted about them with public opinion. Bran was a reformer who meant reform. He wore his heart upon his sleeve, but would be cruel to be just. He endured mental anguish, great as was suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. As the sweetest perfume exhales from a crushed, blooming rose, so the sweeter and nobler sentiments welled up from the perennial spring of his fountains of love when most bruised and racked with pain. I have no fear of his acceptance on the right hand up there where men are judged by their deeds and not by semblance of better things that a canting world may simulate. He is in Valhalla with the other battling heroes, where the alabaster boxes of eternal love are showered upon the halo of their brighter radiance. Bran wrote to catch the wide world's attention, that he might teach them gentler things than feculent shocks. He was essentially an ascetic, devoted to uplifting in his own sure way. All the classes came trippingly to his and all the dogmas. All the purlieus of sociology and political economy were as an open book to him. When he soared to the sun, he never dropped into the sea from Icarian wings. His iconoclasm was the decadence of the social cesspool, and the expurgation of money power, which he believed was the Naples ultra of anarchy and the genius of diabolic perfidy. He preached as he felt, tender and terrible, loving and vehement, a strange commingling of titanic vulgate and cooing peace. Bran was eccentric, but all genius must have a certain leeway without being dubbed quixotic. He was a man whose loftiest ideality was purity in womanhood. He adored children, and was in many respects childlike. He was as the long light that shakes across the lake, where the cataract leaps in its glory. Friend Bran, through blinding mist of sympathetic tears, I say adieu. George L. Hutchin in the Bloomington Eye End of section 15. Recording by Brian Keenan.
Chapter 16 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. Chapter 16 Semper Vivat in Memoriam now that partisan hate has succeeded in hounding to his death america's most eloquent champion of humanity has driven to the verge of insanity and adoring wife and thrown o'er the roseate lives of two tender clinging children the black pall of a sorrow that will forever embitter their hearts perchance it will pause will remember the teachings of that other friend of humanity who nearly nineteen hundred years ago was crucified for daring to fight what he believed to be wrong, whose religion may be summed up in one word, forgiveness. Brand's enemies were professed followers of this Christ. With tearful eyes and uplifted, supplicating faces, they besought the God of justice to, in the beautiful language of the prayer left to us by his Son, lead us not into temptation and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and the next day passed resolutions congratulating a mob of brutal ruffians for frightening a sick woman nearly to death kidnapping her defenceless husband and forcing him under threats of instant death to retract what they knew to be the truth a few weeks later they were resoluting and sympathizing and formulating plans for the erection of a monument to the memory of two would-be assassins who were killed while attempting to carry out their cowardly work o christianity that thy cloak pure as polar snow must cover such infamy brand's death blossed from the firmament of american journalism its brightest star he was an intellectual titan in him was embodied the philosophy of carlyle the brilliancy of voltaire the withering sarcasm of desmoulins the poetry of ingersoll his genius universal as that of shakespeare was ever aligned on the side of the weak and oppressed ever with godlike fearlessness he stood for right against might for purity against corruption in church in state in society he tore the painted mask from the face of hypocrisy and exposed it in all its festering hideousness to the world's ridicule bran has been damned as an atheist by people who have never read and are incapable of reading and understanding a single paragraph from his pen the author of tien's tafwa charity man's immortality was not an atheist he refused to bend the knee to superstition to lend a patient ear to earth's self-constituted vice-regents of omniscience but god spoke to him through nature the flowers he so passionately loved were reminders of his loving tenderness in the divine music of wagner liszt and chopin he recognized the voice of god his faith was broad as the universe deep as infinity he loved purity he hated hypocrisy and for this he died a martyr inspiration comes from god the children of a genius needs must be the favorites of omniscience yet theologians vilify bran from the pulpit teachers denounce him to their pupils for nearly ten years he has been the target of vindictive spite, such spite as only a narrow bigoted mind can be capable of. This is the greatest compliment mediocrity can pay to genius. Bran is dead. Still forever is the pen whose wondrous alchemy transposed the English language, with all its inherent harshness, into music as sweet as song of Israel, stilled is the heart that stood alone, defiant, a bulwark 
against the wave of corruption that is engulfing our land. Bran is dead. But when Baylor University has sunk beneath the wave of oblivion, when the very bones of the splenetic-hearted hypocrites who goaded to his death the grandest man America has ever produced, have crumbled into the tongueless silence of the dreamless dust, Brand's name will live, a beacon light for those who love truth for truth's sake. Bran is dead. The blow that wrung our hearts with unavailing anguish but ushered him into the company of Shakespeare, Carlyle, Hugo, and Wagner, and there, whether it be in the light that beats on God's great throne, or in the Serbonian darkness of a hell more terrible than that pictured by Dante, is the true heaven. Signed, Abbot Graphic End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume Twelve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume Twelve, Chapter Seventeen, Brand's Brave Battle. With humble soul and heavy heart, we take up our pen to chronicle the death, yea, the murder, of one of the brightest and purest noblemen that God ever created, W. C. Bran. A few years ago, he, W. H. Ward, and the writer each occupied desks side by side in the editorial rooms of the Waco Morning News. There budded a friendship between that trio that we full believe shall blossom into ripe fraternal love on a shore as yet unknown to Mr. Ward and the writer. Mr. Bran was editor of the Iconoclast, and as its name indicates, it is a smasher of idols from Tadmor in the wilderness to the mountains of Hepsidon. Scorning the sensual, always against the vulgar, in much the same manner as Carlyle, Bren stuck the gaffles of deep truth into the sides of wrong in high places, and exposed rottenness wherever found. With rugged English twisted into sentences more cutting than whips of scorpions' tails, he stood up and fought for right as opposed to might. He tore off the plaster of moral cancerous ulcers, now so prolific on the body politic of the world, and held high the treachery, the bigotry, the superstition, and damnably dirty doings of a generation that accepts hidebound dogmas for the ultima thule of reasoning and truth. Precept for right, and in reality worships at the shrine of exploded fables and crowns by its own acts, the parrot as its preceptor lives and dies having no desire to do anything that somebody has not done before. Is it any wonder that such a man as W. C. Brand should fall a victim to such a populace? He was hounded to his death, mobbed, spat upon, shot, and murdered by several thousand pin-headed obstreperous patrons and followers of little Pee-wee College that turns young ladies out in Siente almost yearly, and hires its professors for less salaries than a railroad brakeman gets. Brand's good work will live. His fame will survive, and an intellectual race will yet rise up and bless his name when the lying epitaphs of the assassin sent to the death by him shall have crumbled to earth ten thousand years. We cannot close this faint tribute of respect to our dead friend without acknowledging the worth of such true men as Mr. W. H. Ward and Judge G. B. Gerald, both of whom are able, brave, high-toned gentlemen, and both of whom came near dying, and both were willing to die, 
or see that Mr. Brand got a fair play while he lived. Signed, S. M. Scruggs, in the Tribune. End of chapter 17 Section 18 of The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. Section 18. Bran is no more. On the 1st of April, All Fool's Day, W.C. Bran of the Iconoclast and T.M. Davis riddled each other with bullets in Waco, Texas. Both of them died the following day. The trouble between them grew out of the attack made by Bran in his paper on the Baylor University, a Baptist institution attended by the daughter of Davis. At the time that Bran accused the students of the college of immorality, he was assaulted by them and barely escaped lynching at their hands. He was forced to make a retraction and was ordered to leave town. Being a courageous man, Bran refused to emigrate. The Irish Standard chronicles the untimely and awful death of Mr. Bran with poignant regret and tenders its condolence to his afflicted family. In many ways he won the admiration of the American people. He was a man of great mental endowments, and in the use of invective, often degenerating into Billingsgate, he stood without a rival in American journalism. His mind was broad, and he despised religious intolerance. As an American, he loved the Stars and Stripes and was opposed to an Anglo-American alliance. He held hypocrites in supreme contempt and lashed the Pharisees unmercifully. When Catholic priests and sisters were misrepresented by sectarian bigots, he used his tongue and pen in their defense. So ably did he vindicate the Catholic Church from their aspersions that many supposed him to be a Jesuit in disguise. In the last issue of the Iconoclast, he told a correspondent what he thought of Mrs. Shepherd and ex-priest Shinnequay. Had Bran lived in a more civilized community than among the bigoted Baptists of Texas, he would have used more elegant language in his magazine than it contained for the past few months. We entirely disagree with the pioneer press in its characterization of the deceased journalist when it says, From attacking the private lives of the prominent and successful men of every quarter of the Union, and levying blackmail as the price of silence from those whose slips or frailties his keen hyena-like appetite for filth had enabled him to scent. It was an easy step to the most scurrilous assaults on men and women, whose only offending lay in their uprightness and virtue. Bran never attacked men and women for their uprightness and virtue, and our St. Paul contemporary is guilty of calumny when it says so. Every evildoer and hypocrite feared him while upright men and virtuous women had a champion in him. His bitterest enemies never accused him of being a blackmailer, and the editor of the Pioneer Press took care he was dead before he made the unwarrantable charge. The Irish Standard End of Section 18Section 19 of The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12, by William Cowper Bran. Section 19. Brave and Brainy Bran. 
The killing of W. C. Bran in a duel at Waco, Texas, a few days ago, is but a repetition of the punishment that generally falls to newspaper men who persistently print the truth. Bran was an intellectual giant. The rarest accomplishments possible for a human mind to acquire were not too intricate for him to master. His versatility was as boundless as his originality was unique. Absolutely fearless and utterly indifferent regarding his personal safety, he dared to expose the charlatan and the trickster in whatever walk of life he chanced to meet him. Endowed with a mind that was only circumscribed by the infinite itself and fortified with a thorough classical education, he held the hypocrite up to contempt and public scorn and deservedly lashed him with the lash of sarcasm. True, some of our erudite members of the press have presumed to pass judgment upon him. Men as incapable of rendering a just criticism of his talents as they have found it impossible to rise to his standard of excellence. One who is especially in love with himself has said that had Bran been less soulless, he might have been an ornament to his trade. Trade! When men attain Bran's intellectual standing, and they are as rare as the intellectual sloven is numerous, the trade evolves into a profession. It is indeed disheartening to see one devote his life and his talents to truth and justice, only to be belittled after death by those whose poverty-stricken understandings render them incapable of half-appreciating the man's genius, to say nothing of his nobility of purpose in endeavoring to elevate mankind. He has been accused of blasphemy by another, who has probably been as startled by Brand's truthful declarations as he himself would have been had he at some time dared to commit such a rash act. Despite these intellectual peewees, Brand's writings will live long after the surf of eternity has carried the penny aligners out upon the sea of oblivion. In the tragic death of W. C. Bran, the world has lost the most versatile pen the century has produced, and it is with sincere grief that we chronicle his sudden taking away. The Gilroy, California Telegram End of Section 19Section 20 of the Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Complete Works of Bran, The Iconoclast, Volume 12. Section 20. W. C. Bran, the fearless editor of the Iconoclast, is no more. The Iconoclast is published at Waco, Texas, and was started but a few years ago by its gifted author with no more capital than his genius and the courage of his convictions. The Iconoclast assailed every form of avarice, hypocrisy, and infamy. In a few months the publication gained a worldwide reputation and amassed for its editor a handsome fortune, because it was bought and read by thousands of people who loved truth, when boldly proclaimed for truth's sake. Some time ago the iconoclast laid bare the iniquities of some white sepulchral hypocrites, having charge of a young lady's seminary under the auspices of a religious denomination. The pious and lecherous scoundrels, and their ilk, who felt aggrieved by the publication of the sensational facts, instead of resorting to the law and proving that they had been libeled and vindicating themselves by the imprisonment of Bran, resorted to mob violence, and what they lacked in courage they supplied with numbers and beat their helpless victim into insensibility. In the very next issue of the Iconoclast, Bran, its outraged but incomparably fearless editor, in speaking of his cowardly assailants, 
used the following defiant and sadly prophetic words truth to tell there's not one of the whole cowardly tribe who's worth a charge of buckshot who deserved so much honor as being sent to hell by a white man's hand if socrates was poisoned and christ was crucified for telling unpalatable truths to the splenetic-hearted hypocrites of their time it would ill become me to complain of martyrdom for a like offense Rand was shot in the back by a drunken local politician who doubtless had as much conception of morality and honor as did those whom Bran had assailed openly and above board in the iconoclast. Bran, though mortally wounded, turned and shot his assassin, wounding him fatally. Bran and his assassin have both died, one mourned as a martyr in the cause of truth, the other mourned by the splenetic-hearted hypocrites of Waco and elsewhere. Charleston Enterprise End of section 20. Recording by John Brandon. Section 21 of the Complete Works of Brand, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 21. Poor Brand has fallen a martyr to Baptist bigotry. The foul minded crowd who imported slattery to Waco ran a university whose iniquities Brand exposed. The deacons of the church and the preachers combined against him and his life was attacked again and again because he was not afraid of telling the truth the last attempt was successful and his blood is on the head of the bigots of waco we have not read in any of our american dailies nor have we seen in any of our evangelical weeklies a condemnation of this outrage on free speech if the conditions had been reversed if a catholic had shot down the defamer of catholic women the country would have rung with denunciations of catholic bigotry but the baptist beetle browed can for months plan the death of a man who has exposed their hypocrisy and the assassination is taken as one of the few occurrences which diversify life in those monotonous texas towns brand was not a catholic in the eyes of the majority baptists of waco he was an infidel he had no sympathy with any creed as a creed but as far as we can judge he loved truth and justice and hated wrong and hypocrisy it was this natural feeling for right and fair play which led him into the battle with the apa the battle in which he perished we believe that he acted according to his lights and to those who live by the law as it is shown to them god will not deny grace many a man and woman who never saw bran and do not sympathize with the extreme views he held on certain religious matters and might perhaps take exception to his style of conveying his opinions will yet because of his manly defense of ladies slandered without cause by the vilest of the vile breathe a silent prayer that god may have mercy on his soul as long as ye did it unto these you did it unto me even a cup of cold water shall not lose its reward the monitor san francisco california end of section twenty one recording by john brandon Section 22 of the Complete Works of Brand, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Complete Works of Brand, the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 22. The editorial supervision of the May iconoclast has been to me a labor of love. The stress of circumstances under which the work has been done, 
is too well known for either explanation or apology for its shortcomings this issue of the paper is intended as a memorial of the man who founded it whose genius has so long adorned its pages and whose personality has endeared it to so many thousands of readers throughout the land w h ward in the vicksburg dispatch of sunday february thirteenth appeared an article from the pen of ida clyde gallagher of vicksburg a very bright and gifted writer in which she pays a feeling tribute to the character of w c bran the article in question has been widely read and copied it was written while mr bran was on his sunday lecture tour and is particularly appropriate to this issue of the iconoclast i therefore reproduce it with pleasure the development of all really great forces afford an interesting study for the mind capable of grasping and measuring them the overflow of a river the eruption of a volcano or the devastation of a storm arouse admiration even while they inspire terror and awaken awe but it is the purely human force with its infinite variety which charms while it enthralls a man born and reared as other men bound by the same ties subject to the same laws fettered by the same conventionalities to throw off the yoke of circumstances break through the trammels of the conventional grapple with and overcome every obstacle that lies in his path until he reaches the summit of olympus and bodily fronts the gods or towers among men like saul above his brethren we may envy him as we ever envy the truly great or be disposed to close his lips in death because he tells us unpalatable truths yet admire him secretly and in our hearts exalt him we may not confess as much while he lives and labors but when his lips are dumb in death his breast pulseless we lay our hatred and envy in the dust at his feet and rear in marble a gleaming shaft to commemorate the virtues of the dead the name of bran has inspired this homily bran of the iconoclast the man whose praises are being sung loved by half the world by the other half condemned whose whole life has been a battle and a march who wars as did the titans as if he gropes blindly at times ever struggles toward the light this is the man who began his education while rearing a family and went from behind the smokestack of a locomotive to the tripod of a daily paper who in a few years has risen to dizzy heights of fame whose utterances are waited for and attended by more than half a million people many of whom he does not and cannot convert but all of whom he impresses a man who is said to be an ideal husband and father a tender loyal and devoted friend yet whose entire existence is devoted to the warfare against existing evils bitter as death and uncompromising as the grave you may not always be right mr bran indeed we shrewdly suspect you are not but we respect you and admire you just the same because you attack boldly and fight fearlessly yes we admire you and shall not wait to whisper it to your tombstone either if the futility of brute force as an appeal to reason required an object lesson it might easily be found in the fact that while the hand that wielded one pen lies motionless in death hundreds of others have been raised up to fight under the same banner several months ago a number of the students of the baylor university acting without regard for the laws of either god or man attempted to mob the editor of the iconoclast in an effort to bridle his pen the hand which they sought to restrain has now been enjoined by a court whose order is irrevocable in every state in the union men have come forward to take up a fight which bran himself considered ended and the object is accomplished in reproducing tributes to the memory of the dead editor i have felt it my duty in several instances to blue pencil certain passages which might have been considered as reflecting upon those 
who are innocent and unoffending the moral here needs no pointing to his readers and admirers who have uniformly expressed regret over the death of her husband mrs w c bran desires to return a woman's thanks for the kindly sympathy extended end of section twenty two recording by john brandon section twenty three of the complete works of brand the iconoclast volume twelve this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by brian keenan the complete works of brand the iconoclast volume twelve section twenty three simple statement of facts by w h ward concerning the tragedy of april one in which w c brand lost his life and i myself was slightly wounded as a sensational event enough and more than enough has already been said in the daily press i should not have mentioned the matter here at all but i know the readers of the iconoclast will expect a statement of the facts i therefore give a subjoined account of the affair from the independent pulpit published in waco by j d shaw mr shaw is well known to the people of texas there is not a man in the state who will doubt that his account of the tragedy is in absolute accord with truth and justice in the extract referred to mr shaw says let the plain truth be told the lateness of this pulpit affords me an opportunity to correct some false impressions with regard to the recent tragedy in which w c bran lost his life that there should have been some errors of view among bystanders as to the various incidents in that deadly conflict is not surprising and of these trifling in their nature i will not here write the idea that bran was seeking a difficulty with davis is certainly false he had made his arrangements to go on a lecturing tour had spent the day at his home went to town about four o'clock that afternoon to get a shave and on his return walked with his business manager mr w h ward by the office in which davis was sitting having passed the office a few steps davis stepped out and shot him in the back this was the shot that killed him and it was after receiving it that he turned drew his revolver and opened fire upon his assailant now as to mr ward he left brand's house some time after brand did had joined the latter a few minutes before the firing and was at the time walking by his side when davis fired ward jumped at him in an attempt to get his davis's pistol caught hold of it over the muzzle and was shot through the hand ward was unarmed having left his revolver in a grip at mr brand's house his hands were gloved and he had no idea of a difficulty at the time I state these facts not through any feeling of prejudice, having never been mixed up in the bran Baylor trouble, but solely in the interest of the truth. I can understand how an excited observer, seeing Mr. Ward extend his hand to get Davis's pistol, and seeing immediately the fire of the same, might have thought that Ward did the shooting, and it was this mistake that caused his arrest. Independent Pulpit to this i will only add that neither mr bran nor myself were in the slightest anticipation of trouble he left home having the boy to drive him down in his buggy shortly before four o'clock on the afternoon of the tragedy i awaited his return to drive to the train to meet my brother whom i was expecting with a party of friends that evening at twenty minutes to six o'clock he had not returned and i took the first car down as several ladies who chanced to be at mr brand's home will testify i left the car at fourth and austin streets at about six o'clock walked to hertz brothers gave an order for some books and met mr john garin walked with him toward the depot met mr bran at the corner of fourth street and banker's alley chatted with him for a moment when mr garin walked on and mr bran and myself crossed the street and walked towards austin avenue we had passed the place where i afterwards learned davis's office was located about ten paces when davis came out and opened fire from the rear his opening fire was the first warning of the trouble we were walking side by side conversing together 
when the first shot was fired. That shot entered Mr. Brand's back and caused his death. I will add that I was unarmed and had not removed my driving gloves, which were taken off when my wound was dressed, and had been with Mr. Brand not more than three minutes when the shooting occurred. These are the facts, as substantiated by the signed statement of over a score of eyewitnesses, the same now being in the hands of my attorneys, Messrs. Baker and Ross, and C. R. Sparks. I do not wish to speak ill of the dead, therefore I shall have but little to say of Mr. Davis. My acquaintance with him was brief. I never met him but once, when he was shooting another man in the back. End of section 23. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 24 of The Complete Works of Braun, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Complete Works of Braun, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. Section 24. Reference has been made by Judge Gerald to the pathetic tragedy in Braun's life because of the loss of his daughter. The burden of sorrow which he bore is beautifully revealed in the following account of that tragedy, which was written by Braun. The Last Lesson Is there no stoning save with flint and rock? Yes, as the dead we weep for testify. No desolation but by sword and fire? Yes, as your moanings witness, and myself am lonelier, darker, earthlier for my loss poor in gold and goods yet richer than fancy ever fabled in home and happiness the young father toiled and hoarded his scant wage the little mother denied herself a thousand things that women covet and they said it is for her our inez our fairy queen her feet shall find no thorns in life's path a father's strength a mother's love shall fill it with sweetest flowers beautiful to their eyes and other eyes was she as grecian sculptors dream and still more beautiful when childhood's early years flashed by and the bud was bursting into womanhood's glorious bloom no crowned empress so imperial seemed yet pride so womanly and softened by such grace that each and all yielded sweet allegiance to her sway. And they would sit and watch her at her books or play, drinking with greedy ear her admiring teacher's oft-told tale of triumphs won in classroom or on the green, and watched her comrades, loving subjects they, weave crowns of flowers for her fair brow and hail her queen. And so the days went by, toilsome yet happy days until when scarce passed to her teens the youthful swains began to sigh for her and bashful cast their tribute of flowers such as they knew she loved into the open door then blushingly retreat fearing cold comfort from her imperious eyes and one there was of her own age who seemed to haunt the street until the mother noticed it and said daughter what does he ever near the house and the father fretted and spoke harshly of the boy and sharply to his child saying you do encourage the little fool to haunt the place speak to him no more and the daughter made reply father i never spoke to him nor he to me and she arose and taking her music roll went forth and the boy followed her our daughter deceives us cried the father fierce with rage and he followed the twain you have deceived me daughter his voice was sharp and quailing before his wrath as though it were a blow she gasped oh father and returned with him in silence to their home and the little mother fretted and lectured her but she sat silent brooding upon the great wrong 
and the queenly eyes were full of tears that seemed frozen by her pride and could not fall they never fell the gust of anger from the doting father's lips the breath of doubt of her dear word and her little heart seemed broken quite the world seemed desolate the father's good-night kiss the mother's tender solicitude were in vain the wound was too deep to heal and while they slept and dreamed sweet dreams of her fair future she poured her heart out to the good god who never doubted her and leaving a little note that was a wailing cry of hopeless pain passed by her own fair hand to the great beyond and the father kissed the dead lips of his first-born and knew that he had killed her and ever in his heart there is a cry i killed her and night and day that cold sweet face doth haunt him and day and night he hears that piteous cry wrung from his child when he broke her heart oh father and ever the little mother's lamentation goes up to heaven our house is left unto us desolate End of section 24. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 25 of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 25, Salmagundi. There's a class of men who take especial delight in pistol practice, when the other fellow furnishes the target. They shut their eyes and literally feel what is going on, see pistols flashing, as the man with the well-developed Texas jag sees keyholes in the door at three o'clock g.m., just legions of them. As a matter of fact, when pistols are really cracking, powder actually burning, and bullets sweetly singing near my God to thee, these are the first to seek the sheltering arms of a two-foot wall. Most any old wall, so it won't leak lead. I wish to call attention to the readers of the iconoclast, to the pack of journalistic jackals who are raising their infamous howl over the body of Bran. As usual, when the lion is dead, the hyena comes forth for a feast. Life is too short, and the game too mean, to justify individual firing, so I will take a pot shot at the pock. These animals are so much alike in tastes, character, and habits, that one will typify all. I therefore call attention to Major Burbanks of the New Orleans Picayune. The state constitutional convention has eliminated the Negro from Louisiana politics. Had that body also placed journalism under the color ban, they would have disposed of the Major most effectively, and, I might add, to the entire satisfaction of all concerned, unless, indeed, the Coons had objected to their company. So help me God, I would rather be a yellow dog, with an abbreviated narrative, and belong to a disreputable Negro than go around with my cowardly heart in my throat, fearing to look a man in the face while alive, then mercilessly assail his character after death. Bah! The mere existence of such creatures revolutionizes Darwin's theory, argues the survival of the unfittest. It is well for the public to understand that the murder of W. C. Brand did not remove all of the abuses from which this country suffers, and the frauds and fakes which prey upon it. Assassination may shatter an instrument, but it cannot conquer a cause. There is still work for the iconoclast to do, and it will be done. It will continue to place its brand upon the forehead of the seducer, the whining hypocrite, the sniveling rogue, the confidence man, the fakir, and the fool. It is proposed to show this country that the pistol is unconvincing as an argument and useless as a break upon reform. Bran is dead, but there are men alive who lack his phenomenal ability, perhaps, but who share his deathless hatred of the rotten, in morals and in politics. The mission for the iconoclast is unchanged and unended. Its field is its own. It will be filled. The man who seeks the American spirit must look for it in the South and West. 
he will not find it in the east. That part of our common country is inhabited by a nation of shopkeepers, as distinct from the peoples of the other sections as the lion is distinct from the jackal. They are smooth-faced, snub-nosed rogues, tied to the counter and till, dollar-marked neederlings of the department stores, jackrabbits of Wall Street, coyotes of the boards of trade. If every man who has traded upon the distress of his country and the peril of his kinsfolk were to be shot this morning, the air of the North Atlantic states would be heavy with powder smoke. From that well-kept and wearisome prostitute and buffoon Chauncey Depew, down to the smallest operator of a bucket shop, they are all tarred with the same brush, things in trousers who would sell their souls for coin. They own the president of this country, and they own many of the congressmen, having bought and paid for them. America, I suppose, is as religious as its neighbors, but it is for the dollar first, and for Christ afterward. Easter is a period devoted to commemoration of the saddest and noblest event in human history, the highest and most important event. It is used by thousands of our merchants, however, as a time specially devoted to making money. From the manufacturer of Easter cards to the maker of hot cross buns, the signs and symbols of religion are made the means of chasing the nimble ten-cent piece. The cross is the hallmark of printed sentiment, to be sold for a quarter, and the crucifixion is done over and over again in gingerbread. The iconoclast may not get to heaven by the Baptist route or the Methodist route, or by any one of the thousand routes which Christians have been pleased to blaze out for sinners in the centuries since Christ died but it is a long way above that kind of impiety. Sacrilege is a better word for it. How does the Republican Party, the party of gold, look now, from fat Tom Reed at its head down to Nancy Green, son of Hetty Green, at its tail? Is it the party of patriotism? May it be trusted to uphold the honor of the nation? Is it honest? Is it even decent? Nay, I say that nine out of every ten Republican congressmen who voted for the intervention resolutions did so because they were driven to it by fear of outraged citizens, Democrats and Republicans alike, not because they were patriots. I say that the representatives of the Republican Party are bound hand and foot to the millionaires of America. I say that the leaders of that party are without principle. The polls next November will show what the honest money and honest patriotism people of the nation think of the Republican Party. From the time that Fitzhugh Lee reached Washington, the myrmidons of William McKinley sought to detract from his services to the country and to belittle his rugged patriotism and love of truth. The popinjay in the White House could not bear to listen to the roar of welcome that greeted him as he stepped from the train. It was like the oleaginous Ohio poltroon to inspire detraction of one who is his official inferior, and his superior in everything that goes to make a man. The Virginian is not intellectually great. He is plain of speech and manner. But he has carried high the unstained banner of the Leeds. He has stood to his post in the face of danger. He has bared the traitorous Spaniard in his stronghold. He has demonstrated once that God never made a more courageous animal than the Southern gentleman. Besides such a man, the purchasable McKinleys and gross scoundrelly Hannahs of the nation are dwarfs. Dr. Dowie, of the Chicago Zion, a place where faith cure fools who have cirrhosis of the liver are allowed to die for reconsideration, has written a circular and sent out a million or two of copies. He wants every adult person in the United States to send him fifty cents, so that he can have money to send out more literature with which to catch more fools. The people of Chicago can confer a favor upon themselves and humanity at large by taking Dowie five miles out into Lake Michigan, tying three hundred pounds of scrap iron to his heels, and dumping him overboard. Mrs. Henryton, President of the Federation of Women's Clubs, has telegraphed McKinley from Chicago that she, as the representative of that influential band of hens, cordially and heartily endorses everything he has ever done or thought of doing. 
it is proper to say that Mrs. Henryton no more represents her sisters than I represent the WCTU. She is only another instance of the modern, highly developed female, eaten by an itch for writing and getting her name into the newspapers. The mothers, sisters, wives, daughters, and sweethearts of America no more endorse William McKinley than they endorse any other coward. The women of the Federated Clubs are much like other women when they stop playing upon the ink bottle and begin playing upon the cook stove. They have taken off Mrs. Henryton's back hair, and she now eats her meals from the mantelpiece, all of which is proper. Little Jimmy Eccles, Cleveland's undersized underling, got some hand claps and whoops from the Chicago Credit Men's Association when he addressed the members at the Grand Pacific Hotel on the night of April 12th. He talked about the businessmen's longing for war when the country is insulted, and these snipes and jack bailiffs of the big mercantile houses, warmed into drunken courage by gallons of cheap wine, yelped in unison. This auriferous insect, who was for four years comptroller of the currency, is remembered in Washington chiefly for a remarkable burst of speed, displayed one night when his timorous mind conceived the idea that a somnolent hackman was going to rob him. He had his dress suit case in one hand and his plug hat in the other, and he covered three blocks in ten seconds. The cabbie whom he had hired waked in time to discover the meteoric dash, and was the most puzzled man in the capital. Eccles is a warrior, and his credit giving or refusing listeners are all warriors. J. Guy Smith of Catula was locally called, so I am informed, Bran No. 2. Like most other men, he was far behind W. C. Bran in wealth of intellect, in largeness of heart, in charity, in his hatred of wrong and the oppressor. It appears, however, that he had the habit of speaking his mind, and he was shot for it also that he was shot in the back. Joe Leiter, the wheat speculator of Chicago, is followed about all day by detectives whom he has hired to protect him. I do not know if anyone contemplates giving him his desserts, but since he has used his inherited millions to make bread dearer in thousands of poor mouths, he should be whipped twice a day for a month. Under a properly constituted and administered government, Lighter and his kind would be sent to the penitentiary at hard labor. He is as much a robber as any brigand of the Italian passes, and as much of a thief as any pickpocket in America. A great many people imagine that your Uncle Sam will frazzle hell's bells out of Spain in one word and two motions, that all of this preparation for threatened conflict with Spain is much ado about little that the United States will get up early some morning and administer the paternal slipper to the Spanish pantaloon, simply by way of diversion or to get up an appetite for breakfast. The result of the scrap may show that the job had best be undertaken after a square meal. As the war is not yet on, I rise to remark that it is my sincere wish that those who have lost a scrap may find it, that those who have clamored so hard and so long for hostilities to begin, may find standing room only in the theater of war, and be given positions in the full glare of the footlight, with a corporal's guard behind them, to see that they do not strike a retrograde motion when the curtain rises on the first act. This completes the last issue of the Iconoclast. The publication of the paper was not continued, though evidently this was intended when the May issue was printed. The following articles were written shortly after the death of Bran, but did not appear in the Iconoclast. End of section 25. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 26 of the Complete Works of Bran, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Complete Works of Bran, the Iconoclast. Volume 12. Section 26. Mr. Bran, who was killed in Waco last Friday, was a much greater man than even his admirers knew. 
he had many virtues which in a way his peculiar tactics in journalism belied for instance his paper was read for the most part by people who took a delight in his calling a spade a spade and in fact in his seeking out spades to write about this was not the true bran at all the man was clean-minded in his conversation he thought cleanly he lived cleanly as a gentleman should though he did not leave off sack he was not a brawling boisterous ruffian reveling in the slums he was essentially a family man and a student who scorned delights and lived laborious days his regard for the purity of women amounted almost to a monomania and he lived up to his own preachment on all of the various forms of integrity with much more strictness than people who affected to believe he was a leper furthermore the man was an ascetic in his essential spirit he had the true taste for the finely done thing in letters and as if he did not devote himself to what might be called the more refined literary artistry it was because he felt that there was danger of drawing too fine the lessons he thought it his duty to impart there was no use he said in writing to the few one should write so that all might read running he maintained that the way to instill principles in the people was to secure their attention first and he did not hesitate to secure their attention by any device that seemed available therefore he felt himself justified in appealing to the lower instincts in men in order that while they were all unsuspecting he might inculcate something better and so there ran through his publication the strangest contrast of sweetness and salacity of eloquence and bombast of purity and pornography of jewel phrases and gutter slang excerpts of enthralling poetry and brothel billingsgate he pointed his morals with futridity and he adorned his really beautiful style with barbarities and banalities which makes one shudder he set his fine thoughts like jewels in compost he ravished the classics to mix them up with sentences that stunk of the stews the man seemed to indulge in special flights of poesy with no other purpose than to achieve a disgusting anticlimax of muckery and mockery the person who read bran intelligently was impressed most by his habit of irony in the waconian it was of the essence of his iconoclasm he had something in his effects in this line that was piteous there was no denying his appreciation of the pure air of the beautiful in life and nature of the truth as thinkers see and feel it it seemed to me that when he had soared up towards the ever vanishing ideal he reached a point whereat he turned in disgust and hurled himself madly back to the dungiest part of this dungy earth there was a mighty dissatisfaction even a despair in bran and a touch of sadness in his writing as in his face the more i read of his deliberate pandering to the literarily extramentious appetite the more i saw or thought i saw that he was afflicted with a mighty ennui and was chiefly trying to escape from his own torture as one who knew not whether solace was to be found either in the spiritual or the earthly nature of man such a one as he might have been expected to take up any cause that assailed the existing condition of things politically and sociologically while he was an ascetic his asceticism was only a reeking of his own bitterness upon himself he was a man in whom strong emotions were easily excited and he put into his writing all the passion which he suppressed in his dealings with his fellows socially he never felt malice towards people whom he assailed most maliciously he saw them simply as representatives of some fault of our social or political system and he felt that he was doing his duty by his own conception of what the world should be by pillaring them as object lessons of characters to be eliminated 
in his good time coming when he saw a foul wrong he saw it personified in some man or woman then he went abroad in search of foul things to say about it and he found them and he hurled them at the object and he polluted the atmosphere for a mile around when he wrote about the abstractions of poetry and philosophy he wrote with a sweeping swinging rhythm that thrilled any one he was master of the diapason his ear was not attuned particularly to minor chords he loved cyclonic clashes of words and he would strike out fecal flashes to eliminate them his courageousity was at times overpowering his vocabulary overcame him often bore him away from his thought and landed him in some swamp out of which he was wont to extricate himself to the great delight of the semi-educated reader by some quip or quirk equally meretricious and mephitic thus would he metaphorically throw filth at himself he felt all the time that he was pursuing the best course bending things he despised and loathed to better purposes mr brand believed that the country was if not in itself decadent and degenerate under the control of decadent degenerate and depraved men he believed that society was a social cesspool he thought that most religion was hypocrisy he believed that most wealth represented nothing more than the superior and diabolical genius of dishonesty so believing he so preached and he preached with a vehemence that was in a sense vicious his terribly irony made his work an engine of anarchy not that he meant anarchy at all but because the people who were caught by his banalities could not differentiate sufficiently to extract the core of truth from the great superstructure of extravagances with which he hid it mr brand meant only to lift the world up and one of his queer conceptions was that his own dragging down of things pure to the lowest level of life and thought and feeling was calculated to make his multitudinous clientele look upward he was mistaken he came to know it too for he said to me one evening i am only a fad i'll pass away when my vogue is done like brick pomeroy he wished to believe that the best way to help people up was to take a stand and view a little above them he said when it was suggested that he try this tack that he feared it was too late not that he wholly abandoned his belief in his own plan but it seemed to me that he felt sorry that once attention could be attracted by being shocking it could only be held by a continuance of the shocks in my personal dealings with mr bran i found him a person of almost feminine fineness it was amusing to meet him after some particularly atrocious issue of the iconoclast either personally or by letter and have him roar as gently as a sucking dove in such moods he revealed a character that was really sweet though i must apologize for that misused word he was impressed with the pity of life he loved to toy intellectually with subtleties of thought he had intuitions in art and poetry and music touched him truly and deeply i never have seen such a gentle man with women and his estimate of woman either in conversation or writing was a high and noble one if at times he wrote so that his conception of virtuous womanhood was unpleasantly associated with ideas that revolted you it was his peculiar belief that purity was all the purer for the contrast and antithesis he loved children too and in his more familiar moods according to his intimates he was like one whose heart was as a little child he cared no more for money after he began to make it than he cared in his bohemian days when he was readier to give than to take he loved his friends blindly he did not hate his enemies he despised them he had all the manly virtues courage generosity modesty yes modesty 
for egoism such as he had was not foolish pride his egotism was only his own force asserting itself his friendship was almost foolish he praised too generously he was inclined to help everybody he could and i am sure that he never assailed any one or anything that did not represent to him uncharity and snobbery he was not envious his mind was on the texas scale he knew no meanness his was kentucky origin and he was tainted with kentucky's quixotism he loved liberty and he loved love he was the friend of the people as he dreamed they should be he was the advocate of the greatest enlargement of rights with little of what he strove for in immediate political issues did i sympathize he believed more in what is called socialism than i do but he believed it most earnestly he was the greatest force in this country with his eighty thousand issues of his magazine per month for all the things that go with free silver his following included all the thinking followers of bryan and his work had no little effect in its powerful music and color upon many people to whom bryanism represented the political abomination of desolation as to the manner of mr brand's death there is only to be said that he expected it he judged from the characters of those he attacked that they would assassinate him he died as he expected to die without any cringing to his enemies some people he attacked who did not deserve his vitriolic attentions but he thought they did in the main he scourged and sacrificed only those who deserved the manner in which he was killed and the cause in which he was killed the cause of an institution in which a girl was debauched in the name of christ and turned out of doors to starve to the glory of religion glorify him he who fought in the open was shot by his sneak from behind the sneak himself was shot in his act of cowardice mr bran was brilliant and brave he partook of the qualities of the men who immortalized the alamo he was the first man who identified texas with thought he loved texas so well that he defended the code of private and public mobbery for righting wrongs to that cruel coward code he fell a victim with all his faults as i see them i can think of him only as worthy of being buried in some high place to the strains of siegfried's funeral march and can only say with browning of the dead grammarian here here's his place where meteors shoot clouds form lightnings are loosened stars come and go let joy break with the storm peace let the day send lofty designs must close in life effects loftily lying leave him still loftier than the world suspects living and dying the mirror for april seventh eighteen ninety eight End of section 26. Recording by John Brandon. Section 27 of The Complete Works of Braun, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Complete Works of Braun, the Iconoclast, Volume 12. Section 27. Private Vengeance. A Consideration of Alleged Chivalry. Some person has sent me a marked copy of the New Orleans Picayune. The marked matter being an editorial substantially approving the manner of the taking off of mr braun the editor of the iconoclast granted that as the picayune declares 
Mr. Brown wantonly attacked spotless reputation, that decency and purity were not sacred to him, an assumption, by the way, that is a rank injustice to Mr. Brown's memory. Let us see about this matter of private vengeance which the Picayune approves. Are there not laws in all the states against libel? Are there not laws against publishing obscene and defamatory matter? If there be, then what justification can there be for private vengeance? What is the use of laws if men, on any provocation, may set aside those laws, and set themselves above them, and execute the person who may have offended, or who may be imagined to have offended them? If private vengeance is to prevail, what is to prevent any person construing any criticism into a mortal offense, and assassinating the critic, even though the critic be palpably and undeniably criticizing for the public good, when the individual is made the judge, jury, and executioner, of whomsoever displeases him, what becomes of law, of order, of civilization? There is not a day in the year that one cannot justify the murder of a hundred editors, if the rightfulness of the killing were determinable solely by what the killers thought of the criticisms against them, in the papers controlled by those one hundred editors. If we can tolerate a state of society in which any man, for what seems to him good and sufficient reason, for anything from biting the thumb at him to jesting about his whiskers, may take the life of another, why shall we not tolerate the man who will take another's property because the taker deems the other has too much or has unjustly accumulated what he has? What is the result of this sanction of private vengeance? It is anarchy pursued to the ultimate of its logic. It means that every man is a law unto himself, and the justice of an execution rests upon nothing but the opinion or delusion of the executioner. What one man might call a trifle might, to another man, call for blood. You could kill a man because his boots creaked, or his eyes squinted, or he wore the wrong shade of your favorite color in his necktie. Ridiculous? Not at all. Liking or disliking any of these trifling things is only a matter of personal preference. They may be as distasteful to one person as the tone of an editorial is to another. If a man may rightly kill a writer like Mr. Braun, why would it not be right for someone to kill an editor? At one time there was talk in the South of killing the late Joseph P. McCullough for his editorials. How if Senator Hanna were to go gunning for the editorial roasters of himself, or for the malevolent cartoonist. Mr. Braun attacked hypocritic preachers, snide politicians, shoddy society people, shyster lawyers. He did it in, to me, an exaggerated manner, but he felt that such manner was necessary to arouse the people. Were Braun's blasts against Baylor University intrinsically worse? more a license of the press than, let us say, the assaults of the New York World, the New York Journal, or the Post-Dispatch upon Pierpont Morgan and the Trusts. And yet, if any trust magnate, crucified as a bloodsucker on the poor, were to shoot the editor of one of these sheets, he would be howled to the hangman's noose. The trust magnate would be told he should have had recourse to law. But in the South, no. Mr. Braun was rightfully assassinated. No law for him. Why? Because Mr. Braun assailed a few southern josses. If Mr. Braun were justly slain, then the next person who may dislike an editorial in the Picayune may kill its editor on the ground that the editorial, no matter how trifling in its imputation, is carrion journalism. This law of chivalric private vengeance would justify a saturnalia of murder in every large city where gossip circulates in society. The chivalry of it, a man has written something he deems to be true, and comments upon it as he deems it his duty in a quasi-public capacity. Everyone who does not like the article can take a pop at him. But, says the chivalrous Picayune, the law of private vengeance does not apply to anything save grave offenses and scurrility. Ah, the offensiveness of a criticism is only a matter of individual capacity for pain or humiliation. The trifle is only a trifle, because a man thinks it is so. It may become a thing of importance at any time, if you leave the decision of its importance solely to the judgment of the man, 
who is going to resent it. Private vengeance makes for the creation of a cast of bulldozers. Let it become known in the community that criticism is an invitation to death. And who profit? Not the men of spotless reputation. Not the decent and pure elements of the community. Not at all. The ruffian gang in politics profits. The sanctimonious crooks profit. The seducer and betrayer who is a dead shot profits. Every social and civic iniquity flourishes under this dominance of the law of private vengeance. All the people who deserve criticism are ready to shoot. They are the judges of their own spotless reputations. They will kill the man who spots it. So it is that in almost every southern city there has grown up a class of political Brahmins absolutely secure from criticism that counts. Take New Orleans. The papers feared for years to breathe a breath of attack against the spotless reputations of its leaders. The story of the corruption that developed is too well known to require telling. After all, it is not the people of spotless reputation who are assailed in the papers. Whenever anyone is assailed, the chances are there is ground for the assault, and there is at least a prima facie evidence that attack or exposure is necessary in the interest of public morality. Any reputation would be spotless if no one dared attack it. If it were high crime to assail people vigorously, how would dishonor, debauchery, fraud, and crime in high places ever be brought to light? If the right of private vengeance shall prevail in any community, then the ruffians and blackguards may pursue their nefarious ends unhampered because of the terror they inspire by threats to shoot their critics. This recognition of the right of the individual to punish by the infliction of death the person who has injured him puts the community at the mercy of the worst elements in it. It is the extension of the barbarism of lynch law, makes every man who wants to be one a mob. It develops the idea of savagery and revenge to such an extent that the individual executioner of the offender against himself does not hesitate to wreak his vengeance from behind. It promotes assassination. Aspersions upon the virtue of women are certainly indefensible on any imaginable ground. They demand often a punishment which the law is inadequate to provide. They cannot be ignored. They constitute the exceptions which confirm the rule that it is well to let the law punish slanderers. And in general, men are expected to protect to the last extremity the reputations of the women of their family and their acquaintance. The person who attacks publicly or privately the virtue of a woman deserves the limit of vengeance, for the publicity of legal proceedings toward punishment only aggravates the original wrong. Mr. Brown did not attack the virtue of girl students at Baylor University. He attacked the administration of that institution, and the killing of him was the result of a distorted view of the trend of his criticisms. If it were believed that he assailed the virtue of girl students at Baylor, he would not have a single mourner in the Southwest. And no man in any part of the United States can have a following of respectable people if he defames women. The feeling of reverence for woman is so general that it is often a defense for personal violence against writers who never dream of attacking feminine honor. Aside from the fact that death is too light a punishment for the man who attacks womanly chastity, the law of private vengeance is not sweepingly and invariably to be condemned. I am not liberal enough in recognition of the great fact of human nature to admit that the objection to private vengeance is mainly an objection to the recognition of the right of individual execution of the death penalty for any criticism. Men ought not to be shot for criticisms of public institutions. It would be foolish to argue against the fact that men occasionally feel called upon to resent criticism by an appeal to battle without weapons. The killing of critics at the whim of the criticized is the evil against which protest is made. Plain assault and battery is easily defensible on the ground, that no one can be expected always to have his temper in control. It makes writers careful, and it is not followed by the regret which follows killing. Writers are expected to keep within bounds in their criticisms, and even then they are certain to generate ill feeling in the criticized and their friends. But so long as the offense is not murderous of reputation and mortally malevolent, the private execution of writers is an offense not to be condoned on a mistaken interpretation of chivalry. 
for all sins of journalistic criticism outside of the diabolism of blasting reputations for virtue the law provides adequate remedy and if it does not then it were idle to say that the exasperated victims of criticism should not have recourse to their fists although decent criticism free from malice addressed to people in position semi-public would not seem to call for violence under pretense of resenting something much worse as a rule i should say that the criticism which does not call for extreme and desperate punishment calls for no notice at all or if it does in the case of men there are laws civil and criminal to cover the case with ample punishment for the offence this is the practical view of the remedies against carrion journalism a public sentiment strong enough to support private vengeance is strong enough to support the law there are laws for the punishment of slander more rigorous laws could be enforced if the people hate slanderers bitterly enough to kill them then they should hate them enough to see that the laws against slander are enforced the moral sentiment that can sustain the one could sustain the other but the individual execution of vengeance is a turning away from the law it is the fostering of the bully and the killer for drunken pastime it is a bulwark for boodlers blackguards frauds and lechers it gives rein to individual passion without limit such chivalry is barbarism pasquine end of section twenty seven recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 29 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Gallagher. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. Section 29. Bran the Fool. By Albert Hubbard editor of the philistine it's a grave subject bran is dead bran was a fool the fools were the wisest men at court and shakespeare who dearly loved a fool placed his wisest sayings in the mouths of men who wore the motley when he adorned a man with a cap and bells it was as though he had given bonds for both that man's humanity and intelligence neither shakespeare nor any other writer of books ever dared to depart so violently from the truth as to picture a fool whose heart was filled with perfidy. The fool is not malicious. Stupid people may think he is, because his language is charged with the lightning's flash, but they are the people who do not know the difference between an incubator and an eggplant. Touchstone, with unfailing loyalty, follows his master with quip and quirk into exile. When all, even his daughters, have forsaken King Lear, the fool bears himself to the storm and covers the shaking old man with his own cloak. And when, in our own day, we meet the avatars of Trinculo, Costard, Mercutio, and Jacques, we find they are men of tender susceptibilities, generous hearts, and intellects keen as a rapier's point. Bran was a fool. Bran shook his cap, flourished his bauble, gave a toss to that fine head, and with tongue in cheek, asked questions and propounded conundrums that stupid hypocrisy could not answer. So they killed Bran. Bran was born in obscurity. Very early he was cast upon the rocks and nourished at the she-wolf's teat. He graduated at the University of Hard Knocks and during his short life took several post-doctorate courses. He had been wage-earner, printer's devil, printer, pressman, editor. He knew the world of men, the struggling, sorrowing, hoping, laughing, sinning world of men. And to those whom God had tempted beyond what they could bear, his heart went out. He read books with profit, and got great panoramic views out into the world of art and poetry, dreaming dreams and sending his swaying filament of thought out and out, hoping it would somewhere catch and he would be in communion with another world. Discreet and cautious little men are known by the company they keep. The fool was not particular about his associates. Children, sick people, insane folks, rich or poor, it made no difference to him. He sometimes even sat at meat with publicans and sinners. He was a mystic and lived in the ideal. This deeply religious quality in his nature led him into theology, and he became a clergyman, a Baptist clergyman. 
but no church is large enough to hold such a man as this. The fool quality in his nature outcrops, and the jingle of bells makes sleep to the chief pew-holder impossible. So the fool had to go. Then he founded that unique periodical which, in three years, attained a circulation of ninety thousand copies. This paper was not used for pantry shelves, lamp lighters, or other base utilitarian purposes. It cost ten times as much as a common newspaper, and the people who bought it read it until it was worn out. All the things in this paper were not truth. Mixed up amid a world of wit were often extravagance and much bad taste. It was only a fool's newspaper. In this periodical the fool railed and jeered and stated facts about smirking complacency, facts so terrible that folks said they were indecent. He flung jibes at stupidity, and stupidity sought to answer criticism by assassination. Texas has a libel law patterned after the libel law of the state of New York. If a man takes from you your good name, you can put him behind bars and place shutters over the windows of his place of business. The people who thought Brand had injured them did not invoke the law. They invoked Judge Lynch. A mob seized the fool and, placing a rope about his neck, led him naked through the October night out to the theological seminary, which they declared he had traduced. There they smote him with the flat of their hands and spat upon him. It was their intention to hang the fool, but better counsel prevailed, and on his signing in Torerum, a document they placed before him, they gave him warning to depart to another state, and on his promising to do so, they let him go. But the next day he refused to leave, and his flashing wit still filled the air, now embittered through the outrage visited upon him. His enemies held prayer meetings, invoking divine aid for the fool's conversion or extinction. One man quoted David's prayer concerning Shimei, Bring thou down his hoar head to the grave in blood. Another still prayed, Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. But still the fool flourished his bauble. Then they shot him. That hand which wrote the most Carlylean phrase of any in America is cold and stiff. That teeming brain which held a larger vocabulary than that of any man in America, is only clay that might stop a hole to keep the wind away. That soul through which surge thoughts too great for speech has gone a journey in. Bran is dead. No more shall we see that lean, clean, homely face with its melancholy smile. No more shall we hear the fool eloquently and, oh, so foolishly, plead the cause of the weak, the unfortunate, the vicious. No more shall we behold the tears of pity glisten in those sad eyes as his heart was wrung by the tale of suffering and woe. His children are fatherless, his wife a widow. Bran the Fool is dead. The Mirror, April 14th, 1898 End of Section 29 Recording by Jim Gallagher Section 29 of The Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Glover. The Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast, Volume 12. Section 29. William Cowper Bran by J. D. Shaw William Cowper Bran was born in Humboldt Township, Coles County, Illinois, January 4, 1855. He was not raised in the home of his parents, though his father, Rev. Noble Bran, survived him, and is still living, his mother having died when he was two and a half years old. He was within the next six months placed in the care of Mr. William Hawkins, a Coles County farmer, with whom he lived about ten years. As to his childhood experiences on the Hawkins farm, nothing is now known. They were probably such as are common to children raised in the country. Of Mr. Hawkins, he always spoke kindly, referring to him as Pa Hawkins. His nature was not suited to farm life, however, and he finally made up his mind to see more of the world. Hence, without ever having disclosed his resolution to anyone, he quietly walked away, one dark and cheerless night, carrying in a small box under his arm all that he then possessed, 
and leaving behind him the friends of his childhood in the only place he had ever known as his home, thus entering upon the active struggle of life at thirteen years of age, without friends, destitute of means, and almost entirely uneducated. The first position he obtained was that of a bellboy in a hotel. Later on he learned to be a painter and grainer, then a printer, a reporter, and finally an editorial writer. He was energetic, industrious, and painstaking in whatever he undertook to do, therefore always employed. Early in his struggle he realized the need of an education, in the acquirement of which he applied himself with eager diligence. Nature had endowed him with keen perceptive powers, a retentive memory, and great mental vigor, by means of which he soon accumulated considerable knowledge. Every moment that could be spared from his daily toil was spent in reading books of science, philosophy, history, biography, and general literature. In this way, he became thoroughly informed on almost every important subject, as will be seen by the contents of his writings. On March 3, 1877, at Rochelle, Illinois, he was married to Miss Carrie Martin, who, with their two children, Grace Gertrude and William Carlyle, is now living in the beautiful home here at Waco, from which he was buried April 3, 1898. During all the years from the time he left the hospitable home of Mr. Hawkins in 1868, until after he had successfully launched Brand's iconoclast. He suffered the harassing annoyances of extreme poverty, in the endurance of which he was cheerful, hopeful, and diligent in the equipment of his mind, preparatory to the work he always believed he would some day be able to accomplish. Beginning his literary career as a reporter, he was soon made an editorial writer, in which capacity he became well known throughout Illinois, Missouri, and Texas. As such, he was versatile, forceful, and direct. There was no needless repetition of tiresome circumlocution in his composition. He possessed an inexhaustible vocabulary, from which he could always find the words best fitted to convey his meaning at the moment they were most needed, and every sentence was resplendent with an order of wit, humor, and satire peculiar to a style original with himself. In July 1891, he issued at Austin, Texas, the first number of Brand's Iconoclast. Only a few numbers appeared, when it was suspended and he resumed his editorial work, then on the Globe Democrat of St. Louis, Missouri, and later on the Express of San Antonio, Texas. It was in connection with his first attempt to establish the Iconoclast that he delivered a few lectures that were well received. In later years, he went upon the platform again with every prospect of a successful career in the lecture field. In the summer of 1894 he settled here in Waco, and in February of the following year revived the Iconoclast, which was successful from the first issue, having reached at the time of his death a circulation of 90,000 copies. It was through the Iconoclast that his genius found full scope for development and that he became best known to the public. In its columns, he dared to be himself. There was now no restraint imposed upon him by timorous publishers. It belonged to him, and in it he gave full wing to his own thought. It was this intellectual freedom, sustained by the magic power and personality of a real genius, that gave to it such widespread popularity. Mr. Bran has been classed as a humorist, this he was, and of a type peculiar to himself. But he was not content with merely having amused or entertained the people. He aspired to arouse public sentiment in the interest of certain reforms. He was a hater of shams, and defied every form of fraud, hypocrisy, and deceit. He made of his humor a whip with which to scourge from the temple of social purity every intruder there. He joined in no partisan schemes for place or power, but, confident of his own ground, he would stand alone in the defiance of popular humbugs and frauds. This heroic independence, while admired by many, 
made him a mark for the envy and hatred of such as feared him, and in the end proved to be the cause of his death. But with all his uncompromising hatred of shams, there beat in the bosom of W. C. Bran a warm and generous heart for the world at large, and no man was ever a more devoted friend to the poor and needy. No beggar was ever turned away from his door empty-handed, and no worthy cause ever asked his help in vain. His religion was to do whatever he believed to be right, and to defy the wrong even though it should be found parading in the garb and livery of righteousness. Mr. Bran was fond of nature. He loved the mountains, the lakes, the rivers, and the billowy sea. He loved to walk amid forest trees, and watch the birds fly from bough to bough, and warble their songs of love. But in all the wide, wide world, his home life was the most sacred object of his devotion. And when prosperity gave him the means to do so, he found great delight in making it beautiful and pleasant. He was fond of his friends, but the love he bore his wife and children was sublimely beautiful, tender, and affectionate. His sudden death was a shock not only to his immediate friends, but to the hundreds of thousands who knew him through the iconoclast. Walking quietly along the street, talking with a friend, he was shot in the back by one T. E. Davis, a partisan on the Baylor side of the Bran Baylor Trouble. After receiving, without warning, his death wound, Mr. Brand turned upon his assailant, drew a revolver, and vindicated his courage by delivering his fire with such deadly aim as to leave Davis in the throes of death, which came to his relief about twenty hours after the fray. Mr. Brand received three wounds, from the first of which he died at 1.55 a.m., April 2nd surrounded by his family and many sympathizing friends. The impression has gone abroad that Mr. Bran was without friends and admirers in Waco. The falsity of this impression was made manifest by the funeral attendants, said and generally believed to have been the largest ever seen here. He was a believer in religion, therefore, it was not improper that a religious service was held, conducted by Rev. Frank Page, Doctor of Divinity, of the Episcopal Church. Though the writer, acting in accordance with the wishes of the family, spoke a few words at the grave. In Oakwood Cemetery the body of Bran was laid to rest, in the embrace of our common Mother Earth, and under a mound of floral offerings, which though profuse and costly were but a feeble expression of the sincere grief that struck dumb with awe, the thousands upon thousands who had learned to love him with an affection accorded to few men. My position as to Mr. Brand's style of journalism has been freely expressed, and while he was still alive, I do not approve of all he saw fit to write, nor of the spirit in which he wrote, but that he was a real genius and a benefactor of his race cannot be denied. It was with him, as it is with all men of his type, he made strong and bitter enemies, Still his friends and admirers were numbered by thousands, I may safely say hundreds of thousands. The purposes, direction, and character of the iconoclast were in many respects different from those of this pulpit. Nevertheless, there was between Mr. Bran and myself a strong tie of friendship that, so far as I know, never suffered the breach of a single moment, and I sincerely mourn his loss as a personal friend whose kindly greetings were to me as glimpses of the sun on a winter's day. Of humble birth, beset by poverty and environed by many difficulties, he applied himself to the study of literature, with such diligence as to acquire abilities possessed by few, and when once equipped for the field, he occupied with such consummate skill, no power of prejudice could keep him from rising like a star, of the first magnitude. Alas, how soon that star has been obscured, and by what ignoble means! But against great odds, its brief existence was characterized by a brilliancy that no prejudice or hatred can ever obliterate. Having dealt candidly with Mr. Brand while living, I will not now ignore the fact that he had faults, 
and his inability to overcome these marred here and there the splendor of his intellectual achievements. His faults, though, were of a kind that may be permitted to pass into the grave with his body. His virtues were many, and for these he was loved, despite the imperfections he could not always control. His services to mankind were numerous, and they were rendered with a devotion as ardent as that of a lover. For these he will be remembered. Nor can any power rob him of his fame as a literary genius, a poet, a humorist, and a satirist. End of section 29「Section 30 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Gallagher. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 30. Speaking of Gaul. Gaul is a bitter subject, and I shall waste no time selecting sweet words in which to handle it. There's no surplus of sweet words in my vocabulary anyhow. I have never yet been able to rent my mouth for a taffy mill. Webster gives several definitions of Gaul, but the good old etymologist was gathered to his fathers long before the word attained its full development and assumed an honored place in the slang vernacular of the day. It was needed. It fills what editors sometimes call a long-felt want. Gaul is sublimated audacity, transcendent impudence, immaculate nerve, triple-plated cheek, brass, in solid slugs. It is what enables a man to borrow five dollars of you, forget to repay it, then touch you for twenty more. It is what makes it possible for a woman to borrow her neighbor's best bonnet, then complain because it isn't the latest style, or doesn't suit her particular type of beauty. It is what causes people to pour their troubles into the ears of passing acquaintances instead of reserving them for home consumption. It is what makes a man aspire to the governorship, or to air his asininity in the Congress of the United States, when he should be fiddling on a stick of cordwood with an able-bodied bucksaw. It is what leads a feather-headed fop, with no fortune but his folly, no prospects but poverty, who lacks business ability to find for himself bread, to mention marriage to a young lady reared in luxury, to ask her to leave the house of her father and help him fill the land with fools. Gall is what spoils so many good ditchers and delphers to make peanut politicians and putty-headed professional men. It is what puts so many men in the pulpit who could serve their savior much better planting the mild-eyed potato or harvesting the useful hoop pole. It is what causes so many young ladies to rush into literature instead of the laundry, to become poets of passion instead of authors of pie. Gall is a very common ailment. In fact, a man without a liberal supply of it is likely to be as lonesome in this land as a consistent Christian at a modern camp meeting or a gold bug Democrat in Texas. Nearly everybody has it and is actually proud of it. When a young man is first afflicted with the tender passion, when he is in the throes of the mysterious mental aberration that would cause him to climb a mesquite bush and lasso the moon for his inamorata if she chanced to admire it, he is apt to think it love that makes the world go round. Later, he learns that gall is the social dynamics, the force that causes humanity to arise and hump itself. Gall has got the world grabbed. Politics is now a high-class play, whose pawns are power and plunder. Business is becoming but a gouge game wherein success hallows any means. Our mighty men are most successful marauders. Our social favorites minister in the temple of Maimon. Our pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night, the follies and foibles of the four hundred, our god the golden calf. The standard by which society now measures men is the purse, that by which it gauges greatness, the volume of foolish sound which the aspirant for immortal honor succeeds in setting afloat, little caring whether it be such celestial harp music as caused Thebes' walls to rise, or the discordant bray of the ram's horn which made Jericho's to fall. This century, which proudly boasts itself heir to all the ages, and foremost in the files of time, doffs its beaver to brazen effrontery, 
burns its sweetest incense on the unhallowed shrine of pompous humbuggery, while modest merit is in a more pitiable predicament than the traditional tomcat in Tartarus without teeth or toenails. We make manifest our immeasurable gall by proclaiming from the housetops that, of all the ages which have passed o'er the hoary head of Mother Earth, the present stands preeminent, that of all the numberless cycles of time's mighty pageant there is none like unto it, no, not one, and I sincerely hope there wasn't. Perhaps that which induced the deity to repent him, that he had made man and send a deluge to soak some of the devilment out of him, was the nearest approach to it. We imagine that because we have the electric telegraph and the nickel-plated dude, the printing press and the campaign lie, the locomotive and the scandal in high life, that because we now roast our political opponent instead of the guileless young missionary, and rob our friends by secret fraud instead of despoiling our foes by open force, that we are the people par excellence, and the Lord must be proud of us. Progress and improvement are not always synonyms. A people may grow in gall instead of grace. I measure a century by its men rather than by its machines, and we have not, since civilization took its boasted leap forward, produced a Socrates or a Shakespeare, a Phidias or an Angelo, a Confucius or a Christ. This century runs chiefly to Talmages and Deacon Toogoods, pauper dukes and divorce courts, intellectual soup and silk lingerie. The poets no longer sing of the immortal gods, of war and sacrifice, while the flame mounts to manhood's cheek, red as the fires of Troy. They twitter of loveys and doveys, of posies and goose-liver pie, while pretty men applaud and sentimental maids get moonsick. Cincinnatus no longer waits for the office to seek the man. He sells his brace of bullocks and buys a political boom. No more the Spartan mother gives her long black hair for bowstrings. She blondines it, paints, powders, and tries to pass as the younger sister of her eldest daughter. The Norse Viking no longer plows the unknown wave, his heart wilder than the watery waste, his arm stronger than tempered steel. He comes to America and starts a saloon. No more the untamed Irish king carooms off the Saxon invader with a seasoned shillelagh. He gets on the police force and helps run the machine, or clubs the heads off harmless married men who won't go home till morning. In these degenerate days, the philosopher retires not to the desert, and there, by meditation most profound, wrings from the secret treasure house of his own superior soul jewels to adorn his age and enrich the world. He mixes an impossible plot with a little pessimism, adds a dude and a woman whose moral character has seen better days, spills the nauseous compound on the public as a philosophical novel, and works the press for puffs. Indeed, we're progressing, going onward and upward, like the belled buzzard dodging a divorce scandal. Greece had her Pericles, but it was left to us to produce a Parkhurst. Rome had her Cicero and her Caesar, but was never equal to a Culberson or a Corbett. The princes of old conquered the earth, but the modern plutocrats put a mortgage on it. Cleopatra drank pearls dissolved in wine, but whiskey straight is said to be good enough for some of her successors. Samson slew the Philistines with a jawbone of an ass, but a modern politician, employing the selfsame weapon, could have got him to elect him governor. We've got no Helen of Troy, but our Helen Blazes is a bird of the same feather. We got to yield the palm in poetry and philosophy, art and architecture but when it comes to building political platforms that straddle every important issue and slinging princely style on a pauper income, we're out of sight. How can the acorn become a mighty forest monarch if planted in a pint pot and crossed with a fuzzy-wuzzy chrysanthemum? How can the Numidian lion's whelp become a king of beasts if reared in a cage and fed on cold potatoes, muzzled and made to dance to popular music? How can the superior soul expand until it becomes all-embracing, godlike, a universe in itself, in which rings sweet sphere music and rolls Jovinian thunder, in which blazes true Promethean fire instead of smolders the sulfurous caloric of the netherworld, when its meats and bounds are irrevocably fixed for it, when it can only grow in certain prescribed directions, painfully mapped out for it by bumptious pissmires who imagine that their little heads constitute the intellectual cosmos. Hamlet, prince of Denmark, lamented that he lacked gall, 
but the melancholy Dane was dead years before the present generation of titled snobs appeared upon the scene. None of the princes or dukes of the present day appear to be short on Gaul. None of the nobility seem to be suffering for the lack of it. Not long ago, a little duke who owes his title to the fact that his great-grand-aunt was the paramour of a half-wit prince, kindly condescended to marry an American girl to recoup his failing fortunes. A little French guy, whose brains are worth about two cents a pound, for soap grease, put up a Confederate bond title for the highest bidder and was bought in like a hairless Mexican pup by an American plutocrat. Now, half a dozen more little pauper princelings and decadent dukelings are trying to trade their worthless coronets for American cash. But the fact that many a man boasting of his American sovereignty will dicker with the titled young duke, instead of using the forecastle of a number nine foot to drive his spinal column up through his plug hat like a presidential lightning rod, will actually purchase for his daughter some disgusting little title upon which rests the fateful bar sinister of a woman's shame, and is encumbered by a dizzy young dude too lazy to work and too cowardly to steal, too everlastingly ornery to raise a respectable crop of wild oats, proves that the young lollipop lordlings haven't a monopoly on the gall of the globe. A most shameful exhibition of gall is the practice now coming into vogue with certain society ladies of encouraging newspapers to puff their charms, even paying them so much a line for fulsome praise. Not a few metropolitan papers reap a handsome profit by puffing society buds whom their fond parents are eager to place on the matrimonial market, hoping that they will make good matches, in other words, that they will marry money, its possessors being thrown in as pelon. Even married women, who are long on shekels but short on cents, sometimes pay big prices to get their portraits in the public prints, accompanied by puffs that would give a buzzard a bilious attack. But the gall of the girl who puts her picture in the papers, accompanied by a paid puff of her purdy, scarce equals that of the conceited maid who imagines she has only to look at a man and giggle a few times to mash him cold, to get his palpitating heart on a buckskin string and swing it hither and yon at pleasure. How the great he-world does suffer at the hands of these heartless young coquettes, if half it tells them be true. David said in his haste that all men are liars and had he carefully considered the matter, he would have come to the same conclusion. Washington may have told his father the truth about the cherry tree, but later in life he became entirely too popular with the ladies for a man unable to lie. It is natural for men to pay court to a pretty woman as for flies to buzz about a molasses barrel, but not every fly that buzzes expects to get stuck, I beg to state. The man who doesn't tell every woman who will listen to him, excepting perhaps his wife, that she's as pretty as a peri, even though she is homely enough to frighten a mugwump out of a fat federal office, that she's got his heart grabbed, that he lives only in the studied sunshine of her store teeth smile and is hungering for an opportunity to die for her dear sake. Well, he's an angel, and he seraphs are almighty scarce, I beg you to believe. Since Adonis died and Joseph was gathered to his fathers, none have appeared that I am aware of. These young gentlemen were all right, I suppose but I'd like to see either of them get elected nowadays on the Democratic ticket in Texas. But feminine conceit, fed on flattery, were as milkshake unto mescal, as a kiss by mail to one by moonlight, compared with the insufferable egotism of the pretty man, who puts his mustache up in curl papers, and perfumes his pompadour, who primps and postures before an amorous looking-glass, and imagines that all Eve's daughters are trying to abduct him. Whenever I meet one of these male irresistibles, I am forcibly reminded that the Almighty made man out of mud, and not very good mud at that. The two-legged he-thing, who makes a close horse of himself, imposes on the street corner perfumed like an Emancipation Day picnic, who ogles a pretty woman until the crimson creeps into her cheek, then prides himself on having captured her heart like the boy caught the itch, because he couldn't help it when she's only blushing for the mother who bore the pitiful parody on manhood, who imagines that every maid who deigns to waste a smile on him is sighing her soul out for his sweet sake, has allowed his gall to go to his head and curdle his brains. More than a moiety of our so-called great men are but featherless geese possessing a superabundance of gall, creatures of chance who ride like driftwood on the crest of a wave raised by forces they cannot comprehend, 
but they ride, and the world applauds them while it tramples better men beneath its brutal feet. Greatness and gall, genius and goose speech, sound and sense have become synonyms. If you fall on the wrong side of the market, men will quote the proverb about a fool and his money. If on the right side, you're a Napoleon of finance. Lead a successful revolt, and you are a pure patriot whose memory should be preserved to latest posterity. Had an unsuccessful uprising, and you are a miserable rebel who should have been hanged. Nothing succeeds like success. Had the Christian religion failed to take root, Judas Iscariot would have been commemorated in the archives of Rome as one who helped stamp out the hateful heresy, and had Washington got the worst of it in his go with Cornwallis, he would have passed into history as a second Jack Cade. Alexander of Macedon was great, as measured by the world's standard of eminence. After two and twenty centuries, our very babes prattle of this bloody butcher, and even his horse has been enshrined in history. In our own day, Father Damien left kindred and country and went forth to die for the miserable lepers in the mid-Pacific, but he is already forgotten. His name and fame have faded from the minds of men. Yet greater and grander than all the blood-stained princes and potentates of earth, nobler, more godlike than all the proud prelates that ever aired their turgid eloquence at Christian conference or ecumenical council, was that young priest. But no cenotaph rises to commemorate his sacrifice. Silent as his own sealed lips is the trumpet of fate. But for gall of the A1 triple X brand, commend me to the little pothouse politician who poses as a political prophet and points out to wiser men their public duties. We have today in this land of the free and home of the crank thousands of self-important little personages who know as little of political economy as of parrot of the power of prayer, prating learnedly of free trade or protection, greenbackism or metallic money, men who couldn't tell the fundamental principle from their funny bone, an economic thesis from a hot tamale, who don't know whether Ricardo was an economist or a corn doctor, evolve from their empty ignorance new systems of saving the country and defending them with the dogmatic assurance of a nigger preacher describing the devil, make gorgeous displays of their gall. I have noticed that, as a rule, the less a man knows of the science of government, the crazier he is to go to Congress. About half the young statesmen who break into the legislature imagine that Roger Q. Mills wrote the science of economics and that Jefferson Davis was the father of democracy. But the gall is not confined to the little fellows. The big political M.D.s have their due proportion. The remedies they prescribe for Uncle Sam's ailments remind me of the panaceas put in the market by the patent medicine men, warranted to cure everything from a case of cholera morbus to an epidemic of poor relations. We have one school of practitioners prescribing free trade as a sure cure for every industrial ill, another a more drastic system of protection. One assures us that the silver habit is dragging us down to the diminution bow-wows, another that only a heroic dose of white dollars will save us from industrial death. Political claptrap to corral the succulent pie issues to get office. We have had high and low tariff, the gold and silver standard, greenbackism, and wildcat currency. We have had presidents of all shades of political faith and congress of every kind of economic folly. Yet, in a single century, America has risen from the poorest of nations to the wealthiest in all the world. True it is that wealth is congested, that willful waste and woeful want go hand in hand, that the land is filled with plutocrats and paupers. But this distressing fact is due to the faults of our own industrial system itself and can never be reformed by placing fiddle strings on the free list or increasing the tariffs on toothpicks. Gall, ye gods, look at the platform promises of the blessed Democratic Party, then at its performances. Look at the party itself, a veritable omnium gatherum of political odds and ends, huddled together under the party blanket like household gods and barnyard refuse after a hurricane. High and low tariffs and free traders, gold bugs, greenbackers and bimetallists, Cleveland and Crocker, Altgeld and Olney, Hill and Hogue, Waco's Warwick and Colonel Culberson's kid all clamoring to be dyed in the wool Democrats. When I get a new mainspring put in my vocabulary, I'm going to tackle the gall of the populace and the Republicans. Some specimens of gall amaze me by their greatness. Some amuse me, while others only spoil my appetite. Of the latter class is the chronic kicker 
who is forever fuming about feminine fashions. If the hoop skirt comes in, this critic is in agony. If the pullback makes its appearance, he has a fit and falls in it. Ever since Eve attired herself in a few freckles and fig leaves, he's been reforming the fashions. Don't mind him, ladies. Like a peacock crying in the night, he's disagreeable, but not dangerous. Adorn yourselves as you see fit. Follow such fashions as seem good in your sight, and have no fear that the sons of men will ever forsake you because of your clothes. When you find a man dictating to the ladies what they shall wear, you're pretty apt to see his head housed in a stovepipe hat, the most inartistic and awkward monstrosity ever designed by the devil to make the Almighty ashamed of his masterpiece. In all history, there's no record of a great idea being born in a bee gum. I never saw a statue of a hero or picture of a martyr with a plug hat on. Imagine the Lord laying aside a silky kitty preparatory to preaching the Sermon on the Mount, or Napoleon apostrophizing the pyramids in a plug. Before finding fault with the fashions of the ladies, just imagine Apollo in the makeup of a modern society swell, loafing into court on high Olympus. Why, Jove would hit him with a thunderbolt so hard there'd be nothing left of him but a wilted chrysanthemum and a pair of yellow shoes. For a specimen of Gaul that must amaze the very gods, commend me to a crowd of pharisaical plutocrats piously offering in a hundred thousand dollar church prayers to him who had nowhere to lay his head, who pay a preacher fifteen thousand dollars per annum the point to weigh the paradise, while in the great cities of every Christian country children must steal or starve and women choose between death and dishonor. New York is crowded with costly churches that lift their proud spires into the imperium, that part the clouds with their gold fingers, monuments which mammon rears as if to mock the lowly Son of God. Their value mounts up into the millions. Yet I learned from a religious paper, mark you, that 100,000 men, women, and children were evicted in New York alone last year for the non-payment of rent, turned into the streets to suffer summer's heat or winter's cold, to beg or starve or steal as they saw fit. I find these startling statistics in the same column with a tearful appeal for more money to send missionaries to black barbarians on the same page with a description of a new church that must have cost a cold half million of cash. That's what I call sanctified assurance, gall masquerading as grace. And what is true of New York is true in greater or lesser degree of every town from Plymouth Rock to Poker Flats, from Tadmore in the wilderness to Yuba Dam. Everywhere the widow is battling with want, while we send Bibles and blankets, prayer books and pie, salvation and missionary soup, to a job lot of lazy niggers whose souls aren't worth the sumarki in blocks of five, who wouldn't walk into heaven if the gates were wide open, but once inside would steal the eternal throne if it wasn't spiked down. Let the heathen rage. We've got our hands full at home. I'd rather see the whole black and tan aggregation short on Bibles than one white child crying for bread. End of section 30。section 31 of the complete works of Brand the Iconoclast, volume 12。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Gallagher. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 31. While well, Europe and America are peddling saving grace in pagan lands, and, incidentally, extending the market for their cheap tobacco, snide jewelry, and forty-rod bug juice, they are also building warships and casting cannon, preparing to cut each other's throats while prating of the Prince of Peace. The idea of countries that have to build forts on their frontiers and keep colossal standing arbories to avoid being butchered by their own Christian brethren. They are full of divorce courts and demagogues, penitentiaries and poorhouses, sending young theological goslings who believe that all of divine revelation can be found in one book to teach the philosophic Hindu the road to heaven. Gaul! Why, the men who were trying to convert were preaching the immortality of the soul when the Hebrew prophets were putting people to the sword for accepting it. They were familiar with all the essential features of the Christian faith a thousand years before the crucifixion of Christ. Charity begins at home. In our own country, children are coming up in ignorance and crime, 
while sect vies with sect in the erection of proud temples in which polite society may display its Parisian finery while pretending to worship one who broke bread with beggars and slept in the brush. I haven't much use for gold-plated godliness. Christ never built a church or asked for a vacation on full pay. Never. He indulged in no political harangues, never told his parishioners how to vote, never posed as a professional prohibitionist. He didn't try to reform the fallen women of Jerusalem by turning them over to the police, a la Parkhurst. Although gladiatorial shows were common in his country, and that without gloves, he didn't go raging up and down the earth like some of our Texas dominies, demanding that these awful crimes against civilization should cease. There is no record of his engineering a boycott against businessmen who dissented from his doctrine. I think he could have read a copy of the Iconoclast with far more patience than some of his successors. Human or divine, he was the grandest man that ever graced the mighty tide of time. His was a labor of love instead of for lucre. The groves were his temples, the mountainside his pulpit, the desert his sacristy, and Jordan his baptismal font. Then there's the unconscious gall of the pious parrot who is quite sure that the only highway to the heavenly hereafter is outlined by his little sect, macadamized by his creed, that you've got to travel that or get into trouble, perhaps fall into the fire. Just imagine that our dear Lord, who so loved sinners that he died to save them from death eternal, looking over heaven's holy battlements and observing a miserable mortal plunging downward to his doom, leaving behind him a streak of fire like a falling star, his face distorted with fear, his every hair erect and singing like a Jew's harp. He asks St. Peter, Who's that? Oh, says the man at the door, that's old John Smith. The Lord goes over to the office of the recording angel and turns the leaves of the great ledger. He finds the name John Smith, number 11,027, and on the credit page, these entries. He was fearless as Caesar, generous as Messenus, tender as Watama, and true to his friends as the stars to their appointed courses. He was a knight of nature's nobility, a lord in the aristocracy of intellect, courtier at home, and a king abroad. On the debit page, he reads, went fishing on Sunday. There was a miscue on his baptism. He knew a pretty woman from an ancient painting, a jackpot from a prayer book, and when smitten on one cheek, he made the smacker think he'd been smuck by a cyclone. Goodbye, John. It may be that the monarch of the majestic universe marches around after every inconsequential little mortal, notebook in hand, giving him a white mark when he prays for the neighbors who poisons his dog, or tells his wife the truth regardless of consequences, a black one when he bets his money on the wrong horse, or sits down on the sidewalk and tries to swipe the front gate as it goes sailing by. But I doubt it. If I could make the sun, moon, and stars in one day, and build a beautiful woman of an old bone, I'd just like to see the color of that man's hair I'd waste much time and attention on. Why should we quarrel about our faiths and declare that this is right and that is wrong, when all religions are, and must of necessity ever be, fundamentally one and the same, the worship of a superior power, the great Father of all, in every age, in every clime adored, by saint, by savage, and by sage, Jehovah, Jove, or Lord. Man's cool assumption that the Almighty made him as his masterpiece should be marked Exhibit A in the mighty aggregation of Gaul, that after millions of years' experience in the creation business, after building the archangels and the devil, after making the man in the moon and performing other wondrous miracles, the straddling six-foot biped who wears spike tail coat and plug hat, a silk surcingle and sooner tie, who parts his name on the side and his hair in the middle, who sucks a cane and simpers like a schoolgirl struggling with her first compliment, who takes it for granted that he knows it all when his whole life, including his birth, marriage, and death, is a piece of ridiculous guesswork, who insists that he has a soul to save, yet labors with might and main to lose it, protests that there's a better land beyond the grave, yet moves heaven and earth to keep from going to it so long as he can help it. The assumption, I say, that this was the best the Creator could do as prima facie evidence of a plentitude of gall of the purest ray serene. The calm assurance of man that the earth and all it contains were made for his especial benefit, that woman was created solely for his comfort, that the sun was made to give him light by day and the moon to enable him to find his way home from the lodge at night without the aid of a policeman. 
that the heavens were hung with a resplendent curtain of stars, and the planets sent whirling through space, in a majestic dance about the god of day, simply to afford him matter for wonder or for amusement when too tired to talk politics or too bilious to drink beer, evinces an egotism that must amuse the Almighty. Masterpiece indeed! Why, God made man, and finding that he couldn't take care of himself, made woman to take care of him, and she proposes to discharge her heaven-ordained duty, or know the reason why. Tennyson says that, as the husband is, the wife is. But even Tennyson didn't know it quite all. When wives take their hubbies for measures of morality, marriage will become an enthusiastic failure, and Satan be loosed for a little season. We acknowledge woman's superiority by demanding that she be better than we could if we would, or would be if we could. We are fond of alluding to woman as the weaker vessel, but she can break the best of us if given an opportunity. Pope calls man the great lord of all things, but Pope never got married. We rule with a rod of iron the creatures of the earth and air and sea. We hurl our withering defy in the face of kings and brave presidential lightning. We found empires and straddle the perilous political issue, then surrender unconditionally to a little bundle of dimples and deviltry, sunshine and extravagance. No man ever followed freedom's flag for patriotism and a pension, with half the enthusiasm that he will trail the red, white, and blue that constitute the banner of female beauty. The monarch's fetters cannot curtail our haughty freedom, nor nature's majestic forces confine us to this little lump of clay. We tread the ocean's foam beneath our feet, harness the thunderbolts of imperial Jove to the jaunting car, and even aspire to mount the storm and walk upon the wind, yet the bravest of us tremble like cowards and lie like cretins when called to account by our wives for some of our cussedness. But you will say that I have wandered from my text, have followed the ladies off and got lost. Well, it's not the first time it's happened, but really I am not so inconsistent as I may seem, for if the gentler sex exceeds us in goodness, it likewise surpasses us in gall. Perhaps the most colossal exhibit of polite and elegant audacity this world can boast is furnished by the female who has made a marriage of convenience, has wedded money instead of a man, practically put her charms up at auction for the highest bidder, yet who poses as a paragon of purity, gathers up her silken skirts, the price of her legalized shame, lest they come in contact with the calico gown of some poor girl who has loved, not wisely, but too well. Marriage is the most sacred institution ever established on earth, making the father, mother, and child a veritable holy trinity, but it is rapidly degenerating into an unclean humbug in which greed is God and gall is recognized high priest. We now consider our fortunes rather than our affections, acquire a husband or wife much as we would a parrot or a poodle, and get rid of them with about as little compunction. Cupid now feathers his arrows from the wings of the gold eagle, and shoots at the stomach instead of the heart. Love without law makes angels blush, but law without love crimson even the brazen brow of infamy. But the fact that so many selfish, soulless marriages are made is not altogether woman's fault. A ridiculous social code is calculated to crush all sentiment and sweetness out of the gentler sex, to make woman regard herself as merchandise rather than as a moral entity entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The average woman must select a husband from a narrow circle, must make choice among two or three admirers, or elect to live a loveless old maid, to forego the joys of motherhood, the happiness of a home. Man is privileged to go forth and seek a mate. The world is before him a veritable dream of fair women. He wanders at will as amid a mighty parterre of flowers, sweet is the breath of morn, and finally, before some fair blossom, he bows the knee, pours forth the incense of his soul to the one woman in all the world he would make his wife. True, she may refuse him and marry some other fellow, but he is at least privileged to approach her, to plead his cause, to imply all the art and eloquence of love, to bring her into his life. Woman enjoys no such privilege. She must wait to be wooed, and if her king comes not, she must take the best that offers and try to be content. Every daughter of Eve dreams of an ideal, of a man tender and true who will fill her life with love's own melody, his words her law, his home her heaven, his honor her glory, and his tomb her grave. And some day, from these castles in the clouds he comes, 
these daydreams, golden as the dawn, become the halo of a mortal man to whom her heart turns as the Helianthus to the sun. At last the god of her adultery doth walk the earth, but she must stand afar, must not, by word or act, betray the holy passion that's consuming her, lest that monster custom of habit's devil doth brand her bold and bad. Love oft-times begets love, as the steel strikes fire from the cold flint, and a word from her might bring him to her feet. But she must stand with dumb lips and assume indifference and see him drift out of her life, leaving it desolate as the Scythian desert, when it should have budded and blossomed like the great blush rose. So she drifts desolate into old maidenhood and the company of Maltese cats. Else, when hope is dead in her heart, when the dream of her youth has become dust and ashes, she marries for money and tries to feed her famished heart with Parisian finery to satisfy her soul with the Dead Sea fruit of fashion. No, I wouldn't give woman the ballot, not in a thousand years. I want no petticoats in politics, no she-senators or female presidents. But I'd do better by woman. I'd repeal that ridiculous social law, survival of female slavery, which compels her to wait to be wooed. I put a hundred leap years in every century, give woman the right to do half the courting, and find a man to her liking and capture him if she could. Talk about reforms. Why, the bachelors would simply have to become Benedicts, or take to the brush, and there'd be no old maids outside the dime museums. But I was speaking of Gaul. Gaul is usually unadulterated impudence, but sometimes it is irredeemably idiocy. When you find a man pluming himself on his ancestors, you can safely set it down that he's got the disease in his latter form, and got it bad. I always feel sorry for a man who's got nothing to be proud of but a dead granddaddy, for it appears to be the law of nature that there should be but one great man to a tribe, that the lightning of genius shall not strike twice the same family tree. I suppose that Cleveland and Jim Corbett, Luther and Mrs. Lease, Homer and J.S. Hogg had parents and grandparents, but we don't hear much about them. And while the ancestors of the truly great are usually lost in the obscurity of the cornfield or cotton patch, their children seldom succeed in setting the world on fire. Talent may be transmitted from father to son, but you can no more inherit genius than you can inherit a fall out of a balloon. It is the direct gift of that God who is no respecter of persons, and who sheds his glory on the cotter's child as freely as on the monarch's and of millionaires. We have in this country three aristocracies. The aristocracy of intellect, founded by the Almighty, the aristocracy of money, founded by Maimon, and the aristocracy of family, founded by fools. The aristocracy of brains differs from those of birth and boodle as stars differ from a jack-o'-lantern, as the music of the spheres from the bray of a burrow, as a woman's first love from the stale affection hashed up for a fourth husband. To the aristocracy of money belong many worthy men, but why should the spirit of mortal be proud? The founder of one of the wealthiest and most exclusive of American families skinned beeves and made wienerwurst. The calling was an honest and useful one. His sausages were said to be excellent, and at a skin game he was exceptionally hard to beat. But his descendants positively declined to put a calf's head regarding and a cleaver rampant on their coat of arms. A relative, much addicted to the genealogical habit, once assured me that he could trace our family back six hundred years just as easy as following the path to the drugstore in a prohibition town. I was delighted to hear it, to learn that I too had ancestors, that some of them were actually on the earth before I was born. While he was tracing, I was figuring. I found that in six hundred years there should be twenty generations, if everybody did his duty, and that in twenty generations a man has... 2,093,056 ancestors. Just think of it. Why, if he'd gone back 600 years farther, he might have discovered that I was a lineal descendant of Adam, perhaps distantly related to crowned monarchs, if not to the Duke of Marlborough. As my cousin couldn't account for the job lot of kinsmen, had no idea how many had been hanged, got into politics, or written poetry, I rang off. Those people who delight to trace their lineage through several generations to some distinguished man should be tapped for the simples. When John Smith starts out to found a family and marries Miss Jones, their son is half Smith and half Jones. The next crop is nearly one-fourth Smith, and at the end of a dozen generations, the young Smiths bear about as much relation to the original as they do to a rabbit. There are various grades of gall, but perhaps 
The superlative brand is that which leads a man to look down with lofty scorn upon those of his fellow mortals who have tripped on life's rugged pathway and plunged into a shoreless sea of shame. I am no apologist for crime. I would not cover its naked hideousness with the Erechine robe of sentiment, but I do believe that many a social outcast, many a branded criminal, will get as sweet a harp in the great hereafter as those who have kept themselves unspotted from the world. It is easy enough to say grace over a good square meal, to be honest on a fat income, to praise God when full of pie. But just wait till you get the same razzle-dazzle the devil dished up for Job and see how your holla hallelujahs hold out before exalting your horn. Victory does not always proclaim the hero, nor virtue the saint. It were easy enough to sail with wind and tide, to float over fair seas mid purple isles of spice. But the captain who loses his ship mid tempest, dire, mid wreck, and wrath, may be a better sailor and a braver than the master who rides safe to port with rigging all intact and every ensign flying. With the boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave. It were easy enough to be a good citizen and a consistent Christian. It is poverty and contempt, suffering and disappointment that try men's souls, that proclaim of what metal they are made. Faith, hope, and charity are man's triune transcendent, and the greatest of these is charity. A Pharisee is either a pious fraud or a hopeless fool. He's either short on gumption or long on gall. Half the alleged honesty of this world is but gall, and must be particularly offensive to the Almighty. We have oodles of men in every community who are legally honest but morally rotten. Legal honesty is the brand usually proclaimed as the best policy. Only fools risk the penitentiary to fill their purse. The smart rogue is ever honest within the law, infamous in strict accord with the criminal code. Davies may attire himself in purple and fine linen, and fare sumptuously every day, while Lazarus lies at his door for the dogs to lick, vainly craving the crumbs that fall from the millionaire's table, and still be legally honest, even a church member in good standing. But his loyalty to legal forms will avail him but little when he finds his coat tails afire and no water within forty miles. The girl who flirts with a featherless young gosling till he doesn't know whether he's floating in a sea of champagne to the sound of celestial music, sliding down a greased rainbow, or riding on the ridge pole of the Aurora Borealis, then tells him that she can only be a kind of Christmas present opera ticket sister to him, who steals his unripe affections and allows him to get frostbitten, carries him into the imperium of puppy love only to drop him with a dull plunk that fills his callow heart with compound fractures. Well, she cannot be prosecuted for petite larceny nor indicted for malicious mischief, but the unfortunate fellow who finally gets her will be glad to go to heaven where there's neither marrying nor giving in marriage. The man who preaches prohibition in public and pays court to a gallon jug of corn juice in private, who damns the saloon at home and sits up with it all night abroad, may not transcend the law of the land, but if his gall should burst the very buzzards would break their necks trying to get out of the country. The druggist who charges a poor dunderhead a dollar for filling a prescription that calls in Latin for a spoonful of salt and an ounce of water may do no violence to the criminal code, but he plays ducks and drakes with the moral law. The little tin horn attorney, whose specialties are divorce cases and libel suits, who stirs up good for noughts to sue publishers for ten thousand dollar damages for ten cent reputations, who's as ready to shield vice from the sword of justice as to defend virtue from stupid violence who's ever for sale to the highest bidder and keeps eloquence on tap for whoever cares to buy, who would rob the orphan of his patrimony on a technicality or brand the Virgin Mary as a bod for to shield a blackmailer. Well, he cannot be put into the penitentiary, more's the pity, but it's some satisfaction to believe that, if in all the great universe of God there is a hell where fiends lie howling, the most sulphurous section is reserved for the infamous shyster, that if he cannot be debarred from the courts of earth, he'll get the bounce from those of heaven. The woman, who inveigles some poor fool, perhaps old enough to be her father, into calling her his tootsie-wootsie over his own signature, then brings suit for breach of promise, or the seventh commandment, who exhibits her broken heart to the judge and jury and demands that it be patched up with Uncle Sam's illuminated anguish plasters, who plays the adventurous, then poses in the public prints as an injured innocent, sends a good reputation to join a banned character in hope of monetary reward, 
Well, she too may be legally honest, but it's just as well to watch her, for no woman worth powder to blow her to perdition ever did or ever will carry such a case into court. When a woman's heart is really hurting her, money is not going to help it. When she's truly sorry for her sin, she tells her troubles to the Lord instead of to policemen and reporters. The man who sues his fellow citizen for alienating his wife's affections instead of striking his tails with a bell-mouthed blunderbuss and a muzzle-loading bulldog, who asks the court to put a silver lining in the cloud of infamy that hangs over his home, who tries to make capital of his shame and heal with golden guineas the hurt that honor feels. Well, he too may be a law-abiding citizen, but ten thousand such souls, if separated from their gall, might play hide-and-seek on the surface of a copper cent for a hundred years and never find each other. Dignity is but a peculiar manifestation of gall. It is the stock and trade of fools. If Almighty God ever put up great dignity and superior intellect in the same package, it must have got misplaced. They are opposing elements, as antagonistic as the doctrines of infinite love and infant damnation. Knowledge makes men humble. True genius is ever modest. The donkey is popularly supposed to be the most stupid animal extant, excepting the dude. He's also the most dignified, since the extinction of the dodo. No pope or president, rich in the world's respect, no prince or potentate, reveling in the pride of sovereign power, no poet or philosopher, bearing his blushing honors, thick upon him ever equaled a blind donkey in impressive dignity. As a man's vision broadens, as he begins to realize what a miserable little microbe he is in that mighty immensity, studded with the stupendous handiwork of a power that transcends his comprehension, his dignity drains off and he feels like asking to be recognized just long enough to apologize for his existence. When I see a little man strut forth in the face of heaven, like a turkey cock on dress parade, forgotten eons behind him, blank time before him, his birth a mystery, his death a leap in the dark. When I see him pose on the grave of forgotten races and puff himself up with pomposity like a frog in the fable. When I see him sprinkled with the dust of fallen dynasties and erecting new altars upon the site of forgotten fanes, yet staggering about under a load of dignity that would spring the knee joints of an archangel, I don't wonder that the Lord once decided to drown the whole layout like a litter of blind puppies. A lecture on Gaul were woefully incomplete without some reference to the press, that Archimedean lever and molder of public opinion. The average newspaper, posing as a public educator, is a specimen of Gaul that cannot be properly analyzed in one evening. Men do not establish newspapers for the express purpose of reforming the world, but rather to print what a large number of people in a particular community want to read and are willing to pay for. A newspaper is simply a mirror in which the community sees itself, not as it should be, but as it actually is. It is not the mother, but the daughter of public opinion. The printing press is a mighty phonograph that echoes back the joy and the sorrow, the glory and the shame of the generation it serves. I have no more quarrel with editors for filling their columns with inanities than casting shadows when they stand in the sun. They know what kind of mental pablum their people crave, and they are no more in business for their health than is the merchant. They know that should they print the grandest sermon that ever fell from Massillon's lips of gold, not twenty percent, even of the professedly pious, would read it, but that a detailed account of a fragrant divorce case or international prize fight will cause ninety-nine percent of the very elect of the Lord to swoop down upon it like a hungry hen-hawk on an unripe gosling and fairly devour it, then roll their eyes to heaven like a calf with a colic and wonder what this wicked old world is coming to. The editor knows that half the people who pretend to be filled to overflowing with the grace of God are only perambulating pillars of pure gall. He knows that the very people who criticize him for printing accounts of crimes and making spreads on sporting events would transfer their patronage to other papers if he heeded their howling, that they are talking for effect through the crown of their felts. Speaking of prize fights, reminds me that a governor who, after winking at a hundred brutal slugging matches, puts his state to the expense of a legislative session to prevent a pair of gladiators pounding each other with soft gloves, is not suffering from lack of gall, that those pious souls who never suspected that pugilism was an insult to our civilization until they got a good opportunity to make a grandstand play, then whereas and resoluted themselves black in the face and meant its brutality, 
should be presented with a medal of pure brass. Politics is said to make strange bedfellows, but I scarce expected to see a shoestring gambler and would-be Don Juan lauded by ministerial associations as our heroic young Christian governor. Gall? Why George Clark presumes to give Bismarck pointers and Congress advice. Nobody knows so well how to manage a husband as an old maid. A bachelor can give the father of a village pointers on the training of boys. Our northern neighbors know exactly how to deal with the nigger. The man who would starve but for the industry of his wife feels competent to manage the finances of the country. People who couldn't be trusted to wean a calf tell us all about the creator of the cosmos. Sam Jones wants to debate with Bob Ingersoll, and every Fork to the Creek economist takes a hard fall out of Henry George. The APA agitators prate loudly of freedom of conscience and insist on disenfranchising the Catholics. We boast of religious liberty, then enact ironclad Sunday laws that compel Jew and pagan to conform to our creed or go to prison. The Proebs want to confine the whole world to cold water because their leader haven't sufficient stamina to stay sober. Men who fail to make a living at honest labor insist on entering the public service. Political parties charge up to each other the adverse decrees of providence. Atheists deny the existence of God because he doesn't move in their set, while ministers assume that a criticism of themselves is an insult to the Creator. But to detain you longer were to give a practical illustration of my text. I will be told that gall is a necessary evil, that a certain amount of audacity of native impudence is necessary to success. I deny it. Fame and wealth and power constitute our ideal of success, folly born of falsehood. Only the useful are successful. Father Damien was the grandest success of the century. Alexander of Macedon, the most miserable failure known to human history, with the possible exception of Grover Cleveland. Alexander employed his genius to conquer the Orient and Cleveland his stupidity to ruin the Orient. The kingdom of the one went to pieces, and the party of the other is now posing as the lost tribe of the political Israel. Success? A ghoul must give up his gold to the grave. The sovereign surrender his scepter. The very gods are, in time, forgotten, are swallowed up in the voiceless, viewless past, hidden by the shadows of the centuries. Why should men strive for fame, that feather in the cap of fools, when nations and peoples perish like the flowers and are forgotten? when even continents fade from the great world's face and the ocean's bed becomes the mountain's brow. Why strive for power that passes like the perfume of the dawn and leaves prince and pauper peers in death? Why should man, made in the mortal image of immortal God, become the subservient slave of greed and barter all of time for a handful of yellow dross to cast upon the threshold of eternity? Poor and content is rich, and rich enough with a roof to shelter those his heart holds dear, and table furnished forth with frugal fare, with manhood's dauntless courage and woman's deathless love, the peasant in his lowly cot may be richer far than the prince in his imperial hall. Success? I would rather be a fox and steal fat geese than a miserly millionaire and prey upon the misfortunes of my fellows. I would rather be a doodlebug burrowing into the dust than a plodding politician trying to inflate a second-term gubernatorial boom with the fetid breath of a fall hypocrisy. I would rather be a peddler of hot peanuts than a president who gives to bond-grabbers and boodlers privilege to despoil the pantries of the poor. I would rather be a louse on the head of a lazar than Lord High Executioner of a theological college that, to preserve its reputation and fill its coffers with filthy lucre, brands an orphan babe as a bawd. I would rather watch the stars shining down through blue immensity and the cool mists creeping round the purple hills than feast my eyes on all the tawdry treasures of Ophir and Ind. I would rather play a cornstalk fiddle while pickaninnies dance than build of widow's sighs and orphan's tears a flimsy bubble of fame to be blown adown the narrow beach of time into eternity's shoreless sea. I would rather be the beggar lord of a lodge in the wilderness, dressed in a suit of sunburn, and live on hominy and hope, yet see the love light blaze unbought in truthful eyes, than to be the marauding emperor of the mighty world, and know not who fawned upon the master, and who esteemed the man. End of section 31
Section 32 of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 32. Blue and Gray. An Address to the Old Veterans. The following is a summary of Mr. Brand's address to the United American Veterans, San Antonio, February 22, 1894. It occurs to me that the time is not an appropriate one for lengthy speeches. This is a love feast, and I have noticed that when people are much in love, they are little inclined to talk. Perhaps I have been called upon because I am a professional peacemaker, an expert harmony promoter. Were I not as meek as Moses and patient as Job, I certainly would weary in well-doing, become discouraged, and give o'er the attempt to inaugurate an era of universal peace and general goodwill. For when I go north, I am denounced by the partisan press as an unreconstructed rebel seeking to rip the federal government up by the roots, and when I come south I am pointed out as a dangerous Yankee importation with the bluest of equators. The Democrats insist that I am a Republican, but that party declines the responsibility. The infidels call me a religious crank, the clergy an atheist, and even the mugwumps regard me with suspicion. But let me tell you right here that whatever I may or may not be, I am an American from the ground up, from Alpha to Omega, world without end. I may be a man without a party and without a creed, but so long as old glory blazes in God's blue firmament, I will never be a man without a country. I can no more imagine a man loving only the north or south half of his country than I can imagine him loving only the right or left side of his wife. If I had to love my country on the installment plan, I'd move out of it. The man who is really a patriot loves his country in a lump. There's room in his heart for every acre of its sunny soil. It's every hill upon which the morning breaks. It's every veil that cradles the evening shadows. It's every stream that laughs back the image of the sun. When a man feels that way, you can safely trust him with an office, and most of us are perfectly willing to be trusted. As an American citizen, I am proud of every man, of whatever section, who, by the nobility of his nature or the majesty of his intellect, has added one jot or tittle to the fame of his fair land, has increased the credit of our common country, has contributed new power to the car of human progress. They are my countrymen, friends and brethren. Are you of the North? Then I claim with you a joint interest in your entire galaxy of intellectual gods. At the shrine of Lincoln's broad humanity, of Webster's matchless power, of the cunning genius of your Menlo wizard, I humbly bow. Are you of the South? Your Jefferson, Jackson, and Lee are mine as well as thine, for they too were Americans, lords in that mighty aristocracy of intellect that has, in four generations, made the new world the wonder of the old with its cumulative greatness of forty centuries. I have watched the progress of the United American Veterans Association with uncommon interest, because it is distinctively a national organization, in which shriveled sectionalism and party prejudice find no place. Its cornerstone is American manhood, its object fraternity, its principles broad as the continent upon which falls the shadow of our flag. Do you know what that association means? Had you thought of its significance? It means that when brave men sheath the sword, the quarrel's done. It means that peace hath its triumphs no less than war. The world's annals furnish forth no parallel to that association whose guests we are tonight. Men have fought ere this and patched up a peace. But where, in all the cycles of human history, have they waged war more relentless than did Rome and Carthage, then without a murmur, accepted the arbitrament of the sword and swung into line, shoulder to shoulder, a band of brothers, one flag, one country, one destiny, and that the highest goal of human endeavor? My attention has been especially attracted to this association, because it is a practical illustration of what I have so often urged in print, that the pitiful sectional prejudices which we see here and there coming to the surface both north and south, that the petty hatreds, which appear to transform some hearts into bitter little pools, 
in which justice perishes and divine reason is quite overthrown, have no lot or part among the soldiers who made the Civil War the grandest event in modern history, one from which the world will mark time for centuries yet to be. I have yet to hear an ex-Federal who met Lee's veterans at the Wilderness or Gettysburg speak disrespectfully of the man who wore the gray. I have yet to hear an ex-Confederate who mixed it with old Pat Thomas at Chickamauga, or Joe Hooker above the clouds, speak disparagingly of those who wore the blue. It is those who stayed at home to sing, We'll hang Jeff Davis on a sour apple tree, and those who damned old Abe Lincoln at long range who were doing all the tremendous fighting now. They didn't get started for the front until after Appomattox. But having once sailed in for slaughter, all Hades can't head him off. If a merciful providence doesn't soon interpose, these mighty postbellum warriors will either break a lung or wreck the majestic world. They are more dreadful in their destructive awfulness than the farmer's two he-goats, that fit and fit until there was nothing left of them but a splotch of blood and two belligerent tails. Those who exchanged compliments at Corinth and Cold Harbor, those who received informal calls from Kilpatrick's cavalry, who, we are told, rode like centaurs and fought like devils, those who saw Grant's intrepid Westerners hurl themselves against Vicksburg's impregnable heights, those who were slammed up against Jackson's stone wall, or picnicked with Johnston's cartridge biters on grape-shot pie and deviled mini-balls, now treat each other with the studied respect which the Kansas farmer paid the cyclone. He felt sure that the Lord was on his side, and that with such help he could more than hold his own. Still, he was in no wise anxious to steer his theory against a condition that was making a million revolutions a minute, and hadn't yet brought up its reserves. In commingling thus in a common brotherhood, those who followed the fortunes of the Confederacy until human fortitude could no further go, and those who, with the sword's keen point, held every gleaming star in old glory's field of blue, are furnishing a commendable example to all our countrymen, to all humanity. It is an echo, nay, an incarnation of those words of Grant, the grandest that ever fell from victorious warriors' lips. Let us have peace. The battlefield was sown long since with kindlier seed than dragon's teeth, has blossomed and borne the fruits of life where death reigned paramount. The flowers of our southern fields are no longer dyed with the blood of the contending brave, but drip with heaven's own dews. The sullen battery has gone silent on our purple hills, and the crash of steel resounds no more amid our pleasant valleys. No longer the northern child waits and watches for the soldier's sire whose lips have felt the touch of God's own hand. No longer the southern woman wanders with bursting heart amid the wreck and wraith of the fierce simoon, brushing the battle grime from cold brows, seeking among the mangled dead for all that life held dear. The curse is past. Let us have peace. The Civil War was a national necessity. It was the fiery furnace in which Almighty God welded the discordant elements of the new world into one homogeneous people. For generations the Puritan hated the Cavalier, and the latter gave back scorn for scorn and added compound interest. This mutual dislike was a rank, infectious weed that first took root across the sea, and ripened into that revolution which sent Charles I to the block, and invested Cromwell with more than regal power. Some of this virus, distilled in stubborn hearts by religious and political intolerance, was carried by the Puritan to Plymouth, and by the Cavalier to the banks of the James, and it survived even the fires of patriotism and the frosts of Valley Forge. Bone of the same bone, and flesh of the same flesh, the religio-political doctrinaires had succeeded in casting our forefathers in different molds, each colossal, masculine, heroic, but radically antagonistic. Together they followed Washington through those eight long years of blood and tears of which human liberty was born. Together they laid broad and deep the foundation of the Republic, and reared thereon that wondrous superstructure which, please God, shall endure forever and together they poured their blood in one unstinted tide upon its sacred shrine. But the Puritan was still a Cromwell, and the Cavalier a lord. 
that people so widely divergent in customs and character could long dwell at peace as one political household were preposterous. The one had his convictions, the other his institutions, and neither would yield the right away. When such opposing trains of thought try to pass on a single track, there's going to be trouble sure. The friction, evident even in the early day of the Republic, grew and gathered fire until the nation burst forth in that mighty conflagration whose pathetic ashes repose in a million sepulchres. It had to come. Let us thank God that the fierce baptism of fire is in the past and not yet to be, that the bitter cup can never be pressed to our children's lips, that never again while the world stands and the heavens endure will Americans meet in battle shock, that never again will our rivers run red with the blood of Columbia's brave, poured forth by her own keen blade, that the last stumbling block hath been removed from our path of progress, that we can now move forward with a giant stride to that high destiny for which the chastening hand of God hath fitted us, the greatest nation and the grandest people in all the mighty tide of time. I rejoice to see the veterans setting the example of reconciliation, for they, more than all others, have most to forgive and forget. I am doubly gratified that the good work should have begun in Texas, which has such cause to entertain the kindliest feeling toward every section of our common country, for each and all contributed to her past glory and present greatness. Among those who cast their lot in Texas, when every step was a challenge to destiny, and every hour was darkened by a danger, who faced unflinchingly the trials of frontier life, and carved out an independent republic with the sword, were men from every state of the American Union. One instance will suffice, though scores might be cited, to illustrate the cosmopolitan character of that band of heroes who made the early history of Texas one of the noblest cantos in the mighty Anglo-Saxon epic. The New Orleans Greys was the first military company to come from the States to the aid of the struggling Texans. It got its first baptism of fire in this city, being a part of that band of three hundred Spartans who followed old Ben Milam to attack General Cause and his fifteen hundred veterans. From the roster of the Greys, I learned that the company numbered but sixty-four men, yet represented sixteen sovereign states and six foreign countries. Think of it. Twenty-five came from north of the Ohio, twenty-four from the southern states, fourteen across far seas to fight for Texas liberty, while one brave lad came from God knows where, but he got there just the same. General Coss never inquired where Milam's men were born. He knew where his own were dying, decided that San Antonio had been overrated as a health resort, and took to the chaparral. As most of those daring spirits who flocked hither to fight for Texas remained, and ever since a steady human tide has poured in from all parts of the Union, and every country of Western Europe, we have become a mixed people, scarce daring to throw a rock in any direction lest we hit our relatives. And the cosmopolitan character of our people, the fact that the Puritan and the Cavalier have blended here as nowhere else, will be found a powerful factor in the attainment of a glorious future. It is particularly appropriate that the blue and the gray should unite in observing the day that marks the birth of Washington, that soldier statesman who marshaled our fathers under one flag, and led them forth to the defense of human liberty. Whatever may have since mischanced, the trials and the triumphs of the Revolution are our common heritage. As the Greeks of old, divided among themselves, united to face a foreign foe, so did the American, north and south, unite beneath the banner of Washington, and hurl down the gauge of battle to Britain's mighty power, and no historian has yet presumed to say which was the better soldier. Washington belongs to no section. He was truly an American, preeminently a patriot. The nobility of his character was his very own. The dazzling splendor of his undying fame is the brightest jewel in Columbia's crown of glory, for it was born of the dauntless valor and nurtured with the priceless blood of a people whom kings could not conquer, nor sophists deceive. A husband and wife, long estranged, met at the grave of their firstborn the child of their youthful strength. Their strife had been bitter, their love had turned to hate, and they elected to tread life's path apart. They stood, one on either side, and looked coldly upon each other. 
Then they looked down upon the little mound that held the broken link with which God had bound their hearts. They knelt and bowed their faces upon the cold sod that covered the sacred dust of their dead. They stretched forth their hands across the little grave, each to the other, and the angel of God washed all the bitterness of the years from their hearts with a rain of penitential tears, and sent them down life's pathway hand in hand, as in the old days, when love was lord of their two lives, and the lost babe was cradled upon its mother's breast. This day the North and the South kneel at the grave of Washington, their best beloved. The estrangement is forgotten. The bitterness of the years passes like an uneasy dream. They reach their hands each to the other across the tomb, and the benediction of God falls upon a reunited people. End of section 32. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 33 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 33, Humbugs and Humbuggery, Part 1 the great american product satan is supposed to have been the original humbug but he's a back number now must feel dreadfully antiquated and useless among so many modern improvements that the american people love to be humbugged long since passed into proverb humbuggery may be called our national vice our besetting sin like liberty it appears to be in the very air we breathe and we take to it as naturally as we go into politics our entire social system has become saturated with it it is the mainspring of many acts we loudly praise the lodestar of men we apotheosize is oft times the warp and woof even of the mantle of charity which like a well-filled purse or a tariff compromise covers a multitude of sins there are various kinds and classes of humbugs but reduced to the last analysis stripped of the sugar coating by which they impose on the public they are one and all simply professors of falsehood i am sometimes inclined to the view that humbuggery is a disease and that some doctor will yet discover a gold cure for it will demonstrate that the bad habit is due to microbes that get into a man's mind and make trouble trying to turn around or to bacilli that bore holes in his moral character and let his honesty leak out for the medical fraternity has gravely informed us that kleptomania sneak theory by eminently respectable people and dipsomia sottishness by the social salt of the earth are simply diseases that should be treated with pills and powders instead of with penitentiaries and whipping posts now if a man will steal a sawmill and go back after the sight simply because his pericardium is out of plumb or his liver has gone into politics will nurse a juicy old jag until it develops into a combined museum and menagerie because his circulation has slipped an eccentric or his stomach has got out of its natural orbit i submit in all seriousness that he might be physically incapacitated for telling the truth by an insidious attack on his veracity by the dreadful falsehood fungi and that the best way to restore his moral equilibrium to remove him from the category of chronic humbugs would be to fumigate him the lord once attempted to check the humbug habit by striking liars dead but soon saw that such a plan would prove more fatal than a second flood that there wouldn't be even a noah's ark picnic of us left and reluctantly relinquished it science has not yet succeeded in mastering the disease but just give it time and it will save the world yet we'll find a medical name for every human frailty 
will be able to tell by looking at a man's tongue whether he's coming down with the mugwa malaria or the office holding hysteria and do something for him before it's everlastingly too late the very best people have a touch of the complaint the trail of the serpent is over us all even our young ladies are said to be to a certain extent humbugs i have been told that many of them wear patent complexions barton bangs and pad out scrawny forms until they appear voluptuous junos and thereby deceive ensnare bedazzle and beguile the unsuspecting sons of men i have been told that many of them who are soft-voiced angels before marriage can give a rusty buzz-saw cards and spades and beat it blind after they succeeded in landing the confiding sucker but perhaps such tales are only the bitter complainings of miserable benedicts who have been soundly beaten at their own game of humbuggery marriage is perhaps the only game of chance ever invented at which it is possible for both players to lose too often after much sugar-coated deception and many premeditated misdeals on both sides one draws a blank and the other a booby after patient angling in the matrimonial pool one lands a stingaree and the other a bullhead one expects to capture a demigod who hits the earth only in high places the other to wed a wingless angel who will make his edenic bower one long-drawn sigh of ecstatic bliss the result is that one is tied up to a slattern who slouches around the house with her hair on tins in a dirty collar and with a dime novel a temper like aquafortis and a voice like a catfight the other a hoodlum who comes home from the lodge at two a m and whoops in the house for her to come down and help him hunt for the keyhole and is then snailed in by a policeman before she can frame a curtain lecture or find a rolling pin false pride is the father of humbuggery the parent of fraud we are humbugs because we desire that our fellows think us better braver brighter and perhaps richer than we really are we practice humbuggery to attain social position to which we are entitled by neither birth nor brains to acquire wealth for which we render no equivalent to procure power we cannot wisely employ while proclaiming love of democracy we purchase peers for our daughters while boasting liberty of speech we assail like demons those who presume to dissent from our opinions in either religion or politics history is full of humbugs and liberty itself oft times but a gilded lie no man is really free who is dependent upon the good will of others for employment there can be no true liberty where prejudice usurps the throne of reason men are slaves instead of sovereign when they suffer themselves to be held in iron thrall by a political dogma or religious creed blindly accepting the ipsy dixy of things instead of exercising to the utmost the intelligence which god has given them i have said that charity itself is oft times a humbug it is so when it becomes the handmaid of ostentation instead of the true almoner of the heart or when men give to the poor only because it is lending to the lord and then expect compound interest that philanthropist is a fraud who after piling up a colossal fortune at the expense of common people leaves it to found an educational or eleemosynary institute when death calls him across the dark river knowing that charon's boat is purely a passenger packet that carries no freight however precious he drops his dollars with a sigh but determined to reap some benefit from his boodle his itching hand can no longer hold he decrees that it is to be used to found some charitable fake to prevent himself being forgotten some pitiful institute where a few of the wretched victims of his rapacious greed may get a plate of starvation soup or a prayer-book and bless their benefactor's name 
the very monument erected over bones of the sanctimonious old skinflint is a fraud flaunt a string of colossal falsehoods in the face of the world piously points to heaven perhaps to indicate that satan refused to receive him and sent him back to st peter with a request that he make other arrangements many of the martyrs whose memory we revere of the saints we apotheosize of the heroes we enshrine in history are one-third fraud and two-thirds fake the man who can grow in grace while his pet corns in chancery or lose an election without spilling his moral character who can wait an hour for his dinner without walking all over the nerves of his wife or crawl out of bed in the middle of his first nap and rustle till the cold gray dawn with a brace of colicky kids without broadly insinuating that he was a copper riveted nickel plated automatic double cylinder idiot to ever get married is a greater hero than he that taketh the city the place to take the true measure of a man is not the market-place or the amen corner not the forum or the field but at his fireside there he lays aside his mask and you may learn whether he's imp or angel king or cur hero or humbug i care not what the world says of him whether it crown him with bays or pelt him with bad eggs i care never a copper what his reputation or religion may be if his babes dread his homecoming and his better half swallows her heart every time she has to ask him for a five-dollar bill he's a fraud of the first water even though he prays night and morn till he's black in the face and howls hallelujah till he shakes the eternal hills but if his children rush to the front gate to meet him and love's own sunshine illumes the face of his wife when she hears his footfall you can take it for granted that he's true gold for his home's a heaven and the humbug never gets that near to the great white throne of god he may be a rank atheist and a red flag anarchist a mormon or a mugwump he may buy votes in blocks of five and bet on the election he may deal em from the bottom of the deck and drink beer till he can't tell a silver dollar from a circular saw and still be an infinitely better man than the cowardly little humbug who's all suavity and society but who makes his home a hell who vents upon the hapless heads of wife and children the ill nature he would like to inflict on his fellow man but dares not i can forgive much in that fellow mortal who would rather make men swear than women weep who would rather have the hate of the whole he world than the contempt of his wife who would rather call anger to the eyes of a king than fear to the face of a child the hero is not he that strives with the world for witness who seeks the bubble fame at the cannon's brazen lip and risk his life that he may live forever think not that helm and harness are signs of valor true peace hath higher test of manhood than battles ever knew to bear with becoming grace the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to find our heaven in others happiness and for their sake to sacrifice and suffer wrongs that might be righted with a thread of steel to live an honest life in a land where truth doth feed on crusts while falsehood fattens on lucullan feasts requires more true manhood more moral stamina more unadulterated sand than to follow a flag into the very jaws of hell or die for the faith in the auto de fe heroes why unearn the ashes of the half-forgotten dead and pour o'er the musty pages of the past for names to glorify if you would find heroes grander martyrs more noble and saints of more sanctity than rubens ever painted or immortal homer sang 
who without Achilles' armor have slain an hundred hectares, without Samsonian locks have torn the lion, without the sword of Michael have thrown down the gauge to all the embattled host of hell, seek not the musty tomes of history, but in the hearts and homes of the self-sacrificing wives and mothers of this great world. God could not be everywhere, says the proverb, therefore he made mothers let the heroes of history have their due still i imagine the world would have been much the same had alexander died of cholera infantum or grown up a harmless dude i don't think the earth unbalanced would from its orbit fly had caesar been drowned in the rubicon or cleveland never born i imagine that greece would have humble the Persian pride, and there had been no Thermopylae, that Rome would have ruled the world had Scivola's good right hand not hissed in the Tuscan fire. It is even possible that civilization would have stood the shocks had Lanky Bob and Gentleman Jim met on Texas soil. Let the second boom of our heroic young Christian governor would have lost no gas one catfish does not make a creek nor one hero a nation the waves do not make the sea but the sea furnishes forth the waves leonidas were lost to history but for the three hundred nameless braves who backed his bluff had there been but one cromwell charles i would have kept his head in washington's deathless splendor gleams the glory of forgotten millions and the history of bonaparte is written with blood of the unknown brave humbuggery fraud deception everywhere all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players momus the major domo the millions unmask even friendship is becoming a screaming farce intended to promote the social fortune or fill the purse. We fawn that thrift may follow, are prodigal of sweet words because they cost nothing, and swell the sales of many a rich argosy. But weigh every penny we put forth, and carefully calculate the chance of gain or loss. It's head I win, tails you lose, and when we cannot play it on that principle, we promptly jump the game. Who steals my purse steals trash. That's Shakespeare. He that filches from me my good name makes me poor indeed. That's nonsense. Reputation is but the ephemeral dew on character's everlasting gold. But he that steals a human heart and tramples it beneath his brutal heel he that feigns a friendship he does not feel he that fawns upon his fellows and hugs them hard and after scandals them is the foulest fraud in all this land of fakes the most hideous humbug in all hell's unclean hierarchy i am sometimes tempted to believe that the only friendship that will stand fire is that of a yellow dog for a pauper negro strike a friend for a small loan and his affection grows suddenly cold lose your fortune and your sweetheart sends you word that she will be a sister to you your brother will betray you for boodle your father fights you for a foolish flag and your heirs-in-law will dance when they hear of your death but the devotion of a yaller dog for a worthless nigger hath all seasons for its own. But the humbug for whom I have the least use is the man who assiduously damns the rum demon, makes tearful temperance talks, ostentatiously votes the prohibition ticket, groans like a sick calf hit by a battering ram whenever he sees a young man come out of a barroom, then sneaks up a dirty alley crawls through the side door of a second-class saloon, calls for the cheapest whiskey in the shop, runs the glass over trying to get the worth of his money, pours it down at a gulp, 
and scoots in a hurry lest somebody ask him to treat. Who has a chronic toothache in the stomach, which nothing but drugstore whiskey can relieve? Who keeps a jug of dollar-a-gallon bug juice hid under his bed, and sneaks to it like a thieving hyena, digging up a dead nigger? Rents his property for saloon purposes, then piously prays to the Lord to protect the young from temptation. But perhaps the prince of humbugs, the incarnation of fraud, the apotheosis of audacity, is the street-corner politician. He towers above his fellow fakes like Saul above his brethren. I have been time and again instructed in the most intricate problems of public polity, questions that have perplexed the wisest statesmen of the world by men who had never read a single standard work on political economy and who could not tell to save their souls granting that they possess such a perishable property whether adam smith wrote the wealth of nations or the lord's prayer who are not familiar with the constitution of their own state or the face of a receipted wash-bill who could scarce tell a sloop from a ship bill of lading from a slight draught, a hydraulic ram from a he-goat, unless they were properly labeled. Yet no question can arise in metaphysics or morals, government or generalship, upon which these great little men do not presume to speak with the authoritative assurance of a Lord Chief Justice, or a six-foot woman addressing a four-foot husband. They invariably know it all. They could teach Solomon and the seven wise men wisdom, and had they been on earth when Almighty God wrote the Ten Commandments, they would have moved an amendment or drafted a minority report. And these are the fellows who frame our political platforms and dominate our election, whose boundless cupidity, colossal ignorance, and supernal gall bring about starvation in a land of plenty, divide the most industrious and progressive people that ever graced the footstool of Almighty God into bloated billionaires and groveling mendicants. Even patriotism has become a humbug, has been supplanted by partisanship, and now all are for party and none are for the state. On July 4th, we shout for the old flag, and all the rest of the year we clamor for an appropriation. The man who is kicked by a nightmare while dreaming of the draft demands a pension, and every burning patriot wants an office. Twice, yea, thrice, within the memory of men now living, America has been on the very verge of an industrial revolution, a reign of terror, Yet we continue to hang our second providence on a job lot of political jacksnipes who carry their patriotism in their pockets and their sense under their surcingles, while we who feed three times a day, who have a cocktail every morning and a clean shirt occasionally, are boasting of our allegiance to the grand old party, or prating of the principles of Jeffersonian democracy, our blindly trailing in the wake of some partisan bandwagon like a brindle calf behind a Kansas hay-cart. This nation, born of our father's blood and sanctified by our mother's tears, is dominated by political self-seekers who have taken for their motto, After us the deluge. Once, after holding forth at some length on humbugs, a physician said to me, Ah, uh, you, uh, uh, didn't mention the medical profession. No, I replied, the power of language hath its limits. The medical, mark you, is the noblest of all professions. It contains many learned and able men who devote their lives unselfishly to the amelioration of human misery. But I much doubt whether one half of the M.D.s now sending people to the drug stores with cipher dispatches could tell what was the matter with a suffering mortal were he transparent as glass and lit up by electricity. 
There are doctors doping people with powerful drugs who couldn't tell whether a patient had a case of cholera morbus or was afflicted with an incurable itch for office, who would have acquired their medical information from the almanacs and could not distinguish between a bunion and a stone bruise, or find the joints and a string of sausage with a search warrant. I have noticed that when the doctors took to writing their prescriptions in Latin, it quickly became a dead language. That when I take the poet's advice and throw physic to the dogs, their numbers rapidly decrease. But the doctors are jolly good fellows. Let it be recorded to their eternal credit that, whatever may be their faults, precious few of them will practice in their own families. I have often wished that I was a doctor of medicine instead of a doctor of divinity. There are several fellows from whom I like to prescribe. There is a strong affinity between the two professions. The D.D.'s deal in faith and prayer, the M.D.'s in faith and pills. I have been frequently asked why, in lecturing on humbugs, I skip the lawyers. There are some subjects to which a lecture must lead up gradually. So I discuss the doctors in my discourse on humbugs and save the attorneys for my talk on gall. Even our boasted educational system is half a humbug. Too many of our professors fondly imagine that when they have crammed the dry formulas of half a dozen scientists into a small head, perhaps designed by the deity to furnish the directive wisdom for a scavenger cart? When they have taught a two-legged moon-calf to glibly read in certain dead languages, things it can in no wise comprehend, patiently pupped into it whole congeries of things that defy its mental digestive apparatus, that it is actually educated, if not enlightened? And perhaps it is, after the manner of the trick mule or the pig that plays cards. The attempt of Gulliver scientists to calcine ice into gunpowder were not more ridiculous than trying to transform a fool into a philosopher by the alchemy of education. If it be a waste of lather to shave an ass, what must it be to educate an idiot? True education consists in acquirement of useful information, yet I have seen college graduates, even men sporting professional sheepskins, who couldn't tell whether Gladstone's an English statesman or an Irish policeman. They knew all about Greek roots, but couldn't tell a carrot from a parsnip. They could decipher a cuneiform inscription, perhaps, and state whether a pebble belonged to the Paleozoic or some other period but couldn't tell a subpoena from a search warrant, a box of vermicelli from a bundle of fish worms. We pore over books too much and reflect too little, depend too much on others, too little upon ourselves. Make of our heads cold storage warehouses for other people's ideas instead of standing up in our own independent godlike individuality. Bacon says that reading makes a full man. Perhaps so, but it makes a great deal of difference what a fellow's full of. Too many who fondly imagine themselves educated much resemble Mark Twain's frog with a stomach full of shot. They are crushed to earth by the things they have swallowed. Neither the public nor any other school system has ever produced one really great man. Those who occupy the dais throne among the immortals contended single-handedly with the darkness of ignorance and the devil of dogmatism. Columbus scorned the schools and discovered a world. Napoleon revolutionized the science of war and himself master of Europe. Bismarck mocked at precedent and united Germany stood forth a giant. Jesus of Nazareth ignored the learning of the Levites, and around the world arose the fanes of a new faith. A reading is the nurse of culture. 
reflection the mother of genius. Our great religions were born in the desert. Our grandest philosophers budded and burgeoned in the wilderness. The noblest poesy that ever swept the human harpsichord was born in the brains of a beggar, come bubbling from the heart of the blind. And when all the magi of the Medes and all the great philosophers of Greece had failed to furnish forth a jurisprudence just to all, semi-barbarous Rome laid down those laws by which even from the grave of her glory she still rules the majestic world. I have been accused of being the enemy of education, but then I have been accused of almost everything. So one count, more or less, in the indictment doesn't matter. I am not opposed to education that is useful, but why should we pay people to fill the empty heads of fools with soap and sawdust? I've also said, perhaps the most aggressive fraud that infects the earth is the professional atheist, the man whose chief mental stock in trade consists of doubt and denial of revealed religion, so-called. About the time a youngster first feels an irresistible impulse to make a fool of himself wherever a female smiles on him, when he's reached that critical stage in life's journey when he imagined that he knows much more than his father, he began to doubt the religion of his mother. Shrewdly asked his Sunday school teacher, Who made God? Demonstrates by the age of natural history diagrams that a large whale could in no wise swallow a small prophet, that if he did succeed in relegating him to its internal economy, it were impossible for him to slosh around for three days and nights in the gastric juices without becoming much the worse for wear. He attempts to rip religion up by the roots and reform the world while you wait, but soon learns that he's got a government contract on his hands, that the man who can drive the deity out of the hearts and homes of this land can make a fortune turning artesian wells inside out and peddling them for telegraph poles. You can't do it, son. Religion is the backbone of the body social. Sometimes it's unbending as a boarding-house biscuit, and sometimes it's a bad quality of gutta percha, but we couldn't get far without it. Most youths have to pass through a period of doubt and denial, catch the infidel humor just as they do the measles and the mumps, but they eventually learn that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There was never an atheistical book written. There was never an infidel argument pinned that touched the core of any religion, Christian or pagan. Bibles, Korans, Zandervestas, all sacred books are but the feeble efforts of finite man to interpret the infinite, to speak forth the unspeakable, to reduce to intelligible human characters the flame-written hieroglyphs of the sky. Who made God? Suppose, Mr. Atheist, that I find thee an answer. Who will furnish thee with an intellect to understand it? How will you comprehend the genesis of a God when the wisest man for whom Christ died cannot tell why water runs downhill instead of up? cannot understand the basic principle of the law of gravitation, cannot even guess why Governor Culberson encouraged the managers of Corbett and Fitzsimmons to bring the mill to Texas, then knocked it out at a special session of the legislature at the expense of the general public. An atheist once solemnly assured me that he couldn't possibly believe anything which he couldn't prove. But when I asked him what led him to make such a lively interest in the welfare of his wife's children, he became almost as angry as a Calvinist, whose confession of faith had been called into question. Figure up how many things you can prove of those you believe, and you will find you have got to do a credit business or go into intellectual bankruptcy. 
but the man who denies the existence of the deity because he cannot comprehend his origin is even less a humbug than the one who knows all about him the pitiful dogmatizer who devotes his life to the defense of some poor little guesswork interpretation of the mysterious plants of him who brings forth Mazaroth in his season and guides arcturus with his sons dogmatism is the fecund mother of doubt a manacle on the human mind a brake on the golden wheel of christian progress and every dogmatizer whether in science politics or religion is consciously or unconsciously a humbug you know do you you know what and who told you why the man in whose mighty intellect was stored the world's wisdom whose words have come down to us from the distant past as oracles or shadowing even solomon and shakespeare wasn't quite sure of his own existence men frequently tell me that what they see they know well they've got to drink mighty little prohibition whiskey if they do otherwise they're liable to see things they'll need an introduction to the wisest is he who knows only that he knows nothing omniscient god only knows we you and i are only troubled with morbid little ideas sired by circumstance and damned by folly we don't even know how the democracy stands on the sober question or what caused the slump in the late election end of section thirty three Section 34 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 34 humbugs and humbuggery part two the average human head like an egg or a crock of clabber absorbs the flavor of its surroundings it is chiefly a question of environment whether we grow up to be catholics or protestants republicans or democrats populists or political nondescripts and yet we adhere to opinions we have inherited with all the tenacity of a dog to a bone or an american miser to a ten dollar bill we assume that our faith political and our creed religious are founded upon our reason when they were really made for us by social conditions over which we had little control we even succeeded in humbugging ourselves into the belief that we are the people and that wisdom will die with us when the fact is that our head is loaded with out-of-date lumber our every idea moulded or modified by barbarians who were in the boneyard before methuselah was born society is a vast organism in which the individual is but an atom it is a monstrous tree a veritable yggdrasil penetrating both the region of darkness and the realm of light whatever its peculiarities whether monarchical or republican christian or pagan it is a goodly tree when it brings forth good fruit when its boughs bend with apples of hesperides and in its grateful shade is reared the shrine of god be of what shape it may it is an evil tree when its fruits as apples of sodom and it casts a upas shadow upon the earth if we cannot gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles how can a society that is essentially false foster that which is literally true the body social of which we proudly boast is producing dodos instead of king david's peanut politicians instead of heaven-inspired poets cranks instead of crusaders humbugs rather than heroes instead of exercising in the campus martius our sons cultivate the english hawksant and the london lope 
In the golden days, the glory of the young man was his strength. Now it is his chrysanthemum and his collar. And it is going from bad to worse in a ratio of geometrical progression. For how can effeminate men, a cane-sucking, primping, mincing, affected conglomeration of masculine inanity and asininity beget world compellers how can women who care much what is on the outside and little what is on the inside of their heads and whom a box of lily white a french novel a poodle dog and another dude will make superlatively happy suckle aught but fops and fools yet we boast of progress progress whither from the savage who knew nothing to the dude who knows less from the barbarian who's plundered your baggage to the civilized shylock who would steal the very earth from under your feet from that state wherein american sovereigns however poor consider themselves the equals of kings and the superiors of princes to that moral degradation and national decay in which they purchase the scurvy spawn of petty dukes as husbands for our daughters by the splendour of god i'd rather be a naked fiji islander dancing about a broiled missionary with a bull ring in my nose than a simpering society simpleton wearing my little intellectual apparatus to a frazzle with a study of neckties some of my critics have kindly suggested that the lord made a great mistake in not consulting me when he made the world thereby ascertaining just how i would like to have it i was not consulted and at the creation of the cosmos and perhaps it is just as well for them that i wasn't they might not be here too many forget that while the lord made the world the devil has been busy ever since putting on the finishing touches why he began on the first woman before she was a week old and he has been playing schoolmaster to her sons ever since i confess to a sneaking respect for satan for he is preeminently a success in his chosen profession he's playing a desperate game against omnipotent power and is more than holding his own he's set into the game with a cash capital of one snake now he's got half the globe grabbed and an option on the other half i have been called a defender of the devil but i hope that won't prejudice the ladies against me as it was a woman that discovered him i confess to the belief that satan is a gentleman compared with some of his very humble servants we are told that he is a fallen angel who found pride a stumbling block that he tripped over it and plunged down to infinite despair but though he fell farther than a pigeon could fly in a week the world is full of frauds who could not climb up to his level in a month who can no more claim kinship with him in their cussedness than a thieving hyena can say to the royal beast of bengal thou art my brother they are not fallen angels they are risen vermin they didn't come down from thrones in heaven like falling stars they crawled up from holes in the earth like vicious little pismires what can proud lucifer have in common with the craven hypocrite who prays with his lips while plotting petty larceny in his heart imagine the lord of the lower world seeking the microscopic souls of men who badger browbeat and bully rag their better halves for spending a dollar for a new calico dress then blow in a dozen times as much with the dice box in a bar-room trying to beat some other long-eared burrow out of a thimbleful of bug juice or a schooner of beer i don't believe satan wants him i think if they dodged the quarantine officers and got in amongst those erstwhile angels now peopling the dark regions of the damned the doctors of that black abode would decide that they were cholera microbes or itch bacilli and order the place fumigated End of section thirty four Section 35 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast 
Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 12, Section 35. Humbugs and Humbuggery, Part 3. But speaking of the devil, were any of you ever in love? I'm talking about the sure enough old-fashioned complaint that makes a man miss meals and lose sleep, write spring poetry, and misplace his appetite for plug tobacco. Not of the new-fangled varioloid that yields to matrimonial treatment. There's a great deal of sugar-coated humbuggery about this thing we call love. It reminds me of the sulphur and molasses my careful Presbyterian parents used to pour into me in the gentle springtime. I don't remember why they gave it to me, but it was probably because they didn't want it themselves. Perhaps they thought foreordination hadn't done much for me, and they had best get me used to sulphur gradually. I remember, however, that, like the average case of matrimony, it usually contained a good deal more sulphur than syrup. Matches, we are told, are made in heaven, and I think it likely, for Satan himself is said to have originated there. I'll tell you how matches are usually made. By some horrible accident, John Henry and Sarah Jane become acquainted. They have no more affinity than a practical politician and pure spring water but they dance and flirt, fool around the front gate in the dark of the moon, sigh and talk nonsense. John Henry begins to take things for his breath and Sarah Jane for her complexion. The young goslings get wanted to each other, and first thing you know, they're tied up until death or divorce doth them part. And had they missed each other altogether, they would have been just as well, perhaps better, content with other mates, and made as enthusiastic a failure of married life. Most people marry without really knowing whether they are in love or not. Mistake the gregarious habit for the mystic fire of Hyman's torch, the pangs of a bad digestion for the barbed arrows of the love-god's bow. But when a couple's really got what ailed Romeo and Juliet, there is no more doubt about it than was the man after he sat down to the circular saw to see if it was running, and found it the sole proprietor of a South American revolution. They don't have to send their feelings to a chemist for analysis and classification, nor take an invoice of their affections to see if any have got away. Love is really a very serious thing. Like seasickness, everybody laughs at it, but those who have got it. When Cupid lets slip a sure enough shaft, it goes through a fellow's heart like a Kansas cyclone through a colored camp meeting, and all the powers of Hades can never head it off. Love is the most sacred word ever framed by celestial lips. It's the law of life, the harmony of heaven, the breath of which the universe was born, the divine essence in create of the ever-living God. But love is, like all other sweet things, unless you get the very best brand, it sours awful easy. Of all the pitiful humbugs beneath high heaven, commend me to those intellectual doodlebugs who have become dame fashion's devotees and devote all their intellectuality to the science of dress, to the art of being miserable a la mode. Thousands are today sailing about in silk hats who are guiltless of undershirts, bedecked with diamonds while in debt to the butcher for the meat on their bones. Families, they can scarce afford calico, flaunt Parisian finery, keep costly carriages while there's a chronic hiatus in their cupboard, go hungry to bed six nights a week that on the seventh they may spread a brave feast for fashionable fools. God, have mercy on all such mutton-heads. They are the natural breeders of good-for-noughts, for in such an atmosphere children grow up mentally dwarfed and morally debased. 
fashionable mothers commit their children to the care of serving maids while they sail out to soirees and receptions put their babes on a bottle while they swing around the social circle no wonder their sons grow up sapheads as destitute of backbone as a banana as deficient in moral force as a firkin of fish think of an infant napoleon nursing a rubber nozzle of rearing a brutus on patent baby food of bringing a hannibal up by hand he can't do it why if i had a woman of that kind to wife a fashionable butterfly whose heart was in her finery and her feathers who neglected her home to train with a lot of intellectual tomtits whose glory was small talk who saved her sweetest smiles for society and her ill temper for the family altar i say were i tied to that kind of female do you know what i do eh you don't well neither do i there are some humbugs however who merit our respect if not our reverence men who are infinitely better than they would have the world believe as the purest pearl is encased in an unseemly shell so too is many a godlike soul enshrined in a breast of seeming adamant many a man swears because he's too proud to weep hides a quivering soul behind the cynic's sneer fronts the world like a savage beast at bay whilst his heart's a fathomless lake of tears tennyson tells us of a monstrous figure of complete steel and armed cap a pie that guarded a castle gate and by its awful name and warlike mien affrighted the fearful souls of men but one day a dauntless knight unhorsed it and clove through the massy helm when forth from the wreck there came not a demon armed with the scythe of death but a beardless boy scarce old enough to break a pointless lance upon the village green so too with the sort of excalibur of human sympathy you shear down through the helm and harness of some rough-spoken man who seems to hate all humankind you find the soul of a woman in the heart of a little child even our religion is oft-times a humbug else why is it not the good christian woman who says her prayer as regularly as she looks under the bed for burglars says to the caller from whom she cordially detests i am delighted to see you when she's wondering why the meddlesome old gadabout don't stay at home when she's not wanted elsewhere why is it that when a good brother puts a five-dollar bill in the contribution box he flashes it up so all may see the figures but when he drops a nickel in the slot to get a little grace he lets not his right hand know what his left hand doeth why is it that when you strike a devout deacon for the loan of ten dollars he'll swear by all the gods he hasn't got it when his pockets are fairly bursting with bills if his religion is not hypocrisy if he is not a humbug why doesn't he tell you in plain united states that he would rather have uncle sam's promise to pay than yours oh people are becoming such incorrigible liars that i've about quit trying to borrow money too many people presume that they are full of the grace of god when they're only bilious and that they are pious because they dislike to see other people enjoy themselves that they are christians because they conform to certain creeds just as many men imagine themselves honest because they obey the laws of the land for the purpose of keeping out of the penitentiary they put up long prayers on sunday that's piety they bamboozle a green gosling out of his birthright on monday that's business they have one face with which to confront the lord and another with which to beguile their brethren they even acquire two voices a brisk business accent and a sunday whine that would make a cub wolf climb a tree i am always suspicious of a man's piety when it makes him look as though he had cut a throat or scuttled a ship and was praying for a commutation of the death sentence i would never understand why a man 
who can read his title clear to mansions in the skies? Who holds a lien on a quarter lot in the New Jerusalem? Should allow that fact to hurt him. I have great respect for true religion. But for the brand of holiness that's put on with the Sunday shirt, that makes a man cry amen with unction, but doesn't prevent him selling five and ten cent cigars out of the same box, oleo margarine and creamery butter out of the same bucket, benzene and bourbon whiskey out of the same barrel, which makes long prayers on Sunday and gives short waits on Monday, which worries over the welfare of good-looking young women, but gives the old grandams the go-by which fathers the orphan only if he's rich, and husbands the widow only if she is handsome. For that kind of Christianity I have no more use than for a mugwump governor who saddles his state with the expense of a legislative session to gratify a private grudge against a brother gambler. That religion which sits up at nights to agonize because a few naked niggers in equatorial Africa never heard eve's snake story how job scratched himself with a broken pie plate or the hog happened to be so full of the spirit of hades that robs childhood of its pennies to send prayer books to people whose redemption should begin with a bath while in our own country every town from cataraugus to kalamazoo every city from the arctic ocean to the austral sea is over one with heathen who know naught of the grace of God or the mystery of a square meal, who prowl in the very shadow of our temples of justice, build their lairs in proximity to our public schools and within sound of the collect of our churches, is an arrogant humbug, a crime against man, an offense to God, a curse to the world. End of section 35Part four of four. People frequently say to me, quote, Brian, your attacks are too harsh. You should use more persuasion and less pison. Perhaps so, but I have not yet mastered the esoteric of choking a bad dog to death with good butter. Persuasion is well enough if you're a courtin or in the hands of the vigilantes, but turning that loose on the average fraud were too much like a tenderfoot trying to move string of freight steers with moral suasion. He takes up his whip, gently snaps it as though he feared it were loaded, and talks to his cattle like a Boston philanthropist to poor relation. The steers look round at him, wonder in a vague way if he's worth eating and stand at ease an old freighter who's been over the divide and got his profanity down to a fine art grabs that goad cracks it like a rifled cannon reaching for a raw recruit and spells a string of cuss words calculated to precipitate the final conflagration you expect to see him struck dead but those steers don't they're firmly persuaded that he's going to outlive them if they don't get down in Paul Gravel, and they get a Nancy Hanks hustle on them. Never attempt to move an ox team with moral suasion, or to drown the cohorts of the devil in the milk of human kindness. It won't work. Oh, it's possible that you may disagree with me on some minor points of doctrine. That's your blessed privilege, and I wouldn't deprive you of it if I had the power. A pompous old fellow once called at the office of my religious monthly to inform me that I was radically wrong on every possible public question. 
He seemed to think that I had committed an unpardonable crime in daring to differ from him. I asked him to be seated and whistle for the devil, the printer's devil, the only kind we keep in the office of the iconoclast. I told him to procure for me a six-shooter, a sledgehammer, and a boat. My visitor became greatly alarmed. What are you going to do? Do, I replied. I'm going to shoot the printers, lash the press, and throw the type into the river. What the name of the great Sanhedrin is the use of me printing a paper if I can't please you? Mr. Pomposity subsided somewhat, and I proceeded to talk United States to him. You say I'm wrong? Perhaps I am. But how in Halifax, I think I said Halifax, anyhow, we'll let it go at that. How in Halifax did you find out? Who installed you as infallible Pope in the realm of intellect and declared it rank folly to run counter to the ideas that roost in your nice fat head? He was one of those egotistical mental microbes or intellectual animalculi who imagined that a man must be in the wrong if he disagrees with him. And the woods are so full of that class of fellows that the fool killer has become discouraged and jumped his job. Those who chance to think alike get together and form a political party, a society or a sect, and take it for granted that they've got all the wisdom of the world grabbed, that beyond their little Rhode Island of intellect are only gibbering idiots and plotting knaves. When a man fears to subject his faith to the crucible of controversy, when he declines to submit his ideas to the ballistae and battering rams of cold logic, you can safely set it down that he's either a hopeless cabbage head or a hypercritical humbug, that he's a fool or a fraud, is full of buncombe or bile. It is difference of opinion that keeps the world from going to the dogs, independence of thought, doubt of accepted dogmas, the spirit of inquiry. The desire to know is the mighty lever that has lifted man so far above the brute level that he has begun to claim kinship with the Creator. Yet we say to our brother, Thou fool, because he takes issues with us on the tariff for the proper time in the moon to plant post holes, even insist on sending people to perdition who cannot see the plan of salvation through our little sectarian telescope men of a mind flock together just like so many gabbling geese or other foolish fowl of a feather each group waddling in the wake of some fat-headed old gander squawking when he squawks and fluttering when he flies because i decline to get in among the goslings and be piloted about the intellectual goose pond i'm told that i have no policy well, I hope I haven't. If I thought I had, I'd take something for it, don't you know? When I cannot live among my fellows without surrendering my independence, forswearing freedom of speech and liberty of thought, without having to play the canting hypocrite or go hungry, to fawn like a flea-bitten feist to win public favor, I'll make me a suit of leather, take to the woods and chop bee trees. I'd rather my babies were born in a cane brake and reared on bark and wild berries with the blood of independence burning in their veins than spawned in a palace and brought up bootlicks and policy players. I am sometimes inclined to believe that life itself is a humbug, that the man who makes the best of it is the one who escaped being born. We know not whence we came or what for, whether we go or what we'll do when we get there. True it is that life is not altogether labor and lees. There's some skittles and beer. But the most of us get more shadow than sunshine, more color amorbus than cream. Man born of woman is a few days and full of politics. The moment he hits the globe, he starts for the grave and his only visible reward for the long days of labor and nights of pain is an epitaph he can't read 
and a tombstone he don't want. In the first of the seven ages of man he's licked, in the last he's neglected, and in all the others he's a fair mark for the shafts of falsehood. If he don't marry his first love, he's forever miserable, and he does, he wishes he were dead. By the time he has learned wisdom, he leaves the world, is hustled into a hell of fire or an orthodox heaven, and for forty years I've been trying to figure out which of these appalling evils to avoid. In one place the climate is hot and unhealthy, in the other the inhabitants never entertain an original idea, believed everything they were told. Think of having to live through all eternity with the strictly orthodox, people who regard freedom of thought as foul blasphemy, millions of immaculate bricks cast in the same mold. No wonder there's neither marrying nor giving in marriage in heaven. Just imagine a couple of lovesick loons having nothing to do but spoon from everlasting to everlasting, to talk tutti-frutti through all eternity. Never a break or breathing spell in the lingering sweetness long drawn out. Amelia Rives Chandler or Ella Wheeler Wilcox couldn't stand it, nor could I. By the time I had lived ten thousand years with a female who could fly and had nothing in God's world to do but watch me, I'd either raise a revolution or send in my resignation. It is said that Satan had an affair d'amour while he was plain seraph. If the object of his affections were feathers, I don't much wonder that he went over the garden wall. I suspect that the orthodox heaven and hell, of which we hear so much, are humbugs. I should know something of these interesting ultimates. Be qualified to speak ex cathedral, for a doctor of divinity recently denounced me as a child of the devil. In that case you behold in me a prince imperial, heir apparent to the throne of Pluto, the potential master of more than a moiety of mankind. Ah, but don't tell anybody that I've got a title, that I belong to the oldest nobility, or all the golderbilts will be trying to buy me. I promise you that when I come into my kingdom I'll devise a worse punishment than physical pain. A soul is an immaterial thing. You cannot flay it with aspic fangs, nor kerosene it and set it on fire. A material hell for immaterial mind were too ridiculous for a progressive devil. But it is not necessary to be a son of Satan to build a hell in which demons dance and sulfur fumes asphyxiate the soul. You may transform your own home into a valley of Hinnom a veritable Gehenna, or you may make of the humblest cot a heaven illumined by love and gilded with God's own glory, a Beulah land where flowers forever bloom, where perfumed censers swing, and music throbs and thrills sweeter far than the Orphean lyre or song of Israfel. The orthodox heaven is a pageant of barbaric splendor, of gaudy tinsel and flaming gold to dazzle the eyes of infants. It is a land of lotus eaters where ambition's star is blotted from the firmament and the wild ecstasy of passion beats no longer in the blood. An oriental heaven, a paradise for tired people, eternal dolce for niente for niggers and yellow dogs, no Celt or Saxon with aspiring mind with swelling muscles and heart that flames with the fierce joy of strong endeavor, that thrills with the sweetness of sacrifice for others' sake, that swells with the mad glory of triumph in the forum or the field, could have conceived such a futile farce. Give me a land whose skies are lead and soil is sand, yet everlasting life with those I love. Give me a lodge in some vast wilderness hallowed by children's laughter. Give me a cave in the mountain crag to house those dearest to my heart. Give me a tent on the far frontier, where, by the lambent light of their mother's eyes, I may watch my children grow in grace and the truth of God. And I'll build a heaven grander, 
nobler sweeter than was ever dreamed of by the gross materialists of bygone days life is a humbug only because we make it so we are frauds because we are fools this is a beautiful a glorious world fit habitation for sons of the most high god it is a fruitful mother at whose fair breast all her children may be filled there should be never a humbug nor a hypocrite never a millionaire nor a mendicant on the great round globe labor should be but healthful exercise to develop the physical man to furnish forth a fitting casket for the godlike mind appropriate setting for the immortal soul the curse of life arises from a misconception of its significance we delve into the mine for paltry gems explore old oceans deep for pearls we toil and strive for gold until the hands are worn and the heart is cold we attire ourselves in tyrian purples and silks of end and strut forth in our gilded frippery on the narrow bridge of time between two eternities we despoil the thin purse of the poor to erect brazen altars and priceless fanes when the whole earth's a sacred shrine the universe a temple through which rings the voice of god and rolls the eternal melody of the spheres perhaps it is unnecessary to state that i am not posing as a saint i may eventually become an angel of some sort but i'll wear no wings we are accustomed to think of seraphs flying from heaven to earth flitting from star to star irrespective of the fact that feathers are useless where there is no atmosphere an angel working his wings to propel himself through a vacuum were as ridiculous as a disembodied spirit riding a bike down a rainbow i do not expect to reform all humbugs to banish all fakes to exterminate all folly if the world should get too good i might have to hunt some other home i can understand every crime in the calendar but the crime of greed every lust of the flesh but for the lust of gain every sin that ever damned a soul but the sin of selfishness by all the sacred bugs and beasts of ancient egypt i'd rather be a witch's cat or even a politician and howl in sympathy with my tribe i'd rather be a tramp and divide my handouts with one more hungry i'd rather be a mangy yellow dog without a master and keep the company of my kind than to be a multimillionaire with the blood of a snake the heart of a beast and carry my soul like pedro garcia in my purse when i think of the three thousand children in the single city of chicago without rags to shield their nakedness from the keen north wind of the ten thousand innocents such as christ blessed who died in new york every year of the world for lack of food of the millions in every country whose cries go up night and day to god's great throne not for salvation but for soup not for the robe of righteousness but for a second-hand pair of pants and then contemplate those beside whose hoarded wealth of the riches of lydia's ancient kings were but a beggar's patrimony praying to him who reversed the law of nature to feed the poor i long for the mystic power to coin sentences that sear like sulphur flames come hot from hell and weaves of words a whip of scorpions to lash the rascals naked through the world we humbug our parents the public and then as far as possible our wives though the latter are seldom so blind as they seem the wife who cannot tell when her lord and master is lying whether he's been sitting up with a sick friend or nursing a robert tail flush well she must be the newest kind of new woman with a brain built for bloomers and bike the new woman is she is all right just the old woman in disguise a paradox and a coat of paint whenever i tackle this subject i'm reminded of a broth of a boy who in days agone drove the team afield on my father's farm 
one rare june day when the sun was slowly sinking in the west as the novelists say and i believe that's where old saul usually sinks he got mixed up with a bevy of industrious bumblebees who were no respecters of person would sting an honest delver as quickly as they'd put the gaffles to a scorbuty duke in about two minutes mike came over the hill a whooping like a segment of the southern confederacy reaching for a nigger regiment his head the size and shape of a red peck measure that had been kicked by a roan mule sure now they didn't do a thing to me he said an old bumblebug came a buzzin and a buzzin a looking for all the world like an orangeman mit wings so i up and hit him a biff then all the rest of the haven took up his fight and i came home hit one humbug and every fraud and fake in christendom is ready for the fray they attempt to crush their critic with calumny and defeat him with falsehood when you hear a fellow railing at the iconoclast just look through its stock of caps and you'll find one that will fit the knot at the end of his neck truth and only truth is eternal it was not born and it cannot die it may be obscured by the clouds of falsehood or buried in the debris of brutish ignorance but it can never be destroyed it exists in every atom lives in every flower and flames in every star when the heavens and the earth shall pass away and the universe return to cosmic dust divine truth will stand unscathed among the crash of matter and the wreck of worlds falsehood is an amorphous monster conceived in the brain of knaves and brought forth by the breath of fools it's a mortal pestilence a miasmic vapor that passes like a blast from hell over the face of the world and is gone for ever it may leave death in its wake and disaster dire it may place on the brow of purity the brand of the courtesan and cover the hero with the stigma of the coward it may wreck hopes and ruin homes and cause blood to flow and hearts to break it may pollute the altar and disgrace the throne corrupt the courts and curse the land but the lie cannot live for ever and when it's dead and damned there's none so poor as to do it reverence the following remarks apropos local politics were included in mr brand's lecture on humbugs as delivered at the dallas texas opera house october seventeenth eighteen ninety five a discourse on political humbugs were incomplete without some reference to the young man whom texas in a moment of mental aberration raised to the chief magistracy i learned from a sermon recently inflicted on the long-suffering inhabitants of this city that son charles is our quote, heroic young christian governor close quote. how he must have changed during the last few months shakespeare was probably viewing the texas politician with prophetic eye when he declared that in the great drama of life a man plays many parts culberson is the only one however who has yet succeeded in playing them all at one and the same time a man who can run with the hare politically while holding with the hounds personally is almost too versatile to be virtuous quote our heroic young christian governor close quote that preacher evidently doesn't know charles or if he does his idea of christianity is not so altitudinous that he can stand on its apex and keep the flies off the man on the moon culberson is a politician who enjoyed excellent health before he entered the public service he is all things to all men and nothing to nobody he's so slippery that he couldn't stand on the partisan platform to which he owes his political elevation in the last gubernatorial election pretty much every man who voted for culberson felt that he had a lead pipe cinch on a fat office and the remainder was certain he would work four-and-twenty hours a day to put in effect their pet reforms 
they are wiser now in eighteen ninety charlie sailed into the attorney generalship on the ample coat-tails of one j s hogg and in less than thirty days he was conspiring to retire his chief after one term and to slip into his official shoes the trouble appears to be that the youngster was pulled before he was ripe before his political integrity had time to harden or his crop of wild oats was well in the ground now i want it distinctly understood that i am not the apologist of pugilism i am the apostle of the white-winged goddess of peace i always carry a cruise of oil in my hip pocket to cast upon the troubled waters i have a pacific effect on all with whom i come in contact children quit crying when they see me coming women speak well of their neighbors men respect each other's political opinions preachers engage in silent prayer and the lion and the lamb lie down together and that's no lie but as between pugilism and hypocrisy i prefer the former i would rather see men pound each other for a fat purse than play the canting pharisee to promote their political fortunes let us look to the record of our heroic young christian governor during the four years he officiated as attorney general he made no determined effort to enforce the law then in effect prohibiting pugilism prize fights were pulled off at galveston san antonio el paso and other texas points after having been duly advertised in the daily press he was elevated to the chief magistracy of the state and the slugging matches continued mills between brawny but unskilled boxers grew relied upon brute strength and pounded each other to a pumice to make a hoodlum holiday some of these meetings were especially brutal as matches between amateur athletes are likely to be but our heroic young christian governor saw no occasion to get his ebenezer up he simply sawed wood didn't care a continental whether there was a law prohibiting bruising bouts or not and the ministerial associations were too busy taking up collections to send bibles and blankets salvation and missionary soup to the pagans of the antipodes to pay much attention to these small fry pugs they let our blessed texas civilization take care of itself while they agonized over a job lot of lazy negroes whose souls ain't worth a sou marquee in blocks of five, who wouldn't walk into heaven if the gates were wide open, but once inside would steal the eternal throne if it wasn't spiked down. No Epworth leaguers or Christian endeavorers were asked or resoluted or perorated until the tongues were worn to a frazzle, trying to preserve the honor of our great and glorious state by suppressing feather pillow pugilism why i don't know do you of course some carping critics declare it was because the world was not watching these brutal slugging matches between youths to pugilistic fortune and fame unknown that it was because the professionally pious had no opportunity to make a grand stand to play and get their names in print no chance to pose in the eye of the universe as the conservators of our fin de siècle civilization but then these doubting thomases are ever ready to make a mock of the righteous and put cockleburs in the back hair of the godly i dislike to criticize the cloth i am prone to believe that the preachers always do the best they know how still i must confess that i am unable to muster up much admiration for the brass band variety of religion or the tutti frutti trademark of respectability had the belief not been bred into my bones that there is a god in israel these little two by four preachers with their great moral hippodrome their purblind blinking at mountains and much ado about molehills would drive me to infidelity by their egregious folly their fiery denunciation 
of all men who dared disagree with them, their attempt to make the state subservient to the church, to establish an imperium in imperio, by their mischievous meddling in matters that in no wise concerned them, they are bringing the beautiful religion of Christ into contempt, and are doing more to foster doubt than did all the Humes and Voltaires and Paines that ever wielded pen. Now, don't get the idea that I am antagonistic to the preachers. Far from it. I am something of a minister myself, and we who have been called to labor in the Lord's vineyard at so much per annum must stand together. I admire the ministers in a general way, and whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth. I feel that it is my duty to pull them tenderly but firmly back by the little alpaca coat-tails whenever they have made mistakes, to approve them in all gentleness when I find them fanning themselves with their ears for the amusement of the mob. But to return to our heroic young Christian governor, when it was first proposed to bring the great fisty carnival and a million dollars to Dallas, Governor Culberson had nothing to say. It was popularly supposed that he understood the law and would respect it. The impression got abroad that he felt rather friendly to the enterprise because it would put five hundred scudi in the depleted coffers of the public and turn a great deal of ready money loose within the confines of Texas. He may not have been directly responsible for this popular idea, but he certainly did nothing to discourage it. Arrangements were perfected, important contracts entered into, a vast amount of money invested that would prove a complete loss if the enterprise collapsed. Then Culberson began to complain. He suddenly discovered that pugilism was a brutal sport, which should be suppressed. His conversion was as instantaneous as that of Saul of Tarsus. It were an insult to the intelligence of a hopeless idiot to say he did not know the Corbett Fitzsimmons affair would prove far less brutal than a hundred fistic encounters which he, as Attorney General and Governor, had tacitly encouraged. But his jewel of consistency had evidently gone to join his diamond stud. Colonel Dan Stewart didn't appear inclined to do anything to tease the young man's agony, and it rapidly went from bad to worse. The hurt decision was rendered and the moral volcano of our heroic young Christian governor began to erupt in earnest. He declared that he would override the court of criminal appeals, if men enough can be found in Texas to do it. He gave excellent imitation of an anarchist who is hungering for canned gore. After this blood to horses' bridles bluff, he grew quiescent, waited, Micawber-like, for something to turn up. And still Dan Stewart didn't say a word. Then our heroic young Christian governor broke out in a new place. The legislature was convened in extraordinary session to prevent a brace of pugilists smashing the immortal ichor out of modern civilization. It was a great moral aggregation, almost equal to Artemis Ward's waxworks. I am convinced of this for it employed two doctors of divinity, at public cost, of course, to pray over it a minute each morning for five dollars per diem each. Everyone expected the president of the Florida Athletic Club to go to Austin and make an earnest free silver speech, even the lawmakers were looking for him, but he didn't go. And the result was what might have been expected. The law builders with the worst private records had the most to say about public morality. Men whose IOUs are not good in any game of pity ante, whose faces are familiar to the inmates of every disreputable dive between the Sabine and the Rio Bravo, who go to their legislative duties from the gambling room and with six shooters in the bust of the breeches, grew tearful over the prospective disgrace of Texas by a manly boxing bout. Hell hath no fury like a legislative humbug scorned. 
while he's holding his hand behind him. But the wrath of our heroic young Christian governor did not abate with the enactment of a law forbidding prize fights, such a law as he had flagrantly failed to enforce. The promoters of what the Court of Criminal Appeals declared a lawful enterprise were arrested and dragged before the grand jury of Travis County, which appears to have taken the entire earth under its protectorate. Failing an opportunity to prosecute them for an offense against the laws of the land, the powers of Austin proceeded to prosecute them on the hypothesis that they were conspiring to wreck the universe. And what was their offense? They had conspired to pay five hundred dollars into the public treasury and bring a million more to Dallas. They had conspired to bring several thousand respectable businessmen to Texas from all parts of the Union and furnished employment at good wages for hundreds of hungry men. While I do not much admire pugilism as a profession, I must say that the promoters of the enterprise conducted themselves much better than did our heroic young Christian governor, and those alleged saints who proposed to shoulder their little shotguns and help him override the courts, to butcher their brethren in cold blood to prevent an encounter between brawny athletes armed with pillows, to sustain modern civilization by transforming the metropolis of Texas into a charnel house, to prevent by brutal homicide in the name of Christ, their neighbors exercising those liberties accorded them by the laws of the land. Curious, this modern civilization of which we hear so much. During the palmy days of Roman grandeur and Grecian glory, their athletes fought with terrible cestas to win a crown of oak or laurel. But then Rome never produced a reverend Seashoals, nor Greece a Senator Bowser. The imperial city did manage to breed a Brutus and a Cato, but never proved equal to a Culberson. Think of a Texas legislature, composed chiefly of illiterate jabberwocks who string out the sessions interminably for the sake of the two dollars a day. Imagine these fellows, each with a large, pendulous ear to the earth, listening for the approach of some Pegasus to carry him to Congress teaching the aesthetics of civilization to the divine philosophers of Greece and the godlike senators of Rome. Think of Perry J. Lewis pulling the conscript fathers over the coals, of Senator Bowser pointing out civic duties to Socrates, of Attorney General Crane giving Julius Caesar a piece of his mind, of Charlie Culberson turning up his little two-for-a-nickel nose the Olympian Games. But perhaps that is not the game our heroic young Christian governor is most addicted to. Prize fighting, even with pillows for points, is bad enough, no doubt. But there are worse things. Making the Texas people pay for an abortive little second-term gubernatorial boom is one of them. And canting hypocrisy by sensation-seeking preachers is another. Can the church and state find no grander work than camping on the trail of a couple of pugilists? Are Gentleman Jim and Kangaroo Bob the upper and nether millstones between which humanity is being ground? Are these the only obstacles to the inauguration of the Golden Age, that era of peace on earth and good will to men? The world is honeycombed with crime. Brother Seashull says there are 800 fallen women in this city alone, and I presume he knows. But if there be half so many, what a terrible story of human degradation, more appalling even than soft-glove pugilism. Our streets swarm with able-bodied beggars, young men, most of them, whom want may drive into wickedness. Human life is cheap. Men are slain in this alleged Christian land for less silver than led Judas to betray Christ. Young girls are sold to shame, and from squalid attics come the cry of starving babies. The Goths and Visigoths 
are once more gathering imperiling civilization itself and belief in god is fading slowly but surely from the earth want and wretchedness skulk in the shadows of our temples ignorance and crime stalk abroad at high noon the legions of lucifer are overrunning the land transforming god's beautiful world into a veritable gehenna the field of blood is filling the prisons and poorhouses are overflowing crowded with wretched creatures who dare dream of fame and fortune the great sea of life is thick strewn with wrecks millions more drifting helpless and hopeless upon the rocks from out the darkness there come cries for aid men pleading for employment women shrieking in agony of soul little children wailing with hunger and cold and the winds wax ever stronger the waves run higher and higher the wreck and wraith grow ever more pitiful more appalling and church and state pause in this made vortex of chaos to prate of the ills of pugilism to legislate and perorate anent bloodless boxing bouts to prosecute a brace of harmless pugs the people ask bread of the church and it gives them a stone they ask of the state protection of their lives and liberties and it gives them a special session of the legislature shoots doodle-bugs with a gatling gun and sends them the bill but to recur for a moment to the fistic carnival have any of you been able to determine how the dallas news stood in regard to that great enterprise sometimes when i want to go on an intellectual debauch i read the news or airs almanac it appears to entertain but two opinions mainly that uncle sam should black the boots of john bull and that grover cleveland carries the brains of the world in his begum this brace of abortive ideas constitutes its confession of faith the only things of which it feels absolutely certain when it tackles anything else it wobbles in and it wobbles out like an unhappy married man trying to find his way home at five o'clock in the morning a great diplomat once declared that language was made to conceal thought but the dallas news employs it to disguise an intellectual vacuum it can use more language to say less than any other publication on earth in this particular it is like napoleon it stands wrapped in the solitude of its own originality the eating of thirty quail in thirty days was once a popular test of human endurance but i can propose a more crucial one one that will attract more people to dallas than would even the corbett fitzsimmons fight let the people of the city offer a fat purse for the man who can read the editorial page of the dallas news thirty days in succession without degenerating into a driveling idiot it is a mental impossibility of course but perhaps my good friend dory can be persuaded to attempt it to hoist himself with his own petard no man born of woman will ever accomplish it massillon would become a mental bankrupt within the month and socrates have to be tapped for the simples before reaching the halfway house the news is troubled with a chronic case of anglomania whenever columbia has a controversy of any kind with britannia the news hastens to ally itself with the britisher but in matters concerning the welfare of the city of dallas it has little to say it did manifest a slight inclination to take up for the fistic enterprise fearfully slid one foot to terra firma but when the success of the carnival became doubtful the news hastened to resume its time-honored position astride the fence and it has sung there ever since like a foul dish-rag across a wire clothesline it's the greatest journalistic fraud on the face of the earth it doesn't dare to risk the opinion that water is wet but probably it isn't sure of it it is just as well however for if it did know 
it couldn't leak the information in less than a column. The editorial page of the Dallas News reminds me of the desert of Sahara after a simoon. It is such an awful waste of space. If I had a five-year-old boy who couldn't say more in fifteen minutes than the Dallas News has said in the last dozen years, I'd refuse to father him. One of the greatest frauds of modern times is the policy plain newspaper. The Archimedean lever, as applied to daily journalism, is a fake of the first magnitude. There is not a morning newspaper in Texas possessing sufficient political influence to elect a poundmaster. In fact, their support will damn any politician eternally, for the people wisely conclude that what the alleged great dailies support is a pretty good thing for them to oppose. Hogg would not have reached the governorship but for the blatant opposition of the morning press. His friendship for George Clark was the upas shadow in which he perished politically. There hasn't been an important law enacted in Texas during the last ten years that it didn't oppose, and yet men actually imagine they cannot succeed in politics, business, or letters without the assistance of that great molder of public opinion. Let me tell you that every success in this country has witnessed during the past three decades was achieved despite the morning press. To paraphrase Owen Meredith, Let a man once show the press that he feels afraid of its bark, and will fly at his heels. Let him fearlessly face, twill leave him alone, but twill phone at his feet if he flings it a bone. End of section 36